Hunted by Darkness, Coven of Shadows and Secrets, Book Two, by Ashley McLeo, narrated by L.C. Johnson. Chapter One, Meredith. What exactly did one pack for a journey to hell? I stepped back from my duffel bag, examining the contents skeptically. I still think I should go with you. Benedict, my feline familiar, drawled from where he lounged on my pillow. The muscles of my jaw tightened. I'd expressly told him not to touch my pillows, or even the bed, but the cat never listened. Annoyed with my familiar, and without the energy to fight where he chose to plant his rear end, I ignored him. There was no point in reiterating what I'd already said anyway. According to Hans, we had to fly to Romania and wouldn't be able to slip a cat across the border. Not with our strict time constraints, anyway. If we were going to save Luca from shade poisoning, we had mere days to get to hell and back. My stomach clenched. Poor Luca. The coven master had been poisoned with shade venom and currently lay dying in the infirmary. And it was all my fault. Meredith! Benedict hissed insistently. I made a vow to your parents to look after you. My parents. If there was one thing that could get me to talk to my familiar, it was that. Veering away from the carry-on, my gaze landed firmly on the cat. Speaking of my parents, I saw a vision, a memory, with my father in it. It said a heck of a lot that I hadn't remembered that little nugget sooner. So much had happened during the meeting at the Shadows and Secrets tomb that it consumed me. Did you? Benedict asked, though his tone was less interested than I would have expected, given the topic. Maybe he thought I was trying to distract him so he'd forget that I was leaving his butt here. Not a bad tactic, actually. What was the memory about? Dad and I were on the Yale campus. It couldn't have been too long before their accident. I thought back, trying to recall every tidbit that I could of the precious memory. We were supposed to meet Mom for lunch. They both worked on campus, didn't they? The cat's ears perked up. They did. What did they do? I can't tell you that. My lips parted in exasperation. But you just confirmed they worked at Yale. Only after you said so. Those are the rules, Meredith. You have to remember your past on your own. I glared at him. And though we hadn't known one another for long, I could read his expression. It said that he wasn't budging. Insufferable cat. Rolling my eyes, I turned to the spread of clothing and supplies I'd strewn over the quilt. Fine. Silence fell between us while I tossed a few more items into the bag and finally zipped it up. I was as ready as I'd ever be for the journey. You know I would tell you more if I could, Benedict added softly. I don't like keeping your past from you. A resigned sigh left me, and a teensy bit of the tension bunching up my shoulders left me. I wish they didn't force that promise on you. I don't see the point. Neither did I, to be quite frank. His light amber eyes glowed sincerely, and in that instant, the frustration simmering between us disappeared. Then, the doorbell rang. Rooms! Shay hollered from downstairs, the one-two punch shattering my moment with Benedict. Can you get that? It's probably Hans, and I'm not decent. Yeah, I yelled back since the Nephilim had to be talking to me and not Harper, who she didn't dare call rooms. If she wasn't decent, that meant Shay must have been the one I heard hogging all the shower water. Harper was probably irate about that, which meant the Nephilim would be avoiding the wolf. I left my room, jogged down the creaky wooden steps, and opened the front door. All the breath left me as I came face to face with not Hans, but Tobias. I swallowed thickly, as stunned by his handsome features as I had been the first time I laid eyes on him in an Egyptian prison. The vampire's skin glimmered in the pale moonlight, and his jaw was strong, seemingly chiseled from stone. 
like normal. He wore a suit jacket tailored to his compact, muscular form. The navy color of the suit brought out the evergreen in his eyes beautifully. As I studied him, my blood hummed with desire. I wished it wouldn't, but around the vampire, I sometimes found it difficult to control my emotions. Stone? Tobias said in greeting. Yeah? I asked, trying to act normal, like I wasn't feeling something shift between us, something I didn't understand. The vampire's attention raked over my face, his nostrils flaring. Is she packed and ready? I was sure that wasn't what he'd been planning to say. In fact, he looked like he wanted to say something else. But he didn't, and now I was on the verge of awkward as hell, so I shrugged. Uh, I don't know. I'll tell her you're here. Harper breezed out of the hall bathroom in a towel. I blinked at her sudden appearance. Wait, so Shay wasn't the one in the shower? Might I wait inside? Stepping back, I invited Tobias into Shay's home, shutting the door behind him. Briefly, an awkward silence hung between us, and though I didn't usually mind silence, I sought to fill it. I thought you'd be Hans. Annoyance fluttered across the vampire's face. Or maybe I'd imagined it. The expression was there and gone so fast that I must have. Had I said the wrong thing? And how so? Are you prepared for your mission? Tobias asked, his tone tight. It's rather risky, you know. Yes, some might call a journey to hell to find an herb a touch risky. Or stupidly dangerous. But I'd committed, and I wasn't a woman to go back on my word. I have a bit of the Lusamesia herb from the healers to help with the seeking, and I've packed a bag, I said. That's about as ready as I'll ever be. Tobias nodded, though he didn't seem to like my answer. For the second time that night, an uncomfortable silence surrounded us. But this one, I knew exactly how to fill. Hey, I wanted to thank you, I blurted. Pardon? I drew back, remembering who I was addressing. Tobias was a vampire. I had no idea how long he'd been alive, but it could have easily been thousands of years. Though he passed as normal most of the time, sometimes the way he spoke hinted that he belonged in another era. I never thanked you for saving me that night in the museum. So, thanks. I looked away, unnerved by the intensity of his stare. I appreciate it. You are welcome, he replied, though conflict rippled through his words. Giving mortals vampire blood isn't usually a good idea, but you wouldn't have made it back to the tomb had I not done so. That was what the healer said, too. Another pause prompted heat to creep up my neck and into my cheeks. What in the world was up with me? Was he feeling this weird connection between us two? What was it? I hadn't felt it in the meeting over the stolen opal of heaven, or in the infirmary. Then again, everyone had been pretty preoccupied with the theft of a lapis calesti, and in the healing wing, Luca dying in front of our eyes. Both matters made it impossible to focus on anything else. Meredith. Tobias said, in a way that focused all of my attention on him yet again. What's up? I believe that you should not go to hell. I blinked. That was the last thing I'd expected. Not that I'd had any clue what to expect. I never did with him. But whatever it was, it wasn't that. Why? You're not ready. I snorted. Like anyone is ready to go to hell? You even less so, he replied, his tone harsher than before. A memory of Tobias and me training suddenly returned. The way he dismissed me. The skin on the back of my neck grew tight as the obvious solution presented itself. You don't think I can do it, do you? Let Hans go, and Gunnar if he must. You, however, should remain here. 
Oh, he totally thought I couldn't do this. I hated when people underestimated me and always strove to prove them wrong. Even if I, too, was conflicted, which was kind of the case here. I mean, who actually wanted to travel to the underworld? I was going mostly out of a sense of duty and guilt. After all, the shade that poisoned Luca had been sent to SNS's headquarters for me, not the mage. Still, what the heck? Tobias and I were on the same team. The vampire and the mage were friends, and I'd seen Tobias's desire to help Luca as we stood around his bed in the infirmary. Most importantly, I was a seeker, a supernatural made for finding shit. I was perfectly suited for the task of finding an herb in another realm. And as Daphne had told us many times, we had to act quickly. Luca had two weeks to live, tops. I tilted my chin up to meet the vampire stare. I'm going, Tobias. I can do this, and I have been through plenty of dangerous landscapes. Plus, we have vials of the invisibility potion. Demons won't even see us. I was still reeling from the discovery that an invisibility potion existed, but I didn't let that show on my face. It would only make him consider me even more naive. His lips pressed together, whitening. As you were told, the elixir can only be used once in a day, or the user suffers adverse reactions. And it lasts merely an hour. You'll be in hell for longer, and in that time I fear that you'll only endanger the others. Air escaped my lips, like he'd punched me in the gut, and I glowered at him. I will not, I ground out. I... Oh, it's you. Shay interrupted, and footsteps sounded down the hall, coming closer. A moment later, she appeared beside me, and immediately my frustration with Tobias shifted to confusion. I cocked my head. Shay had showered, done her hair, and taken the time to put on makeup, including red lipstick. I'd never seen her wear red lipstick. Who are you expecting? I asked. Did she plan on sneaking in a hot date before she and Tobias caught their flight to Switzerland? Who got so done up for a red-eye flight? No one. The apples of Shay's cheeks grew pink, and she held up her bag. Anyway, I'm all packed. Just have to put on my boots. You got us tickets, right, Steph? We leave in four hours. The traffic is bad, so we must get moving. Tobias ignored the jab as the Nephilim grabbed her boots from the hall closet and sat on the step to pull them on. I'll wait in the car. With that... The vampire left, his shoulders set in hard, unforgiving lines. When he reached the vehicle, he threw one look back at me, making my breath thin. He looked like he wanted to say something, like he might come back, but then he shook his head and eased himself into the vehicle. What crawled up his butt? Shay asked, coming to stand by me. He thinks I'm going to ruin the mission to hell. She pursed her lips. You're not going to ruin it. But I do worry about all of you. I... A car screeched to a sideways stop out front, nearly slamming into the back of Tobias's parked vehicle. The vampire shot out of his seat and glared at the offender. What the heck, Hans? Gunner yelled, emerging from the passenger side of the second car, as if he couldn't get out fast enough. You're drunk, aren't you? Only had a beer or two. Han shouted gruffly. No way. Can't believe you pulled this shit. Even from where I stood in the doorway, I saw Gunner's jaw tighten as he hovered outside the vehicle. Passenger door still ajar. Give me the keys. I'm driving. Fine. The wizard exited the car, hurled the keys at Gunner who caught them one-handed. I watched, eyes wide as he stomped partway down the street like a toddler throwing a tantrum. Gunner shook his head, and in a shocking turn of events, Tobias was the one to follow the wizard. He forced Hans to stop, and placed both hands on his shoulders, like he was giving Hans a pep talk. What's wrong with Hans? I eyed the pair, with furrowed brows. As a coven, we'd been out for drinks, but I'd never seen him act like this. Not even when he'd been pissed off that Tobias ditched on helping him train me. 
and I'm confused by this. A gesture to the guys whispering to one another, I thought they weren't friends. They're not, not really, Shay said. But they're kind of Luca's right and left-hand guys, with Gunner as a close third. They all help the coven master lead the coven, so there's respect there, though you wouldn't always know it. She sighed. I feel like Hans is hiding something. But what? I eyed her sidelong, unable to deny the yearning in her tone, the softness of her expression. Does Shay have a crush on Hans? Before I could ask, Harper barreled down the hallway in a robe, her hair wet and disheveled. Are you two leaving right now, without saying goodbye? I jerked back. She cared that we were leaving? Where was my aloof wolfy roommate? Sorry, I said, shaking off my shock. Hans and Gunner, um, arrived. She peered outside at the men, her green eyes narrowing shrewdly at Hans's askew parking job. Tobias was still talking quietly to Hans, while Gunner had turned his back on the wizard and was now marching up the walkway toward the house. Sorry you had to see that, ladies. His face was still pinched with anger. Hans had a bit too much to drink. He told me it was just a beer, but now I know better. Letting out a judgmental, hmm, Harper turned to me. Something is up with Hans. I felt it in the infirmary. Same, Shay echoed. Be careful around him, Meredith, Harper added. I will, I promised. They were totally right. I didn't know what was wrong with the wizard, nor did I plan on digging for that answer. But I would keep my guard up. Emotions clouded reason. And where Hans, Gunner, and I were going, we couldn't afford a single poor judgment call. Meredith, come on! Hans yelled, twirling gracelessly out of Tobias's grip and stomping back to the car. Let me get my bag! I called back and spun to run up the stairs, but Shay caught me first. We need a roomy hug. Harper groaned, but it sounded forced, like she was putting on a show. Considering she'd run out here to say goodbye, I suspected that was the case. The wolf put up a tough front, but she liked the Nephilim more than she wanted to admit. Me too, I like to think. When the wolf threw her arm around me and Shay, my lips curled upward, touched. Good luck getting into the bank, I whispered to the Nephilim, and then twisted to Harper. And don't you get behind in your classes. The wolf snorted. Never. I'm more concerned about you boiling to death in hell. We hugged it out, and Shay squeezed my hand before trailing down the walkway. Tobias saw her coming, and apparently having had enough of Hans, who was leaning against our car, tattooed arms crossing his chest, got in his vehicle to wait. We're in a rush, too, Gunner reminded me gently. Be right back. I took the stairs two at a time. But once I got to my room and grabbed my bag, I paused, taking in the area. Benedict? No answer. My lips pressed together. Usually, he'd be lounging on his luxury cat bed, but as I searched, I noticed the window was open. That little shit, I muttered. He had left without saying goodbye. I thought we'd semi-reached a truce. Obviously not. If he left, he was still mad about not getting to go on the trip. That cat was savage. Fine. I strode across the room to my bed. Bye, Benedict. Not that you'll know I cared to say goodbye. I ran out of my room, ready to begin my mission. Twelve hours, three flights, and zero minutes of sleep later, I was exhausted, hungry, and more than ready to get to our destination. Stone, can you take Hans's bag? Gunner grunted. I glanced at the guys. Hans appeared to have fallen asleep while walking, and Gunner was trying to nonchalantly carry him through the Romanian airport. Behind them, the wizard's bag dragged across the ground. Does he usually drink so much? I snatched the backpack out of Hans's hands and nearly passed out from the alcohol fumes wafting off him. He'd down drink after drink on each of our flights. The only time he wasn't imbibing was when he'd passed out from the booze. Never seen him like this. 
Gunner admitted. But we are going to hell. While terrified, that didn't seem like enough of a reason to me. After all, Gunner and I were holding it together. Try to wake him up, I urged. I doubt that they'll let a sleeping adult through customs. And we don't have time for a drunk tank, or whatever they have here. Gunner snorted and shook the wizard, who awoke with a grumble. Bro, you gotta pull it together for ten minutes. What's ever? Hans mumbled, standing on his own. Miraculously, we got through customs by the skin of our teeth. With acting worthy of an Oscar, Hans somehow managed to pull himself together for those few minutes and even charmed the customs agent by speaking fluent Romanian. Only when we got the rental car did I relax. We climbed in the tiny sedan, and Gunner took the wheel because Hans was still way too drunk to drive. The wizard rode shotgun, which left me in the cramped back seat with my bag. This is where I need to go, right? The wolf handed his phone to Hans, who gave it a cursory glance and nodded. Gunner started up the GPS, and minutes later, we were off. We'd made it only five miles before Hans passed out again. Loud snores rang from his lips, suggesting that he wouldn't awake soon. I exhaled. He wasn't being a dick to us, but something about the wizard's vibe had me on edge. You want music? Gunner asked. Whatever you want. If it's okay with you, I'm going to try and rest. The wolf had slept on the flight, but I hadn't. Sure thing. I won't bug you. He grinned in the rearview mirror. Thanks. I leaned my head against the car door. Cold seeped through the metal and plastic as we passed snow-covered yards, then open countryside. Mountains loomed before us. Apparently, that was where we were heading. Specifically, to the Carpathian Mountains, a place associated with vampires. A flash of Tobias flitted through my mind, making my heart rate accelerate. I frowned, hating the reaction and the memory of him telling me that I'd ruin everything. Why didn't he believe in me? And why did he have to be such a jerk about it? And why did I still care? That, more than anything, was really bugging the hell out of me. Why was I letting him, of all people, get to me? I rarely cared so highly of what others thought. I was capable and strong. I'd been in and gotten out of so many binds in my life. Who was he to judge me? And why did I... Next to me, my bag moved, halting all my thoughts. What the heck? When it moved again, I slowly reached over and unzipped my duffel. My clothes lay there, looking slightly rumpled from the hours of travel, but other than that, nothing was amiss. Another shift of my luggage made me suck in a breath. Okay, something was totally up here. I began to dig through the bag, and soon enough, I found the cause. Benedict was curled in a ball, sleeping at the bottom. Oh, hell no! I muttered and shook the luggage. The cat awoke with a start, his amber eyes flashing to me in alarm. I told you not to come, I scolded. How did you even get through security? Is that a cat, I smell? From the driver's seat, Gunner peered at me in the mirror. It is. I fumed while Benedict sat up, his posture haughty as ever even though he was in deep shit. Thought I smelled one before, but didn't know it was on you. Hard to tell in airports. Lots of sense. It's my familiar, and he stowed away. Explain, Benedict. The cat's chin tilted up defiantly. You said you didn't want me to come, but I disagreed. But you're my familiar. Doesn't that mean you listen to me? Again, you're mistaking me for a normal cat. One that has little respect for itself. I cringed. That was exactly what I was doing, and he'd made it clear before that familiars and pets were two totally different things. Still, would it kill him to do what I asked when I had his best interests in mind? Cats don't listen so well. Gunner cut in from the front seat. Benedict ignored him. As I said, I'm not here to be at your beck and call, Meredith. 
I made a vow to help you, to protect you as best I can. I came to do that. But how did you do it? Surely the TSA would have stopped me had they seen a cat in my carry-on. For crying out loud, they'd taken Gunner's shampoo because it was an ounce over their precious size restrictions. Familiars have magic, Gunner offered. Didn't you know? What's your magic? I glared at Benedict, who didn't look at all guilty. Freaking cats. I can do a few varied things, like become invisible for periods of time, which was how I got through the airport. I can also call other felines to my aid, and now that your magic is free, I can find you with relative ease, which I do believe I've already mentioned. I invisibility I sputtered, unable to believe he'd left out his most interesting power. Did you use a potion, too? How'd you get it? No potion. My power is all natural, and quite handy when I need to be at your side. I've even gone to the coven with you when you failed to invite me. Rude, by the way. What a sneak! He'd never been interested in my classes and led me to believe that he'd stayed home and waited for me every day. Even made me feel bad about it. The balls on this cat. He's here now, Stone. No going back. Gunner shrugged, clearly not as bothered by Benedict's appearance as me. Maybe Hans's dad will watch over him while we descend into the underworld. No. I glared at Benedict. If he's so determined to come, I say we let him. Benedict's lips curled into a feline smile. I knew you'd eventually see it my way. Chapter 2 Tobias Snow-dusted mountains rose on either side of the vehicle as Shay and I drove a winding Swiss road. Down the hillside, not far away, a green-blue lake glimmered in the bright sunlight. We were in a place of stunning beauty, but I couldn't enjoy a second of it. One thought, one person occupied my existence. The witch, Meredith. The person who was single-handedly responsible for me downing more blood in two weeks than I had in years. Since I was a new blood, to be exact. Try as I might to banish thoughts of Meredith entering hell and perishing amidst the damned. The visions had plagued me for hours. Dude. You need to chill. You're even more stiff than normal. From the passenger seat, Shay gestured to my knuckles, now white from gripping the steering wheel tightly. I hadn't even noticed. We're almost there. I need you to be relaxed, charismatic, and convincing, she reminded me. Much to my annoyance, the half-angel wasn't wrong. The moment we entered Le Bastion, I had to be at my best, which necessitated releasing all thoughts of the witch. The coven had tasked Shay and me with gaining access to the looted vault. And hopefully, the name of the owner. Ironically, the former, though considered more invasive by most, would be easier. The coven was well known in supernatural circles, and if the elite bank had not made progress on their own, they might have wanted assistance in discovering who stole the Opal of Heaven. Le Bastion would not, however, wish to give up the name of their clients. It was their first credo, their promise to anyone powerful enough to possess a vault inside their mountain. But there was no denying that they were in a less powerful position than usual. Just the fact that the theft had been broadcasted on international television hinted that someone had tipped off the news station. The thief? It was a distinct possibility. Whomever it was, they had forced Le Bastion to admit some of their faults, I couldn't recall a single other instance when that had occurred. So you've been researching for a while. Do you know anything about the opal? The Nephilim asked. Nothing, I said. If I had, you know I would have shared it with SNS long ago. As far as I'm aware, there is no documentation on that specific sacred stone, nor its effects. Only the Pearl of Hell has stories attributed to it. That's what I thought, too. 
but I hoped that after your research you'd know more. Maybe even that you and Luca were making a quiet plan that we'd be filled in on later. Unfortunately not, I admitted, even though it killed me to have failed on such an important front. Perhaps, if we can get the owner's name, we can shed light on the stone. Shay stared out the window. How do you know where to go anyway? Her inquiry drew a sigh from me. The Nephilim was a good partner, powerful in her angelic magic, which had the added benefit of being rare and therefore unexpected. However, the downside to being paired with Shay was that she didn't stay quiet for long, and she asked a lot of questions, some of which I usually hesitated to answer. Like this one. Family obligations, I replied. Birth family or vampire? I cleared my throat. Vampire. When not in the company of my vampire family, I went by Tobias Blake Aston. From those in the coven, only two knew my vampire bloodline, that I was a royal. Luca, the coven master, and Hans, the half-wizard. The latter discovered my secret on the same mission in which I tasted the darkness flowing in his veins. As I drank from him, his blood revealed his truth. My lineage, on the other hand, had been revealed by a vampire who met his end shortly after. On the same mission, we'd agreed to keep our secrets to ourselves. That had been years ago. But now, in light of all that was going on in the world... I wasn't sure secrecy was wise any longer. At least, not secrecy on my end. The Laurents sought the celestial stones, and it was all too likely that, in time, the blood would call me in to help. More immediately, the head of Le Bastion might voice my secret too. It would be best if I did so first. I'm a Laurent, I confessed, and Shay's gasp reverberated in the car, my older brother has a vault in the bank, though I've not been to that one. When I visited before, it was on behalf of my maker's family in Asila. You're a royal vampire? Shay paused. That makes so much sense. Damn! How did I not think of it before? Why would she? There were thousands of vampires in the world, and while they were all related to the blood of Laurent the original vampires, those born, not made, most were very distant relations. After three generations of separation from the original born vampires, the blood wouldn't claim anyone, and no one would dare speak against them. I don't advertise it. Why not? Baggage comes with being part of the royal family. Hmm. Shay nodded, as if she understood you're going to tell the bank? Le Bastion retains its employees for longer than most employers. My last trip here was twenty years ago, and I spoke to the head of the bank, La Tête. We might speak with the same person. Their positions are not exactly listed on the internet, so I can't be sure. That's why you told me. It would be foolish to make you look as if you don't have all the information. Reaching a corner, we enter the town and I turned down the snow-lined street and wound through the town. Though it had been years, I recalled the location of the bank like it was yesterday. When I got to the correct street, I drove all the way to the end of the lane, up to an old stone building abutting a mountain on the edge of a posh village. I parked in front of the building. We're here. How cosy. She pulled her white faux fur jacket closed around her and exited the car. We'd purchased the coat in a duty-free shop at the airport. Unlike myself, Shay had not come prepared to enter Le Bastion, but for a regular mission. Underneath the jacket, she wore clothes more suitable for action. SNS members often had to make quick escapes, but Le Bastion required those who crossed its threshold to dress as though they belonged there. The luxurious jacket did well to hide Shay's attire, and had the added benefit of suiting the cold environment nicely. They built the vaults into the mountain, I said, joining her outside. The midday light was practically blinding, reflecting off the white powder. It's secure. Usually. Yes, usually. 
We walked to the front door, guarded by two men who were mountains under themselves. Judging by their scents, one was a shifter, and the other one of my kind. Bonjour. The shifter held up a hand in greeting. Hello. I replied in English for Shay's sake. She spoke many languages, but French was not one of them. Do you have an appointment? The man asked, switching languages. We don't, I admitted, as we stopped before the pair. We're from the Coven of Shadows and Secrets, here to assist Le Bastron, if Le Tête will permit it. The guards didn't appear to recognize the coven's name, but that didn't surprise me. The last time I arrived here, no guard stood outside. Were these two a result of the recent theft? Is Oscar Akala still Le Tête of Le Bastron? I pressed. He is. Please inform him Tobias Laurent has arrived on behalf of Shadows and Secrets. The vampire's eyes flashed with recognition of the royal name, and he reached for his walkie-talkie, murmuring into it. I clasped my hands behind me and waited. Mr. Akala will wait for you in the lobby, the vampire said, not even a full thirty seconds later. He stepped to the side and opened one of the double doors. The ship demurred his partner, opening the other door. I cast Shay a sidelong glance. She nodded, understanding. For us, getting inside the exclusive bank was the easy part. What we had to do next, however, would take much more persuasion than a powerful name. We strolled into the building, down the long hallway that led to the heart of the bank. The corridor was grand, with white marble flooring veined with gold, glittering candelabras lining the wall, and paintings of past bank heads every few feet. On the way, Shay and I passed by the office of lower-level employees. From my previous visit, I understood those who truly possessed power held offices deeper in the mountainside. The corridor opened into the lobby, and a soft gasp left Shay's lips. Though I was not as struck, I still recalled my first time here. I'd acted the same way. We stood at the edge of a cavern, dripping with white marble and gold and candlelight. A chandelier the diameter of an eight-person dining table hung from the ceiling in the centre, illuminating even the farthest-flung edges of the circular space. Seven doors rounded the lobby, and from the one opposite us, Le Tête, Oscar Akala, emerged. Tobias, it's been a long time. Akala's power, prodigious among wizards, filled the room, and a smile as wide as the Thames crossed his face as the Swiss banker swaggered our way in a refined, bespoke suit. I rolled my shoulders back and met him in the centre. Shea followed, a half-step behind me. I hear you're here on behalf of Shadows and Secrets, Oscar said. The outside guard claims you wish to be of assistance. If you'll have us. Clasping his hand, I firmly shook it. Akala's snow and rosemary scent washed over me, somehow reminding me of Meredith, even though he smelled nothing like her. Oscar, this is my colleague, Shay. It would honour Le Bastion to accept the help of your coven. He beamed, clasping hands with Shay. I assume you'll want to gain access to the vault that has recently been. He cleared his throat, as if having to force out the next word. Plundered. My lips compressed before I caught myself. That had been too easy. I'd believe that we'd have to talk our way down to the safes. Oscar's simple acceptance could mean only one thing. The bank had no leads on who had taken the Opal of Heaven. And though I doubted they understood the true nature of the gem that had been taken, they were desperate to retrieve the property. They needed to reinstate their reputation as much as possible, and finding the stolen property would be a start. What are we waiting for, then? Shay asked. Lead the way. As you wish, mademoiselle. Please, remain here. With a dip of his head, Oscar veered toward a door on the far left. He pressed his hand against the surface, and white light wreathed his body, extending five feet in each direction. Warder? Shay whispered. Only the best for Le Bastion, I confirmed. The magic pulsed, and the door opened to reveal a room filled with hundreds of keys. 
Closing the door halfway behind him, Oscar slipped into the depths of the space, his footsteps growing more distant. Keys, huh? Shay mused. How antiquated. Truly, it was. But Le Bastion relied on many types of technologies and powers to keep their clients' assets safe, even the most archaic kinds. Did the thief use that key? Shay asked when the wizard reappeared with a gold skeleton key in his hand. They did not. Oscar's pleasant expression faltered, and he gestured to the room I'd exited. No one breached that space. Not that the security of the key room did the bank any bloody good. Oscar weighed for us to follow him across the circular lobby, toward the door at a ninety-degree angle from his office. I'm glad you came prepared. Oscar nodded to Shay's jacket as he reached the door. The vaults are quite cold. I've heard. Once again... Oscar placed his hand on the door he wished to open. A light pulsed, causing a hidden panel to slide out of the wall. I eyed it. Facial recognition. Leaning closer, Oscar brought his face in line with the scanner. A beam of red ran over his traditionally Swiss features. Then a green light blinked to life. As the door snicked open, frigid, stale air rushed out of the mountain's depth. Shay shivered, pulling the jacket tighter around her. Watch your step, Oscar said as he descended the stairs. Down? Shay whispered. Isn't it enough that the vaults are in a mountain? Recent events have dictated not. Oscar's tone turned sour. We followed him, every step taking us deeper into the belly of the mountain. Though it should have been dark, with each step, lights illuminated a few feet in front and behind us, lining the walls. On the way down, we passed three barriers made of lasers crisscrossing at random. At each barrier, Oscar waved the key in front of us, and the lasers disappeared, only to reappear once we'd passed. Those had not been used during my last visit. Had they been in place before the theft? After a moment of thought, I decided it was likely. Even Le Baston couldn't implement new protections so quickly. So the thief had somehow rendered a key obsolete and gotten past the lasers. Intriguing. After descending what had to be five floors, we reached the bottom and found ourselves in another circular landing. Ten heavy iron doors lined the walls. How many clients does the Bastion have? She asked, her gaze sweeping over the doors. I cannot say. Oscar arched an eyebrow at her before walking to the one across from us. Again, an electronic panel appeared, and he placed his finger on it to open the door. How the hell did they get in? Shay whispered. To that, I shrugged. The feat did seem incredible. This way, Oscar guided. The moment we were on the other side of the doorway, my heart gave a single hard beat as a person vanished into a wall. I blinked, but no, they were gone. Had I really even seen them? Oscar, am I seeing things? In answer, a smirk tilted his lips. They weren't quick enough to hide this time. And they are? Spectres. Only the old vaults have them guarding their possessions. He eyed me, as if to say not even my family was worthy of spectres. Now that was of note. If the Laurents were not elite enough to possess ghostly guards... Then who was? The desire to learn who this vault belonged to burned within me. Eight vaults lined this corridor, and Oscar took us to the one at the very end. Labelled 004. We're here, Oscar announced. Shay shot me a look that plainly said, Finally. And as Oscar placed the key in the old-fashioned lock, the door clicked open. After all that, you use a normal key? She gestured back the way we'd come. Actually, worse, a skeleton key? The enchanted key to work for certain people. Only the vault holder, certain Le Bastion employees, such as myself, and those in the vault owner's bloodline, should they perish before passing on the vault, be able to use the keys. He frowned. Which makes it all the more infuriating that someone didn't even need the key to break in. Oscar pressed the door open. 
and before us a cavernous space filled with gold and gems was revealed. My eyes widened. I'd seen wealth, possessed it too. I'd also stood in vaults larger than this one, brimming with treasure. But the fact that this wealth remained here only hammered home a single fact. The thief had known what they were looking for. They'd passed up gold, easy money, for one gemstone. Not just any gem, though. The opal of heaven. Take a look around for clues, Oscar urged. I'll be right here. I motioned for Shay to enter before me, which she did, her lips parted in awe. Narrow paths cut through the mounds of gold coins, and as we walked deeper into the vault, more treasures emerged. There were staffs that appeared as Sela crafted, a crown encrusted with red rubies and a crystal ball that gleamed as bright as the moon on a starless night. The last item gave me pause. Few supernatural orders could use crystal balls. Does a witch own this vault? Dividing to conquer, Shay and I wound our way down the paths, scrutinizing the contents of the vault with each step. We were searching for any clues that might lead us to learn who the owner, or the thief, was. After we'd travelled the last pathway through the riches and came up blank, we turned to one another. I found nothing enlightening, I admitted. Then again, I'm not sure we'd realise if they left something or not, considering how packed this place is. I gestured to the gold climbing from floor to ceiling. Agreed. Overall, this was a bust. Shay said. Next stop, try to get a name from Oscar. Let's wait until we get to the top. Duh. I'm not about to be stuck down here. We made our way back to the vault's door, to where Oscar was waiting. Hope glinted, plain in his eyes. Anything? I shook my head. No look, my friend. Shay's loud gasp interrupted me. Tobias! She darted to the door and knelt by the threshold. One trembling finger showed me what we'd previously missed. Etched into the wall of the vault, and illuminated by a patch of light seeping in from the hallway, was the sigil of Lucifer. The same group, I muttered, kneeling next to her. What is that? Oscar positioned himself behind us. The sign we were looking for. We found the same symbol at the site of another plundered location. I stood. Who is it? Can you apprehend them? Oscar's tone rose with excitement. Actually, we're not sure yet, Shay replied, and I turned in time to see the wizard's hopeful expression fall. By either or not, Akala pressed. We don't know exactly who they are, but the fact that they stole an opal out of this bank and another stone from elsewhere, I sidestepped giving him the stone's true names, is telling. That's all they took, right? Shay pressed. An opal? Oscar's face grew red. Are you telling me you truly have no idea who these people are? That I let you down here for nothing? Spit flew from his mouth and his professional composure cracked. You led me on, allowed me to believe. Get out! Oscar, I interjected, my tone firm. We said we would try to discover the thief, not that we had a hunch. I said, get out! Exchanging glances, Shay and I exited the vault, which Oscar promptly shut and locked behind us. Once it was secure, he marched down the corridor. Keeping our distance, Shay and I followed, biding our time until our next ask. Letit didn't say a word as he climbed the stairs, breaking each defence with a glower or a punch of his finger into the fingerprint pad. When we reached the top floor, he was still furious and whirled around to face us. I must request that you leave Le Bastion. Actually, Shay stepped forward, a sheepish look on her face. She was trying the innocent act. A good idea. We wondered if you wouldn't be able to tell us the name of the vault holder. We hope to question him or her. Maybe they will recognize the symbol. Oscar's face turned three shades redder and he drew himself up until he appeared six inches taller. Absolutely not. Our clients' identities are sacred to us. Now, 
I must insist that you leave Le Bastion. This would not do. I placed a hand on Shay's shoulder, and she let out a sigh. She wasn't keen on compelling Oscar and making enemies with Le Bastion. Truth be told, I wasn't either, but we needed the information. What must be done, must be done. Oscar, I whispered, making eye contact with him. We know it's against the rules, but be reasonable. Your client might know what the symbol means. It's imperative that shadows and secrets discover this information, not just for La Bastion's benefit, for the world. Leave, Oscar simmered. Not until we get what we came here for. I closed in until our noses hovered inches from each other. I accessed my power of compulsion, looking straight into his eyes. Tell me the vault holder's name. But instead of spitting out a name, Oscar did not give in to my compulsion. Rather, he smirked derisively. You think I allowed you on the premises, down into the looted vault, without defending myself against your powers of compulsion, Tobias? I drank an elixir to negate your abilities the moment the guard announced a Laurent's presence. We keep it on hand. Bloody hell. Oscar, I tried again. See sense. I've already broken one rule in hopes that you two would find a clue we missed, Tobias. I won't tell you the name of one of Le Bastion's most exclusive clients. That information is for me to know, and me alone. He clapped his hands right in my face, and footsteps filled the lobby. In fact, I won't do a damned thing for you. I twisted to find six armed guards closing in on us. Oscar! I turned back to try again. I... The rest of my plea stuck in my throat as a sharp point dug into my back. A stake. You're coming with us, Laurent, a man growled. Eyes narrowed. I glared at Oscar. So it appears I am. Chapter 3 Hans My eyes fluttered open to reveal a land I knew in my blood and my bones. A rough and rugged country so different from the place I currently called home. Snow spread before me, only a couple of inches deep in this part of the mountain range, but it expanded as far as the eye could see intensifying the pounding at my temples. I groaned. Why had I gone on a bender? It wasn't going to change the inevitable, my return to my village. And now I felt like a donkey's asshole. My eyes closed. How many times had I heard my father utter those same words when Domnul Balin pressed him to have one too many ales at the tavern down the road? Only a few hours in Romania and I was already sinking back into village speak. Need an aspirin? Meredith asked from the back seat. Got a bottle? Slowly, because moving hurt, I twisted toward her. And water? Anyone? What the hell? Meredith's familiar sat on top of her duffel bag, blinking at me with his large light amber eyes. How did he get here? Meredith huffed. Stow away. He can go invisible, so he hid in the car and then traipsed through the airport until he could sneak into my bag. Walked right past security. I need to pay better attention to my stuff. What if someone put a bomb in there? I blinked. That's a stretch. The drugs. Pulling a bottle of aspirin from a side pocket in the bag, she gave me two. Don't skimp. I thrust my hand out again. Two more. That's not good for you. What are you, my doctor? Give it to him, Stone. Gunner drolled. The man's having a rough go. Judging by the drinking, I bet you he's preparing to meet some demons. Couple of extra aspirin ain't gonna kill him. Gunner had no idea how on point he really was. Don't blame me if your liver gives out. Meredith plucked two more pills from the bottle and placed them in my palm. Down the hatch went the drugs, and I resumed my earlier position, cheek pressed against the cold window. These pills needed to kick in quickly, 
because we were less than an hour from my village. Part of me felt bad for leaving it up to Gunnar and Meredith to find their way there. We'd been traveling for nearly a full day, and they looked exhausted. Despite that, and them not reading Romanian, they'd figured it out, though. Thank the goddess, because I hadn't been prepared to help anyone. Coming home wasn't something I'd ever planned on doing. My village, idyllic, though it may seem on the surface, changed when the moon grazed the sky. Under the light of the luna, the village of Minim was the stuff of nightmares. Of course, some of those nightmares were only in my memories, but that didn't make them any less real. Minim had been the Novak clan's home for centuries, but I didn't love the place. The village had made me hard, made me hate a part of myself. During my childhood, there had only been a few lights that I could count on. My family, the wolf pack on the edge of town, a couple of friends who didn't care what others thought. For the most part, the villagers had taken too much time to trust me, and that had done irreversible damage. An aching hurt that would never go away, no matter how many miles I put between me and Romania, awakened. I swallowed, trying to down the pain, and succeeding only in dimming it to a low thrum. There's a gas station up ahead. I told them as we passed a mailbox painted red and in the shape of a chess pawn. The hermit who lived in the house down the twisted mountain lane was a chess master and a recluse. We don't need gas, Gunnar drawled. I need to pick up a few things. I might be reluctant to come home, but I was here and I wouldn't arrive empty-handed. Ten minutes later, we stopped at the gas station and I bought half their snack aisle. I returned to the car, loaded with chocolates, gummies, and most important of all, marzipan. Father adored marzipan, and though the sweets were against my personal dogma of sugar is poison, I hoped they would be a sufficient olive branch. Father, I wasn't so worried about, but she would require all the softening I could bring in the door. Did you leave any for others? Meredith asked when I tossed the bag full of candy in the back seat. We'll need this. You'll see. Gunnar studied me in a serious way that didn't normally grace his face, before he began driving. You gotta tell us what we're walking into? You'll find out soon enough. My insights turned to ice. When they learned the truth, could I count on them to keep it quiet? Gunnar and I were pals. We shared beers from time to time and regularly played pool, so I could probably trust him. However, I barely knew Meredith. Far too soon, we rounded a corner on the mountain road, and my village appeared. Snow glistened, and red roofs popped in the field of white. Meredith leaned forward. It looks like a storybook. People in the city visit here for that sense of wonder, I admitted. The way you're acting, I was kind of expecting an ominous Dracula castle, Gunnar chortled. Same, the witch admitted. But this is beautiful. Looks can be... A figure strolled onto the road, fifty feet in front of our car. Watch out! Gunnar slammed on the brakes, skidding to a stop on the ice. The back fishtailed, and Benedict hissed. Hold on, Gunnar grunted, fighting for control of the car. For a southern boy, he righted the vehicle with surprising speed. I exhaled when we skidded to a stop five feet from where the person, a girl with long blonde curls, stood. Aw, oh, hell, Gunnar drawled, his hand straying to the door and starting to open it. I feel so bad, I... Stop. I pulled him back as the young woman's dark eyes latched with mine. The corners of her lips curled up ever so slightly. My heart raced. What? I nearly ran her over. She wanted to get your attention. That's insane. How could you know that? Meredith accused. Because that's my sister. What? For true? Gunnar asked, eyes wide as if he couldn't believe it. I opened my door. Stay here. The other two began to argue, but I was already out of the car and casting a locking spell on the vehicle, trapping them inside. 
Ice crushed beneath my feet as I walked toward my sister, her intense glare never waning. Nicoletta? I greeted when we were face to face. You sensed me coming? I did. Why not meet us at home? You nearly gave my friend a heart attack. A smirk curved her lips. Waiting at home is never any fun. My brows furrowed. The way she said it, sing-song-like but with a growl of darkness, made me think I wouldn't like her ideas of fun. Why are you here, brother? We have to go to hell for a mission. My sister's eyes widened. No! Yeah. So I plan to stay in the village for the night and then head into the woods tomorrow. Hans! I shook my head, needing to say what I needed to say before we got off track. Nicoletta, they don't know what I am, what we are, and I'd like to keep it that way. Why? She frowned. There's power in darkness. I do fine without it. My sister, younger than me by ten years, studied me with eyes as dark as a moonless night. In the time that I'd been gone, her childhood had flashed by, been used up. She was now a young woman of seventeen, and from what I could gather from my father's phone calls, a wild one. Please, Nicoletta, I know I haven't been the brother you deserve, but please keep quiet, for me, for her family. She grabbed my hand, assuring me. My family means everything to me. A relieved breath left my lungs. Speaking of family, father will be happy to see you. You should go. I'll meet you there. With that, Nicoletta walked across the road, disappearing into the woods surrounding the village. I watched the spot where she'd vanished into the trees, a chill that had nothing to do with the cold washing over me. The sound of pounding broke my concentration. I turned to the car to find Gunnar and Meredith both glaring at me, the witch thumping her fist against the window. I walked back to the vehicle, already dreading having to answer for what I'd done. What the hell was that about? Meredith demanded as soon as I slid into the car. You locked us in here. I opted for the most basic of excuses. I wanted a private word with my sister. You'll meet her soon. I'd better buy her a bottle of wine or something, Gunnar mumbled, still looking shocked that he'd nearly run over her. Old ones save me. I feel awful. She said not to worry about it. I lied. And no wine. She doesn't drink. Another lie, which he'd probably discover soon. But, if at all possible, I wanted to minimize alcohol where my sister was concerned. According to our father, Nicoletta frequented the pub just as I had as a teenager. Unlike me, however, she got loose lips when she drank. It was one of the few traits she'd inherited from our father. Aw, oh, hell. Gondor began to drive. Well, I'll figure something out. I want to walk in the town, anyway. Cold trickled down my spine. There was always the chance something strange had happened lately in Minim, but I wasn't counting on that. Somehow, I'd have to make sure he was in our family's house before dark, without giving away one of the quirks of my home. Villagers had ways of protecting themselves, and recognized any signs of darkness lurking, but tourists didn't. They were often targets. I'll go with you, I said. I want to come too, Meredith added. Can Benedict? I turned and eyed the cat, who had snuggled back into the witch's bag and was dozing again. Might be cold for him after the sun goes down. We'll make it an early walk. There, that ought to do it. Once we reached the edge of the village, I began directing Gunnar through the streets. When he made the last turn down my street, the breath gathered in my chest. My father's house looked the same. Better, actually, than it had when I left. The paint was fresh, the windows no longer had ripples in the glass, saying that he'd upgraded to double-pane ones. Pride bloomed inside me, a nice change from the anxiety tightening my lungs. He'd been using the money I sent him to spruce it up. At least, I was doing some good for the family. Pull into the driveway, next to those two cars. I motioned to the vehicles that my father must be working on for the neighbors. He often tinkered with cars in his free time, 
and it taught me to love doing so too when I was younger. Days spent with oil slicking my hands and the sound of newly fixed engines revving were some of my most cherished memories. I wished we'd have time for such bonding this time. The moment Gunnar parked, Meredith opened the door and jumped out of the vehicle. I'm so sick of being in the car. She stretched her arms and legs. It is cold, though, isn't it? Glad I brought my thicker jack. The door to the home flew open, and a robust giant of a man appeared. Hans, Nepwate. Tata, I breathed, jumping out too and going to hug my father for the first time in years. His powerful arms wrapped around me, tears filling his eyes as he kissed me on both cheeks. I didn't know you were coming. Look at your arms. He took in my tattoo sleeve, only slightly disapproving. I'd sent photos of the artwork I wore, but my father still did not approve. And you brought a girlfriend? My father shifted gears, looking over Meredith. Or a wife? I blinked. But why should that confuse me? Of course he was going to go there. Father was a family man. He wanted a wife and kids for me. Truth was, I wanted those things too, but the timing had never been right. Meredith is a friend. A witch, father. I did not mention she was a seeker. That was meant to remain hidden until we absolutely had to expose Meredith's power to the world. And Gunner. I motioned to the wolf, who was last to get out of the car, is also a friend, a wolf shifter. I work with them. Ah. A crestfallen expression flitted across his wide face, but as usual, my father recovered quickly. American? Yes. I will get even more chances to brush up on my English. He waved the other two closer. Come in, come in. Father, I hurried. They don't know all of what Nicoletta and I are. Please stay quiet about that. Unlike my sister, he nodded, understanding. The villagers accepted us now, but it hadn't always been that way. Surely those early days of hardship were burned into my father's memory. When the others approached, I introduced them to my father, Dom Nul Novak, the baker of Menim. True to his good nature, my father ushered them into his home and set the table, offering them fresh-baked bread, butter churned down the road, and mugs of ale. Gunnar accepted happily and Meredith relaxed, sipping ale while my father bustled about the kitchen. Only Benedict appeared on edge, and I thought I understood why. Father, I told you that my companions are supernatural. Of course. The cat is too. This is Meredith's familiar. Thank goodness. Benedict breathed. Being around normal humans is so difficult. I forgot to ask Hans and hadn't gotten close enough to determine what you were yet. Dom Nul Novak. A familiar. Haven't seen one of those in ages. My father beamed at the cat. I'm a wizard, like Hans, but I never had a familiar. No one in our village has one. We're not that common, Benedict replied, the tension in his body gone now. Hans, my man, where's your sister? Gunnar asked, stuffing a bite of bread into his mouth and closing his eyes briefly. In heaven. I still need to apologize. Even though you said it was fine, I just gotta. My pa would kill me if I didn't. Father gave me a curious look. Nicoletta walked in front of our car. Gunner had to slam on the brakes. Ah, Father said, not looking at all concerned. If my sister had wanted to, she could have stopped the car. She possessed enough power to stop a semi-truck barreling toward her. She should return soon. As though his words were magic, the front door opened and Nicoletta swept into the house, all confidence and twinkling dark eyes. Whoa. Gunner breathed, taken by my sister's beauty, and the invisible dark magic flowing off her in waves. I glared at her, and she pulled it back. A bit. My sister was never one to play by others' rules, but she respected father and me. Or at least she had respected me. I can no longer be sure of that. Welcome, Nicoletta gushed, aiming for Gunner first, recognizing that he'd be more easily manipulated. I thought our guests might like these. From behind her back, a bouquet appeared. The black tips of the red petals hinted that she'd conjured them. 
Meredith smiled, but Gunner looked sheepish. I should have brought you flowers, miss. I nearly ran you over. No harm done, my sister assured him with a flirty, dismissive wave. I should have checked the road. Or not been lying in wait. What flowers are these? Meredith asked, staring at the bouquet. I'm surprised you can get any way up here. It's so cold. Does someone in the village have a greenhouse? Her observations impressed me as much as her interest in the blooms surprised me. Was Meredith a botanist? A neighbor grows them in a sunroom. Nicoletta lied, the words so convincing that if I hadn't been watching Father's growing frown, even I would have believed her. I'll put them in water. Swaying her hips, she hummed a Romanian folk tune on her way to the sink. From beneath it, she pulled out a vase, plopped the blooms in, and filled it with water. All the while, a faint sweet scent permeated the air, enchanting Gunnar until he couldn't take his eyes off my sister. My jaw ground from side to side. Normally, if anyone stared at my sister like that, I'd be pissed at them. But not now. Nicoletta was only seventeen, but she understood what she was doing and because of her powers, she could bait a man better than most women. Which was exactly what she was doing to Gunnar, who didn't know a thing about her. My poor father's cheeks glowed red. He didn't know how to handle his temptress daughter. He never had, even when she was a young girl able to curl others' desires to her whims. While I didn't know how to contain Hurricane Nicoletta either, I didn't need one of my colleagues falling prey to her, so I took the most direct route. I marched over to the sink and leaned over her shoulder close enough to counter eyelashes. My jaw was clenched so tight, the headache I'd gotten rid of threatened to make a reappearance. Stop using your power. Why? They're magical too, like us, brother. Nicoletta smirked, knowing full well no one in this room was like us. Meredith is a witch and Gunnar a wolf and you're trying to lure him. I demand that you stop using your powers. Turning off the sink, she whirled, her blonde hair whipping me in the face. You no longer make demands in this house. Nicoletta, father warned. Why do you defend him? My sister threw her hands in the air, all pretense of being happy and sweet gone. He left us. He's gone ten years. And thinks he can come back to tell me what to do? At the table, my friend's charmed expressions faded to unease. They shared a wary glance. I wish that I could push them out the door, but that would lead to more explaining later. Hans immigrated to America for a better life. My father scolded. He's a good boy and provides so that we have a very good life. Oh, shoot me now. If I have to hear one more time how good the brother who abandoned me is, I'll vomit. She turned her eyes on me, and my breath hitched. A ring of red curled around her normally black irises. Nicoletta, I pleaded, placing my back to Gunnar and Meredith. Stop. Stop? She whined like a child. You're asking me to stop? Grow a pair, Hans. I had to. This once, think of me. Like you thought about me when you left a child, your little sister, all alone in a Romanian village that hated her. Her gaze darted to the pair at the table, but I didn't dare look back. You left us to learn to control your power, to get stronger. But what was I to do? Who else would teach me to control my demon magic? What? Gunnar shouted. Oops. Did I let that slip? Nicoletta sang, falsely remorseful. She sashayed around, and I turned to find Gunnar's tanned face had gone white, while Meredith looked confused. Benedict, however, exhibited the most intense reaction. He glared at my sister, back arched and tiny teeth bared. Cool it, kitty, my sister growled, approaching the table. I take it you two know nothing about my brother and me. How were hell blooded? Uh, Gunnar choked out. No. Meredith shook her head. She was too new to this world to understand the consequences of what that meant, though she didn't have any trouble reading the room. 
Well, it's the truth. Papa here fell for our beautiful mother's graces. Nicoletta twirled, and ribbons of black magic spun from her, enchanting and horrible at once, before dissipating into the air. After all, few women can hold a candle to the famed Lilith. L Lilith? Like Lucifer's bride? Gunnar asked, his voice raspy. His eyes strayed to me for confirmation. That's your mother? Why I trusted Nicoletta, I wasn't sure. But the truth was out now, and there was nothing to be done about it but own it. I exhaled. Yes, Lilith, the demoness of lore, is my mother. Chapter 4 Tobias I kicked open the door to my room, trying to ignore the sensation of Le Bastion's guard's hands on my skin. We'd gotten so bloody far, learning that the same group that stole the Pearl of Hell plundered the vault in Le Bastion was incredibly valuable information, but it wasn't enough. Shay and I had failed to obtain the most important piece of the puzzle, and that infuriated me. Reaching for the hem of my shirt, I prepared to step into the shower and wash the guard's stench off when a knock came at the door. Tobias, we need to talk, I snorted. The Nephilim had also been furious over our failure, so much so that she refused to speak during our short drive to the hotel. But now she wanted to talk? She's as irritating as the witch. My eyes closed in frustration. Why did Meredith insist on popping into my head? Could I not get a moment of peace? The knocking came again. I'm not leaving. Fine, I huffed and went to open the door. You rang. We can't take this lying down. What do you suggest we do, Shay? Akala will not see us again. Our only other option is to break into La Bastion, and we both know that's not happening. Her eyes lit up. Actually, that's not a bad idea. A groan escaped me. Truly, it is. You saw their security? Not to mention if we got caught, they'd probably try to pin the first theft on us. Oscar is furious enough to do so. My attempt at compulsion had no doubt tipped him over the edge. People didn't like being controlled. Men and women in powerful positions even less so. I'll screw him. Shay walked to my bed and perched on the end. A pensive look took over her face, one that I wanted to wipe off because it was sure to only cause trouble. He wanted us to help him, without giving us anything in return. I hate people like that. Your kind really shouldn't hate. Half angel. I doubt that more every day. She rolled her eyes. You can't tell me you're fine with not knowing who that vault belongs to. Of course I'm not. But I've been around long enough to know institutions like Le Bastion are not to be trifled with. Their clients are among the most powerful supernaturals in this world. In the other realms, too. You're scared. If you'd ever been to Isila, met my family, and the type of people who hold vaults in Le Bastion, you would hesitate to meddle in their affairs, too. It had been a long time since I'd visited the world where my kind originated. That was by design, and I was not itching to return. Who are you most scared of there? The fury on the Nephilim's face had lessened a touch, replaced by genuine curiosity. My kind, the mages, the winter court of the Fae, dragons, I snorted, even the wolvia that rule the island of wolves. In truth, they're all deadly, some more than others. You think someone from there owns the vault that got broken into? I can't be sure, but if they are the owners, be certain that we're courting our doom by needling without permission. My hand rubbed the back of my neck, trying to melt the tension away. It's one thing to compel Oscar into giving us the information. Then, at the very least, the owner of the vault would see us as an ally to the bank. Oscar would be sure to spin, giving up their identity that way. But by taking their personal information outright, we're little better than the thief who stole the Opal of Heaven. Royals hide things for a reason. 
I'd much rather the information be given. And put Akala to blame. I shrugged. Sure. I wonder if the owner even knows what they really had. Shay mused. In truth, I'd question that too. To own one of the seven Lapis Calesti was a great honor. It also placed a target on your back. Slapping the sides of her thighs, Shay stood, shattering my thoughts. Whether they did or not, we still need to figure out who the owner is. If someone broke into their vault and took only the opal, that means the thief knew exactly what they'd find. Yes, I agreed, not liking the glint in her eye. Well, how? Did the owner slip? Or was it the bank that screwed up? Shay shook her head. Only the top bank officials see the deepest vaults, and I can't see Oscar slipping. No, Latette wouldn't slip. If he won't help us, Shay continued, we have to do it ourselves. The Nephilim must be touched in the head. Shay, if you're too scared, that's fine. My partner paused, blue eyes turning ice cold. But I am going to break into La Bastion, Tobias, with or without you. Spinning on her heel, she marched toward the door. For a few seconds, I stared at the door, willing her to return. But it was no use. The members of Shadows and Secrets might disagree, but we stuck together. It was our code. A resigned breath left my lungs before I followed my partner to learn what she had in mind. The sun had fully set by the time we put our plan, if it could even be called that, into effect. Let's hope the concierge was right, and that this is the place to see and be seen. Shay pulled the fur coat tighter around her body as we strolled into the village tavern, a few blocks from our hotel. It was one of three pubs in the mountain town, the one the woman at the front desk assured us was a local hangout spot. If the plan was to succeed, we needed to locate a bank employee. I scanned the crowded place, ignoring the stench of stale beer and decades of body odor lingering in the very walls. The tavern was indeed lively, and judging by how underdressed for the weather people were, I suspected those must be locals. One man wore shorts, a foolish endeavor in the freezing cold for a human, which his scent confirmed he was. Some people didn't prize their skin enough. There! Shay pointed across the room. That's one of the guards who led us into the bank. The vampire guards sat on a stool at the far end of the bar, drinking a glass of red wine and watching television. You can compel him? Shay checked. He seemed shocked to learn I was a Laurent, which tells me he probably is not related to the vampire royal line. I considered. As long as Oscar didn't give his staff the same potion he ingested, which I find difficult to believe, then yes, I should be able to. Assessing our surroundings, I straightened my jacket. But we must act quickly, otherwise he might suspect our motives. Then let's move, Stiff. We shuffled past tables packed tightly together to the other side of the tavern. The vampire proved quite engrossed in the hockey game, so much so that he did not see us coming until we flanked his sides. Hi, Shay greeted, and I swore a little angelic light wreathed her face. It was hard to be certain, because if the angel or Nephilim wished it to be so, the power was visually undetectable, even among those beings with superior senses like me. But I'd felt angelic influence before, and sensed that same sensation now in the air. Remember us? I recall kicking you out of the bank. The guard snorted. What are you doing here? Tourists prefer the pub across town. We have no need for that place, I said. We came here to talk to you. The man leaned back, his eyes widening a touch, as if slowly realizing that our visit could spell trouble for him. What's your name? Shea pulled up the rickety stool next to our target and perched on it. Jacob. And I'm watching the game. Don't want to talk. That's too bad, because we have some questions for you. Shea smiled, and against his will, the vampire became captivated. Struck by an angel. Shea was doing well. Her influence would slow his reflexes. Tobias? Her attention shifted to me, and under the angel's spell, which charmed and led people to follow their wishes, almost like compulsion, but not nearly as strong, 
Jacob turned to look at me. The powers of compulsion unraveled, taking him fully under my control in an instant. Jacob stiffened, but it was too late. Remain calm, I murmured, aware there might be others of my kind or shifters in the tavern. We need to get into Le Bastion. Do you have keys? No. She swore softly. We'd both been sure that a guard would have keys to the first floor. After that, we'd have to deal with interior protections. But getting in the front door was the first step. Who does, then? I pressed. Le Tete and the vice-president. Ingrid Bostrand. Where can we find her? She asked. She's on holiday. Of course she bloody was. Anyone else? I wouldn't stop until we succeeded, or ran out of options. If you support staff. Like? The janitor? He leaves later than anyone else, so he looks up. Is he here? It was almost too much to hope for, but the front desk had assured us the most locals drank here and the place was packed to the gills. Jacob turned on his stool to scan the crowd with glassy eyes. In the back corner. Jacob almost pointed, but Shay slapped his hand. Describe him, she hissed. Long blonde hair. He's wearing a neon green ski jacket. My attention latched onto the man right away. He wasn't watching us, but rather finishing his second beer and reading a book. What powers does he have? I demanded from the vampire. Humans didn't work at La Bastion. Too risky. So the janitor had to be something else. Hedgewitch. Perfect, Shay whispered. Hedgewitches were the weakest sort of witches, capable of only producing basic magic. I could easily manipulate that man. The bartender approached, and I waved her away before continuing. His name? Muck. One last question. Where does Le Bastion keep the names of their clients? Akola's office. Not a vault? They need to access the information when people call, and most like to speak with Le Tete or the Vice. These people are important, so Akola doesn't like to keep them waiting. Makes sense. Shay mused. I think that's enough. Agreed. Jacob, go home. Tell no one that we spoke. Do not leave your house until tomorrow morning. Okay. Abandoning his wine, the guard left the bar. Once he was gone, Shay eyed me. Is compulsion forever? If he was human, or a very weak supernatural being, it would be. But he's not. And I'm not a natural-born vampire. Only the core royals of Asila were born vampires, rather than made. As such, they were the most powerful among my order. Eventually, his own powers will fight off my influence. He'll come to his senses and remember what happened. How long? I shrugged. There was no way of knowing for sure. Since I did not know the extent of Jacob's powers, but it had been easy enough to compel him. A day or two. On that front, we have time. Good. Moving on. Shay nodded toward the back corner, and together we rose to speak with Mark. Except he was gone. Bloody hell, I swore. He couldn't have gone far. Let's go. Hustling out of the pub, we scanned the area. There was no sight of the hedge wizard. Smell the air, Shay urged. Can you scent a witch? I tilted my chin starward and inhaled. All I could detect was a vampire. Jacob, and Nephilim next to me. Shay's floral angelic scent was so strong it tended to overpower everything within a five-foot radius. I distanced myself from her and inhaled more deeply. My nostrils flared. Finally, I caught a touch of rosemary and sage in the air, likely an indicator of a hedge witch. They usually smelled more herbaceous. I think I have something, I announced, and proceeded to follow the scent. With Shay trailing me, we strode down the streets of the village. The further I went, the stronger the aroma of herbs became, giving me hope. When it led us to a street lined with small, single-family homes, I felt sure that we'd taken the right trail. Second one on the right. I indicated the door where the scent had congregated most strongly. 
you knock. Shay, while annoying to me at times, charmed others, especially if they didn't work with her. Or if they were human. Humans loved angels in the same way they feared vampires, with fervor. My partner strode up to the white squat home with red shutters and knocked. Right away, footsteps sounded, and seconds later the door opened. Hi, she said quickly, to show that she spoke English. Hello, Mark replied, his accent thick. May I help you? Yes, I added, coming up behind her in a blaze of vampiric speed. You work at Le Bastion, no? At the mention of the bank, Mark's eyes went round and the door began to close. Unfortunately for Mark, I was fast and stuck my foot into the jam. Then, not willing to draw this out further, I looked Mark in the eye and forced him under my influence. My compulsion magic took easily, and his shoulders lowered. As long as Jacob told the truth, things from here on would be easier. Mark, you work at Le Baston, correct? I repeated my question. Yes. And you have a key to get inside? I do. She pumped her fist. Don't get too excited, I chided. For her plan to work, we needed the answer to one more question, and it had to correlate with Jacob's. Where is the client list for Le Bastion located? In a vault? Mark blinked. I expect that would be in Mr. Akala's office. The most important information is stored there. He words it so well that he keeps hard copies, as well as digital. How sure are you? Fairly certain? He only allows me to clean his office when he's present, but I can go inside the vice's office at any time. I cut Shay a glance. We have to try, she whispered. Get your key to the bank and a coat, Mark. You're going to take us there. Like a puppet, Mark did as I requested and joined us outside. From there, we walked to the bank, using back roads to draw less attention. When we got there, some fifty minutes later, I was pleased to find that no night guard stood outside. It was a poor choice, but Oscar clearly believed the protections he had in place now were enough. This door is accessed by the key only? I asked, when we stood in front of Le Bastion's entrance. Yes, otherwise I would not be able to get inside. What are the protections once we're in? Is there a passcode on an alarm system? A spell? And if so, can you break it? There is an alarm system. The code is 358960. After that, each individual room has wards. I set them using a word when I leave for the day, but can't break them. That's fine. Get us in the building and turn off the alarm. We'll take care of the rest. Shay replied, still sure of her plan. It was, truthfully. A good one, though it would leave traces that someone had broken in. Surely Latette would consider us, he'd be an idiot not to do so. That meant we had to make sure we were far away when he discovered what happened. Mark pulled out his key and unlocked the door. Straight away, the alarm blared. Hurry! She hissed. Darting inside, he opened a hidden compartment in the wall and punched the numbers on the keypad. The blaring stopped. I exhaled. Step one accomplished. Will we need him to come with us for anything else? Shay whispered. Mark, you're quite sure that you can't get us past any more wards or alarms? The hedge wizard shook his head. There are none in the hallway or lobby. They're only on the office doors, the key room, and leading down to the vaults. Very good, I said. Stay outside and keep watch. Yell for us if someone approaches. Mark slipped outside while Shay and I made our way deeper into the bank. As we'd seen Oscar exit his office to greet us that very day, we knew exactly which door to approach. Even from far away, I sensed magic coming off it in waves. That had not happened before. Had Akala increased his security after we left? Perhaps he put fresh wards in place every night, but it presented a dilemma. I frowned. Shay, you truly can handle this? Meredith will be furious if I return her roommate injured. Catching myself, I shook my head, hating that I cared what the witch thought, hating that I pictured her in hell, and it infuriated me. All day, I'd done my best not to think of the witch. Distressingly enough, 
She'd still infiltrated my mind more often than I would ever admit. I have to try, Shay insisted, though there was a slight hitch in her voice. Don't push too hard. You'll... I understand what my kind is capable of, Tobias. I don't need it vamp-splained to me. My lips clapped shut. Of course, a Nephilim would understand that by pushing her angelic magic too hard, they risk burning from the inside out. Burning out. The prospect probably featured in their nightmares. Yet I feared Shay would have to push herself to the brink for us to get past Letet's wards. He was not in his position by chance. His magic and how he wielded it played a role in him heading Le Bastion. Be careful, I urged when we stopped in front of the door. I suspect that he put more protections in place. I feel it too. But few witches or wizards know how to hold back heavenly magic, and Oscar never asked what I was. Shay smirked. We hadn't offered that information on purpose. All too often, other orders mistook Nephilim for witches or shifters, not because of their magic, but because being part angel was rare. Witches and shifters were far more common. To beat back my magic, he'd have to have very specific protections in place, and I doubt that he did that, so I'll go as hard as I have to to get what we need. Knowing better than to argue, I took a step back. Angel magic, and Nephilim magic, was varied and multifaceted, but Shay possessed a special kind from her father, the Archangel Uriel. She wielded the usual angelic light from her hands and could also call upon a sword of entwined fire and light. Shay pressed her hands out in front of her, glowing with the purest, whitest light. Once a ball of light bloomed, a thin rod streamed toward the key slot in the door. The beam slammed into it, and the metal shimmered. The scent of hot metal filled the room, depositing the taste of pennies on my tongue. My throat tightened, but so far no magical protections had been triggered, nor had an alarm been set off. Had she been correct in thinking that Oscar hadn't warded specifically against a Nephilim? No sooner had the question popped into my mind that a beam of blue magic shot out of the door, straight for Shay. She gasped, dropping her power and whirling out of the way. The magic caught on the fur of her coat, singeing it and filling the air with a burnt chemical stench. But she was unharmed. There will be more, I warned. That means I have to work faster. The Nephilim's jaw set with determination. Another flare of light streamed from her, this one more frantic, consuming half the door. The portal flung a second blaze of magic at her, but Shay was ready and dodged it. The third stream of defensive power came my way, but I too had been waiting for the wards Letet set to attack and ducked so that it sailed harmlessly over my head. More defenses came at us, and like a dance, we wove out of the way, and Shay kept working to break through. If Oscar thought this would be sufficient to put us off, he was incorrect. When the wood of the door finally cracked, and the bottom half fell away, I exhaled. She released her magic, bringing her hands to her heart. It was only then that I realized she was trembling. Are you all right? Fine, I... Her knees buckled, but I caught her before she hit the ground. Holding her, I pulled up the sleeve of her jacket, and a stream of curse words left my lips. You pushed too hard. Her veins glowed red, the fire and light in her blood threatening to consume her. She might have only been minutes, perhaps seconds, away from burning out. I'm fine. Help me inside and let's search. I also wasn't about to let all the work she'd done be in vain. So I held her as we shuffled into Oscar Akala's office, determined to learn who had once owned the Opal of Heaven. Chapter 5 Meredith. Hours after Mr. Novak had shown us to our rooms, and we cleaned up and rested a bit, Hans remained pissed off. His sister had blown his secret, and I didn't know what to say to him about that. Of course, I understood that demons were bad, but I was too new to the supernatural world to decide if they were all bad. Were there degrees of evil? Was it just that they got a bad rap? Did some run charities? I snorted at that last one. But who knew? It could be a thing. People were always shades of gray. Why not magical beings, too? Nicoletta didn't seem monstrously wicked. Sure, she appeared mischievous, unwilling to let her brother tell her what to do, but evil? I wouldn't go that far. Then again, I didn't know her well. 
and from what I knew about him, I wouldn't put Hans in the evil camp either. Not even as he drank his beer and stared into space with a surly expression on his face. Clear from the other side of the room, I could feel the I-don't-want-to-talk vibes wafting off the guy. Trying not to disturb him, I turned the page of the book I'd brought with me extra quietly. Hey, Stony. Gunner called, emerging from the hallway. I exhaled, relieved that someone else was here to buffer Hans's bad mood. If there was anyone who could lighten the mood, it was party boy Gunner. Hey? I cocked my head. Trying a new look? He'd pulled his shoulder-length hair up in a man bun. Yeah, you like? Not really. Take it down, Hans growled. The villagers don't like anything too modern. Gunner scowled at our non-acceptance of the hairstyle, but he did as Hans requested. Y'all are hard on a guy. Sorry, it's not a good look for you, I shrugged. Down is better. Put on your coats, you two, Hans grumbled, ignoring Gunner's worries about his hair. Now that the wolf has graced us with his presence, we need to train for a few hours. Train? That was news to me. I'd gotten cozy thinking we'd be relaxing until we set out tomorrow. Apparently, the trek to the spot where we'd enter hell would take a half day's walk, and Hans didn't want to be in the woods at night, so we had hours to spare. Hey man, how about first we talk? Gunner countered, staring at Hans who immediately stiffened. You had a while to cool down, but I want to say that half demon or not, you're still my bro. Hans's shoulders lowered an inch. I feel the same way, I assured. Not about being bros, but I don't care that you're part demon. Do you even understand what it means? I bit my bottom lip. Uh, not really. Then how can you say that? Because we care about you. Gunner flopped onto the couch next to me. So do you have other magic you don't use much? Darker, like your sis? At the mention of Nicoletta, Hans frowned, but he answered Gunner anyway. I get the caster blood from my father's side, but since I'm part demon, I can access dark spells, those created in hell, though I don't like to use them. He paused to take a swig of beer. I can also make people hurt. My throat tightened. Hurt? Talk about ominous. What does that mean exactly? I asked. Like a headache? That. All the way up to torture, probably. I've never tried that hard. Hans shook his head, as if trying to dislodge a bad memory. All I have to do is will it. I cut Gunner a sidelong glance. His carefree expression was gone, and he looked paler. If they have demon blood, it's difficult. Hans continued, clearly caught in his thoughts. Humans are the easiest. Supernaturals all vary. I haven't used that power in years, but when I was younger it just happened. Like when I got bullied. I didn't know how I was doing it. How'd you learn? I asked, ail at the thought, but still curious. He shrugged. Mother visited and explained what was happening. After that I figured out how to control it. Snap, bro. Yeah. Hans took another glug of beer. Like I said, I don't use that side of my magic. Haven't for years. The less you use your demon powers, the weaker they become. And vice versa if I use them more often. So I don't know how my magic would react now, since it's been so long. What does Nicoletta's magic do? I asked, ready to move on from the thoughts of Hans torturing people. You saw her tendrils. She calls them her army. They can do pretty much whatever she wishes. She also has strong manipulation powers from our mother. She uses them to get what she wants from others. And the witch magic? Gunner asked, oblivious of the fact that the girl had tried to manipulate him. A concerned breath left him. We don't know. She seems to have smothered it in favor of her demon magic. Oh, shit. So maybe Nicoletta was a tiny bit evil. I'd definitely be watching my six around her. Did your dad know who your mother was? Mr. Novak seemed so kind, so jovial. It was hard to imagine him with a demon queen. When they first met, he didn't realize she was Lilith. 
Hans replied, his tone defensive. And she didn't stick around after she got pregnant. Not until she was ready to give birth to me. Then she reappeared like she'd been in the village all along. Hans scrubbed his hand over his budding five o'clock shadow. I know it doesn't make any sense, but my dad loved Lilith. Still does, I think. When she came to see me and eventually Nick, they'd spend time together. But she doesn't belong here. Can't be here. Why not? I asked. Gunner turned to stare at me. Damn, Stony. Sometimes I forget how new you are to all this. Gee, thanks. I stuck my tongue out at him. Lilith is Lucifer's wife. Hans explained. His property. If he learned about me and Nicoletta, or my dad, he'd be furious. But your mom got pregnant twice by your pops. Gunner reasoned slowly as a realization dawned. Is the devil blind? Female demons don't show their pregnancies like human women. Their stomachs stay flat, so it was easy to hide. After her first contractions, she'd ran here and delivered. Finishing his beer, Han slammed the bottle on the end table. Now, let's go outside. Apparently done answering questions, he marched out the front door, wearing only his black t-shirt and jeans. That man's crazy, Gunner muttered, watching Hans go, I'm gonna get my jacket. Same, I agreed, not about to turn into a popsicle. By the time we emerged from the comfort of the Novak's home, Hans had already placed a line of daggers on the ground. Surprisingly, Benedict was at his side, pacing the lineup. What are you doing out here? I asked my familiar. Spending as little time as possible around that she-demon. Her stench clogs the house. Rude. I looked at Hans apologetically. That's his sister, Benedict. It's fine. Hans dismissed it. Cats are known to be irritable around demons. Yet Benedict had never been like that around Hans. Did that mean Hans was less demonic than his sister? Or that because he repressed his dark magic, Benedict had not sensed it, and therefore had not spurred the wizard? These are all weapons made and charmed to kill demons, Hans said, clearly not worried about matters pertaining to my familiar. Our village has a few of them because the portal in the woods is always open. My brows knitted together. Do demons come through all the time? No. My mother made it in order to come here, and she did well in hiding it. But sometimes a demon on the other side discovers it and slips through. Usually they don't realize what happened until it's too late, and they're in our world. When they stumble into the village, the villagers know what to do. So, the portal Lilith made was how we'd be getting to hell. Does your mother visit the village often? I'm not sure. Hans shrugged. I haven't seen her since I left Minim. She came about a month before that. I assume she does, but... He trailed off, letting us know he didn't ask about that stuff and didn't want to talk about it, to be reminded of what he was. I stepped closer to the blades, eager to end his discomfort. They look like regular daggers. They are, except for the charms. My mother called them a slinkus, which she said translated to blades of darkness. In demon language? Gunner asked. Yeah. Any demon who touches these, except for the princes of hell and my mother, will turn to ash. We're taking them because we have to limit our magic in the underworld. Our powers don't belong there and might draw attention. The doses of invisibility potion the coven gave us don't count, but those will only last an hour. Tops. I wish we could have brought more potion, I admitted. It wouldn't do us a bit of good. Hans replied, parroting what Daphne had told us. If you ingest the suggested dose of invisibility potion more than once a day, you risk weakening yourself to the point of fainting. That would be detrimental in hell. I can imagine. Fainting, only to wake up visible with a bunch of demons around you, wouldn't be good at all. Demons can sense our magic? Gunner asked, circling back to the wizard's first point. The princes can, and since they command armies, that's a big deal. They can conjure shades, too, which these blades will help protect us against. Too bad Luca didn't have one when that shade attacked SNS's tomb. Agreed, Han said. But they're basically one of a kind. Bringing them to New Haven never even occurred to me. And considering the portal, I wouldn't have done so even if it had. 
The villagers need these more than others. I swallowed. Much of this information was new and unwelcome. To find the herb, using my magic was a must. This was the first I was hearing about our powers possibly giving us away. Though it made sense. The underworld probably had a magic all of its own, and ours didn't belong. We'd stick out, like fish flying in the sky. How many princes are there? I asked, wondering how many chances we had at detection. Seven. An exhale parted my lips. That was a lot. But don't worry about them now. They're there, and there's nothing we can do to change that, except prepare. Choose a blade. Hans gestured to the lineup. We'll train with them before dinner. All three of us know our way around a dagger, but it's best to be familiar with these particular ones, just in case. I snatched up the smallest one, eager to work my body after so much sitting and traveling, but Gunnar quickly called dibs and set to sparring with Hans. Meredith, you should practice your magic while you wait for the next round. Call light. What's that going to do in hell? Isn't using magic a bad idea? We'll do what we must to survive, and if the beam is powerful enough, you can use it for offense. Blinding those of the underworld, even burning them. Get creative, Stone. But won't your neighbors notice? They know about the Novaks. Why hide? Hans shrugged. All right. I moved off to the side with Benedict, giving the guys more room to spar. It had been a few days since I'd worked with what Hans referred to as basic magic, the type most witches could accomplish. This was the power even hedge witches could access, and before, I hadn't been so great at tapping into it. Still, my seeker abilities had grown in that time, so maybe the other types of magic had too. Carefully, I removed my gloves. The magic might work with them on, but I figured it would be better to go easy on myself. So far, only seeking came naturally. Why put up more roadblocks? Staring at my palms, I willed the energy to gather there. A flush of heat warmed the chill of the mountain air on my skin, and power seeped from my pores to illuminate my whole hand. My heart lifted. That was easier than it had ever been. Not natural. But I hadn't needed to concentrate so hard. A step in the right direction. Trying to push harder. Maybe even create a sphere like Hans could. I forced more light from my palm. The blaze intensified for a second, wreathing my hand completely before fizzling out. I frowned. Damn it. Lost it. Keep trying. Hans called. I twisted to find him leaping from a barrel as Gunner followed, blade whining through the air and an ear-to-ear -ear grin on his face. Dang, they were good. I don't know why he's so set on this session. Benedict muttered. Not that I don't want you to practice your magic, but there's an evil presence in this very house, and Hans isn't even taking care of her. Makes me doubt this journey is well planned. I rolled out my neck. You need a chill. His sister can't help what she is. Nor can I help how I feel, and I don't trust her. Benedict argued. A snort escaped me. Fine. We won't be here long anyway, so it doesn't matter how you regard Nicoletta. Where'd you go when you were hiding from her anyway? I was not hiding. Whatever. He so was. Did you see the town? I did. This place is... odd. From what I'd seen, nothing was strange about it, except the fact that demons sometimes appeared, which we hadn't witnessed firsthand. Benedict was probably being judgmental and I didn't have time for this kind of nonsense. Maybe you should have heeded my advice and stayed at home. I lifted my palms again, ready to conjure light once more. Quite the opposite. The cat glared up at me. You might be a witch, armed with magic and a dagger, but I am certain that you'll need me now more than ever. By the time darkness fell over the quiet village, my arms were sore as hell. Hans didn't want anyone down below to get the jump on us, so he insisted on sparring for hours. After we'd cleaned up for the second time that day, the three of us met in the living room once again. Mr. Novak had returned from the market and made himself busy in the kitchen. But when he heard us, the baker poked his head into the living room. Dinner will not be ready for two hours. I have a pheasant roasting. An old family recipe. Remember that, Nepote? Your best father. Hans smiled at his dad, 
a rare moment in which the tension lining his face vanished. Do you need help? I asked, semi-hoping he didn't take me up on the offer. I could handle the basics in the kitchen, but I was no chef, and roasting a pheasant sounded hard. No. Please, go to the tavern. Enjoy Menim. I will call Hans and Nicoletta when the meal is ready. Great idea, Hans agreed, from where he lounged in an armchair. I need a beer. My stomach twisted. We were going to hell tomorrow and needed to be at our very best. I wanted him to lay off the booze, but I also realized that beer might be the only thing getting him through this time. As long as he slows down, it will be fine. I'm game too, Gunner said. Where's that cat? I rolled my eyes. Still outside. Benedict had refused to come in with us. What he'd do later, when the temperatures dipped to freezing, was anyone's guess. Hopefully, I could tempt him inside and tell him I'd protect him under my blanket. Though, knowing my familiar, that wouldn't work. He was as stubborn as me, and I was a Taurus. He can come to the tavern, Hans offered. It was very old style. My eyes narrowed at him. Didn't you leave town before you hit legal drinking age? Hans smirked. The villagers let something slide. Let's go, y'all, Gunner urged. I've never been to Romania, and I want to see this place. With a wave to the baker, we grabbed our coats and left the home. I shuddered as the night wind grazed my skin. Somehow, it had gotten even colder outside. As we crossed the yard, into the street, I rubbed my arms vigorously as I searched for my familiar. Benedict! I called out, hoping he'd come with us to get out of the cold. Where are you? Here. A voice came from right behind me, making me jump. How did you get there so fast? I saw you exit the home. Ran over. So he was staying close, even though he didn't want to be near Nicoletta. We're heading to the tavern. Hans said they'll let you in. Even if they didn't, I'd come and stay under the table. I'm pleased to let my paws thaw. All right. The invisibility. Our foursome wove through the town, attracting the attention of many as we passed. Two people lifted a hand in greeting to Hans. An older woman stopped him to say hello, but most stared as we passed. It gave me the willies, but I ignored them, and focused on taking in the scenery, which was pretty and peaceful, with a dusting of snow on everything and the darkness falling over the range. There was no denying that the village of Menem was charming, even if parts were slightly run down. With a new coat of paint and a few buildings, She'd be a real stunner. What did you do before you left, man? Gunner asked, when another man glared at Hans while he passed him. Things were okay before I left, but I didn't hang out with those in town much, preferring to spend time with a wolf pack that lives on the outskirts. Plus, I haven't been back in a long time, and people here are distrustful. They put up with tourists for money, but other than that, they want to be left alone. I could understand that sentiment. Often I felt that way. Although, since I'd joined Shadows and Secrets, I was beginning to learn I liked being around people, too. In small doses, anyway. Turning down another street, I stopped dead in my tracks. What was that? I squeaked. I swore that I'd seen a shadow dart across the narrow lane. An annoyed huff left Hans's throat. Nicoletta's around somewhere. Luckily, here we are. He stopped before a nondescript door, the oldest tavern in this mountain range. I took in the building, which looked like it might fall over at any minute. But other than that, at least nothing looked creepy. I just hoped the structure would stay up while we had our drink. The moment we entered, heat from the hearth warmed my frozen cheeks. People milled about talking and laughter filled the air, making my shoulders loosen. This place might collapse, but it was homey. Nice. I could relax a little... Brother, a voice rang out, sharp as a crow's call, and I tensed all over again. What brings you out among the commoners? Nicoletta stepped out of the shadows, from the crowd where she'd been hidden. She held a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. A seemingly forced smile appeared on Hans's face. Checking out old stomping grounds. Well, the village wishes you a merry night. Nicoletta spun, sloshing her beer from the mug. People hooted and clapped. They loved her here, a fact that Hans could not possibly miss. His jaw tightened, and as I glanced back at Nicoletta, 
I realized why. Dark tendrils of magic twisted from her while she danced and others sang, danced, and drank around her. So they didn't love her as freely as I'd first thought. She was mesmerizing these people, probably did it all the time for fun. Clearly, they couldn't see her magic, but we noticed it. Still, the town recognized that Hans and Nicoletta were different. Did they suspect she clouded their thoughts? Did the baker realize this was what his daughter did? Again, my estimation of the girl lowered. Come on. Hans grunted as he turned to the bar. Let's get a drink. Chapter 6 Tobias Shay groaned as I eased her onto Oscar Ackler's desk chair, hinting that no matter how much she insisted that she was fine, she wasn't altogether well. You sit. I will do the searching. If I help, you can get out of here faster. She tried to lean forward and assist, only to nearly tip out of the seat. I right at her, my gaze boring into hers. You've already done more than enough. That's why you look like this. I gestured to her trembling arms and legs. She'd used a dangerous amount of angel magic to break through Latette's office door, and although her veins no longer appeared to burn from within, she still was not better. It's my turn to earn my keep. Fine. She huffed, though when she leaned back, I thought I caught a glimmer of relief in her eyes. I'd start with one of those two filing cabinets. Let me know if you need help breaking them open. We couldn't use angelic light magic or her sword of fire here. Aside from the fact that any amount of magic would tip Shay into burning out, a power like hers might set the cabinets ablaze. Then the identity of the person who owned Vault 004 would be lost. A last resort, I said, moving to the cabinets with the intent to allow her to recover. Of course, Oscar would also have his client's identities on his computer, but I was no hacker. If we could find the name of the owner of Vault 004 in the cabinets, I'd be grateful to avoid the hassle of technology. Unsurprisingly, the cabinets were locked. I turned to examine the rest of the office more thoroughly. Oscar had decorated his place in the minimalist style, with only high-end pieces in art. His desk gleamed as the centerpiece, with two dark brown leather chairs opposite. The filing cabinets appeared custom-made with gold hardware, and a bar cart brimmed with rare and expensive spirits. On each of the walls hung a single painting, all stunning. One, featuring a woman with a determined expression that reminded me of a seeker witch I was trying not to think about, was a true masterpiece. What are you doing? Shay asked. I gestured to the cabinet. These take keys. He might carry them, but they'd be more easily lost then. I mused. He worded his office so well, Shay agreed. I doubt he'd think many capable of breaking through those protections. To me, it's just as likely that he'd keep them safe in here. She popped open the largest drawer on the desk. The inside proved spartan. Three pens, a pad of paper, and a pack of gum. Or, or maybe behind the painting? Shay asked. I'll keep checking for hidden compartments in the desk. I took in the artwork again. The painting does seem to fit his style. Why do people always think that's such a clever place anyway? Shay rolled her eyes. They haven't had to search for items as often as we have, so they don't realize how common a hiding spot it is. Approaching the painting across from his desk, hence the one Oscar would view most, I pried the frame away from the wall. It was heavy, but I held it with one hand, examining the wall. The wall proved smooth. Not a single line there to give away a hidden compartment in the walls of Le Bastion. My gaze strayed to the back of the painting. Nothing there either. So I eased the painting back in place and moved on to the next, with much the same results. Anything inside the desk? I asked Shay. Not yet, but I'm double-checking for hidden compartments. There are only so many places you can keep the keys, I said, hoping we weren't wrong about him storing them in here. Would he go as far as to place the keys for the cabinets in the same area the bank stored the vault keys? Surely not. Having both a key to a vault and his precious client's information in one place seemed foolish. By the time I reached the fourth painting, the masterpiece, 
Doubt that this would pan out had seeded deep inside me. Still, I lifted the painting softly, not wanting to harm it, and peered behind it. My eyes widened. Found something. I'll need help with this one. Okay. Grunting escaped Shay as she got to her feet and shuffled closer. See that? I lifted the canvas a touch more, allowing her greater access. Behind the portrait, just within reach, was a square cut into the wall. Small depressions deep enough for someone to place their fingers in and ease the square open stared back at me. That's got to be it. Perhaps, I edged. The compartment might hold many things. I'll support the painting. Can you reach that? Her arms were long enough, but could she lean over that far and not topple? I got this. Placing one palm flat on the wall, her muscles straining, still exhausted as she steadied herself. One sec. Shay leaned forward, reaching for the depressions. Her fingers fit inside them perfectly, but instead of prying the door open, it popped open all on its own. Spring-loaded. She grinned triumphantly, snaking her hand inside it. The jangle of metal echoed like bells while she picked up whatever was in the depression, giving me hope. When I caught a glint of three keys on a ring, I grinned too. Once Shay righted herself, she handed me the keys. Gonna sit again. I'll take it from here. Two golden keys clearly match the cabinet. I wasn't sure what the third, much smaller one went to, but at that moment only the drawers mattered. Choosing at random, I stuck a key in the lock of the top drawer. It gave and clicked. Success. Smiling, I opened the drawer, shocked at the depth. They went so far that they must dive into the wall behind the cabinet. He has to have a charm on that thing, Shay commented, watching my progress. I bet he labels them by vault number. So, 004 would either be at the front or the very back. Someone like Oscar might also arrange by prestige. Pompous, but true. Shay groaned. What do you see? Numbers, all larger than 004. Perhaps the one we seek is at the bottom. I knelt, unlocking the lowest drawer. Only ten folders hung inside it, each with inches of space between them making them the more exclusive. The most important clients would be found there. Quickly, I scanned the files, and when I found it, my lips curled in triumph. Got it. Bring it here. I want to see. Gripping the portfolio made of thick paper, a luxury stock, I spun and approached the desk, placing the file on the surface. Go on, then. We wouldn't be here if you didn't insist. When Shay flipped the folder open, a name at the top leapt out at us. One I never would have expected. Not in a million years. No, I whispered. How? I have zero idea. Shay shook her head, as stunned as I was. She didn't seem to know. Meredith couldn't have, I insisted. How on earth was Meredith Stone the owner of Vault 004? There's a in-care-of name, too. That must be who put it in Meredith's name. Miriam Black, Shay cocked her head. Ever heard of her? Never. Is there an address? The Nephilim sorted through the pages, and together we searched for an address. The closest thing we found was the name of a small village in England. We need to take a picture of this, Shay suggested. Meredith will want proof when she comes back. My shoulders grew tight. The trio would be preparing to enter hell now. The reminder was most unwelcome. Document it. I gritted, trying my best to remain in the present. There was nothing I could do for the hellbound. My job was here. Unsurprisingly, kicking Meredith from my thoughts was more difficult than I liked it to be. Then we leave. My partner snapped photos of every page. All the while... I still couldn't believe that our newest coven member was so closely tied to the Opal of Heaven. Though I didn't want her to join S&S, it seemed that her involvement with the Lapis Calesti was more than unearthing the Pearl of Hell. Done! Shay stood, and this time she did not sway in the slightest. Let's roll! With great haste, 
I returned the folio to its proper place. Yet before I could shut it, something caught my eye. A small box sat at the back of the cabinet, the number 004 engraved on the lid. This is hers too. I grabbed the box and attempted to pry it open. It's locked. Try the smallest key on the ring. Brilliant. I agreed, sliding the key into the lock without resistance. When I opened it, another mystery appeared. What is this? Shay's eyes briefly studied it. Looks like a regular ring. Maybe a moonstone? I don't know, but take it. It belongs to Meredith, and I'm not sure Luca or my roomie will want to come here. Might be better for her to lie low. She paused, as if thinking better of what she'd said, and a conflicted expression crossed her face. Remember all that money, Tobias? That's all hers. She could pay her debts to that ringmaster guy. I'll take the ring. I decided, disliking the idea that any of that money might go to someone who'd threatened Meredith. However, that wasn't my choice to make. When the witch was ready, and it was safe to do so, she'd come forward and claim the money. I slipped the ring into my pocket. Now let's... A holler came from the front door. That's Mark! Shay hissed, her every muscle tensing. Run! We left Akla's office not bothering to attempt to clean up after ourselves, and sprinted through the lobby. When we burst out the door of Le Bastion, it was to find Mark fending off Jacob. I swore. It appeared that the vampire had shrugged off the effects of my compulsion more quickly than normal. Perhaps his blood was stronger than I'd thought. He should have listened. I zoomed over to the pair, ripping the vampire's head clean off his neck seconds before he would have landed a killing blow to the hedgewitch. Mark fell to the ground a terrified cry flying off his lips. Stop yelling! Shay instructed, holding out a hand to help the wizard stand. Get up and go home, quietly. You must, I agreed, looking him in the eyes and strengthening my compulsion over him. Surely the next day he'd be interrogated by Le Bastion. But once Oscar understood I placed Mark under my thrall, he'd likely be safe too. Accepting Shay's hand, Mark rose. Then without further instruction, he ran. Once we were alone, I looked down at Jacob. We'll move the body inside, but there's no point in burying it, as it will soon decompose. We can't hide our intrusion anyway. Picking up the corpse, I dragged him inside the bank. It wasn't much, but at the very least this would save the body from being eaten by animals before decomposition began. Should have kept out of it, mate. I whispered settling the vampire on the floor, only a few paces from the door. I exited, and Shay pulled the door shut behind me. I wish he wouldn't have fought your magic. I don't like it either, Angel. But we cannot dwell on his choice. We must leave this village. I scanned the area, making sure no one else was around. Once first light hits, they'll know what happened, and we need to be far, far away. Are you sure you don't want to come back with me? Shay asked when I pulled up at the Burn Airport departure gate. I have a personal errand to run, I replied, putting the car in park. Giselle, my maker, would be furious if she learned I was in Europe and did not stop by my brother's castle in northern Italy. She'd already asked me to visit when we first received news of the Opal's disappearance. Giselle claimed she feared he'd been alone too long, and since she was currently working as an undercover spy, she could not visit him herself. Are you going to Romania after, or back home? My fingers tightened slightly on the wheel, but only for a second. Why would I go to Romania? To be there when Meredith comes out of hell? I looked out the opposite window. Shay chuckled. She's gotten to you, hasn't she? We are colleagues. Nothing more. I forced out the lie. I certainly didn't need others egging me on. No matter what I felt, I could handle it. I had to. The image of the last woman I'd gotten involved with was still etched in my mind, stone cold in death. Never again would someone I love die for me. Keep telling yourself that, Stiff. Shay opened the car door and grabbed her bag from the back. Did you know that she's from New Haven? Or at least she lived there for a time. I blinked. No. 
How do you know? She remembered it, and I happened to be there when the memory surfaced. Shay shrugged. Apparently, her parents worked at the university. I might be able to dig up information on them. From that, maybe we can learn about that ring. It's a starting point. You do that. I tried to sound uninterested, even though I absorbed the information about the witch like a sponge. Best to keep busy until they return. She smirked, recognizing a brush-off when she saw one. Right. Well, see you back home then. Safe travels. The Nephilim disappeared into the airport, and I wound through the maze of cars clogging the drop-off area. As I drove, I couldn't help but wonder if others thought Meredith had gotten to me in a way few others had managed over the years. Once, Ghana had said something of the sort. Giselle, too, though her reasoning was laughable. My sire claimed we might be soulmates, but I still thought that was impossible. Creatures did not have soulmates of other races except for Cora and her fae prince. But that was an outlier. A once in a billion chance, perhaps even less. Even among those in one's magical order, soulmates, the fated ones, the bloodbound, were rare. Meredith was a witch, so she simply couldn't be my mate. Not to mention, the woman frustrated me more often than not. That had to count, too. I'd left the boundaries of the city, and was well on my way south to my brother's castle, when my cell rang. Giselle? I greeted after glancing at the screen. News? I was hoping you had some. I heard through the grapevine there was trouble in Switzerland. A line formed between my eyebrows. How? You don't think that the Ordo Returnum would learn of the break-in at Le Baston and not go investigate? Representatives arrived at Le Baston as it was opening. You're lucky I was not there, Tobias. Did you tell the OA my coven would be there? After our talk, of course not. It wounds me that you think that. Her hurt tone made me cringe. Giselle might be spying on the order for the blood of Laurent, but she held more loyalty to me. I apologize. Giselle blew out a long breath. It's okay. I might not like it, but I can see why you'd ask. As I said before... If we meet, and I am with the OA, I must play my part. As it stands, I'm caught between a stiletto and the cobbles. And my time at Le Baston has me on edge, I added, not wishing for her to shoulder all of the blame. A pause. So did you find anything interesting? There was no way I'd give her the news regarding Meredith. While Giselle was loyal to me, and her royal ties in a sealer, even when she did not agree with their aims, as was now the case. I had no illusions that she would not seek the witch if she thought Meredith might ultimately help the blood of Laurent. As long as her actions did not directly harm me or her other children, Giselle would do as the blood wished. For now, the less my maker knew about Meredith, including that she was a seeker, the better. We visited the vault, I admitted. Akala is desperate then. Indeed. The newscast didn't lie. There were still many treasures there, but we found nothing that pointed to the owner, or that they had other powerful items. Someone merged in front of me, causing me to break in my story. Asshole. Pardon me? Not you, the driver. There's but a dusting of snow here, and they act like they've never seen it before. What of the sigil of Lucifer? Giselle asked, ignoring my outburst. It was there. The same group that took the pearl also stole the opal of heaven. For a moment, Giselle said nothing. I pictured her pacing, her rouged lips pulled tight as she shook her head in thought. It would be bad for King Vladestrika to get his hands on the Lapis Calesti, and the Order cannot wait to possess the pearl and cause mayhem. But to not have a clue who has the gems, it is almost torturous. I wish I was blessedly ignorant of what was to come. I shuddered at the thought of either the Order or the Vampire King having more power. Neither possessed pure motives. The King wanted to push his power into this world, and the Order wished to bring about an apocalypse to subjugate humans. What would your coven master do with them if you found them? Giselle asked. 
The darkest objects the coven possesses all go in a safe that only Luca and one other person can open. Both mages. He has not told us the name of the other person, only that he trusts them implicitly. And you? I trust Luca with my life. He's a good man. Not power-hungry, which is why he makes a good leader. Very well. Then we can only hope your coven finds the culprits before the Order, or anyone else does. Giselle sighed, sounding exhausted. Vampires played one part or another for most of their long lives, but I imagine doing so when you did not support either cause would be exhausting. I'm going to Raphael's now, I said, knowing it would cheer her. Oh, good. I'd hoped to check on him after Edinburgh, but the Order has other ideas. Where? When I know, I'll tell you. And you, I offered, comforted, that though the world was in danger, I still had my coven and my family, people I could trust. Chapter 7. Hans My head pounded as we tramped through a fresh layer of fallen snow toward the portal. We'd already been hiking for hours, and I felt, once again, like a donkey's asshole. One would have thought, after I blacked out for most of our trip across the world, that last night I would have been smarter, particularly considering the journey we were about to embark upon. One would have been wrong. Beer was the only thing capable of numbing the pain as I watched my sister flaunt her magic, her black ribbons twisting and turning through the tavern right under the noses of humans. Nick didn't care that we'd spent years being hated by villagers because of what we could do. She didn't care that our father had almost been run out of the town he'd grown up in, nor that every use of her power brought her closer to her dark side. All Nicoletta cared about was having a good time, and others adoring her, which, thanks to her magical ability to manipulate them, they did with gusto. What would happen if they figured out the truth? Would they attack my sister? My father? Hans? Meredith called from behind. What's that? I turned to find the witch pointing east, and followed her direction, a hand shielding my eyes from the brightness. A wolf prowled closer, one with red fur and curious eyes. The ring cloud hovering over me lifted a touch. Hey, scoundrel. I waved at the wolf. Come talk. You know him? Meredith asked, her tone cautious. Only all my life. Been sensing him for a while. He was avoiding me. Gunnar added as the wolf loped closer. The big southern man rubbed his hands together, his cheeks ruddy from the cold. Makes sense, I replied. Gunnar descended from the Wolvia, royal wolves of Asila. Others of his kind would sense that powerful blood, the danger that Gunnar posed, and keep their distance unless called, or unless they had a death wish. The Red Wolf, Mihai, wasn't that stupid, though. Though he'd been born in Menin and never stepped foot in Asila, he respected the old ways of the Wolvia. He always had, and as my best childhood friend, I grew up watching those wolfish traditions. Mihai's cottage was my second home. A refuge that I'd needed to survive growing up. My best friend's family and pack lived far on the outskirts of the village. Even when others hated me, the wolves didn't likely because they were magical too. As Mihai approached, he inclined his head to Gunnar in a respectful gesture. Gunnar beamed at the wolf, no trace of threat on him. Hey, man. An instant later, Mihai shifted, standing in front of me, his red hair longer than ever and face more lined than I recalled. The harsh mountains of Romania stole youth quickly. People said you were in town, my childhood friend said. Why didn't you come by the house? We are here on a time-sensitive mission, and unfortunately, I can't stay long. I enveloped him in a hug. A sharp inhale filled my ears, but Mihai was kind not to rear back at the stench of alcohol rolling off me in waves. Walk with us? My friend quickly introduced himself to the other three, and we set off again. Behind, Meredith whispered something to Benedict. Though I couldn't make out the words, from the cat's tone, I'd bet it didn't please him that another wolf had joined. He tolerated Gunnar, who was generally good-natured, even to cats, and hard to dislike. 
Benedict and Harper, however, did not get along. Other wolves probably fell strongly on the dislike side of the spectrum, too. Can you share anything about your mission? Mihai asked after a few steps. I can guess by the direction, but... The wolves knew something was very off with the land we journeyed toward. They didn't know exactly what it was, and were smart enough not to ask. The entire pack avoided the place. Only my family could pass through and take others beyond the protection my mother had set around the entrance to hell. Of course, beasts sometimes found their way from the underworld into this realm, but that was a different matter entirely. In this instance, directionality mattered. Once the unwitting demons emerged from the protected sphere my mother had created to hide the entrance to hell, the demons never returned to their homes. The people of Minim and the wolves struck hard and without mercy. We're going exactly where you think, old friend. Why? A life depends on it. That person must mean a lot to you. He glanced back at the others, who were giving us space to talk. And you bring a wolf your descendant? I bet Nicoletta didn't like that. That got my attention. My sister had pissed me off all night, but she liked Gunner. Because, again, most people did. Why do you say that? She's changed, Hans. Aside from the obvious, she's nearly a woman now, and has developed strong opinions of her own. She uses her magic openly, I added. I saw it last night. Couldn't believe it. In truth, she uses her powers liberally on others, but they love her for it. A shudder rocked my friend's body, and since wolves ran hot, I doubted it was from the chill. The pack stays away from Nicoletta, even the Alpha. Can you give me specifics of what she's done? I'm going to speak with my father about her behavior when I return. A knees flickered across my friend's face. Mihai, please. You can't let her know I told you. What the fucking hell was Nick getting up to? I promise. She enchanted the priest's son for a summer. The wolf said slowly, took his virtue, left him crying. He was trying to wait for marriage. I think to your sister it was a game. My stomach twisted. And once, I believe she urged a friend to set fire to their cottage. What? Was anyone injured? Killed? Mihai shook his head. They got out, and no one blamed Nicoletta. Your father might recognize her responsibility in his heart, but he denies the truth. Turns a blind eye to most of her actions. I swallowed. Father had often said that he didn't know what to do about my sister. Now I was getting the feeling that he only told me about the lightest of her transgressions. She needs to respect the village better, I said finally, unsure what else to say. Mihai nodded. She does. But even if she changed tomorrow, some wouldn't trust her. The pack knows, and we don't forget easily. She's undone so much of what you two worked to achieve, a peace, before you left. I don't blame you. A long, heated breath sunk my chest. Judging from how silent Gunnar and Meredith had become, they were listening. I wished I could keep my family's darkness tucked close. Hidden away. Tell me of your family, Mihai. I urged, not sure I could bear to hear more of my own. Thankfully, my friend acquiesced, catching me up on the pack until the surrounding air grew thick and smelled of sulfur. That was our sign. The boundary was close. I stopped. Mihai, I'll go no further. He gripped my gloved hand. It was good to see you, friend. Come back to us soon. We hugged, and the others waved to him. Then Mihai turned back into a wolf and disappeared through the snowy trees. We're close, aren't we? Meredith asked, rubbing her hands on her arms. I feel weird. The portal is about two hundred yards in that direction. I pointed left. No one goes beyond this area? Gunner's keen eyes scanned the forest. Most wouldn't make it even this close. Lilith made journeying in this direction unappealing. Even animals avoid it. 
I can see why. Benedict's round amber eyes shone, luminous as he took in the area from where he rode, safe in Meredith's backpack. I want to turn around. Well, we can't, so ignore that sensation. I said, my mother's magic won't harm you. Not when you're with me. Noon neared as we reached the portal, a circle of dead-looking trees deep in the woods. Nothing about this place seemed natural, and even though the hexes my mother had placed on the area didn't affect me like the others, they still made me tense. Shed layers, but remember to keep your blades handy. My hand patted the pair already sheathed on my hip. We also need to top off our water supplies with snow. For those of this realm, there's no potable water in hell. And it's hot as balls there. You don't say. Meredith slipped off the pack in which she carried Benedict. I began to prepare too, ditching my jacket and setting down my pack. Already hungry, I pulled out the homemade energy bars father had given us. We wouldn't take everything he'd pushed on us. A generous dozen each, to hell. We needed to travel light, and save room in our packs for the Lucimesia herb. But we'd definitely bring a few in case that took longer than expected. The mere idea said my pulse pounding. Eat a few energy bars, I suggested to the others. Then stuff six apiece in your bag. If you have any left over, they can stay here for when we come back. And Meredith, don't forget to shift the herb you'll use to seek to a place you can reach. A pocket, but one with a zipper, so it doesn't fall out. They didn't need me to micromanage, but I couldn't help it. I was nervous, and so much rode on Meredith using the herb to seek. We couldn't lose the Lusamesia, or this journey would be for nothing. I'd taken all the superfluous items out of my pack, and was about to situate the energy bars in an easy-to-reach outer pouch, when a tendril of black magic eased past me. I stiffened. Where are you, Nicoletta? You'd live without saying goodbye to me? Nicoletta stepped out from behind a tree, a pouty expression on her face. That hurts, Hans. I snorted. I didn't think you cared much for what I did. You mostly ignored us in the pub. I was having fun. Try it on for size, instead of being miserable and getting drunk. Guys, can we not fight now? Gunnar interjected. We need to keep a clear head, Hans. I'm sorry, but my brother is being so rude. Nicoletta scowled. He hasn't been around for years, and now he's leaving. It's like he doesn't even care about our family. My throat tightened. Did she really think that? Did others? Nicoletta both worried me and pissed me off, but she was my little sister. I loved my family, and one of the primary reasons I left Menem was to protect them. One less half-demon around was sure to lighten the load. Or so I thought. Had I really only hurt them by leaving? Nicoletta, I love you so much. My tone softened as I assured her. Though I have to admit, I've been upset with you since I got here. Lowering her gaze, she gripped her hands in front of her, the gesture uncharacteristically sweet. I know. I'm sorry I told your friends about us. I was mad at you. Wait. Slight though it may be lifted off my shoulders. I understood acting out because I'd done so many times as a teenager, and that's what Nicoletta still was, a seventeen-year-old girl. Brother, can we talk before you leave? Go on, Gunnar urged. No one wants regrets. What he didn't say was that we might not come back, and this talk might never happen. Gunnar had called his family before the flight across the Atlantic to tell them he loved them. Unfortunately, Meredith didn't have anyone to call. At that, a pang cut through me. I was lucky enough to have people who cared, and even if we didn't understand one another, I wanted to make things right. Maybe if I did, my sister would stop rebelling. Yeah, let's walk, I said. My sister and I left the other three, skirting around the circular portal and trailing through the woods. We hadn't made it far before she turned to look at me. I really am sorry. 
I've been a jerk, brother. I just wish we could all be together. I do too, Nick. I confessed. But I have a few really important things to do right now. After we're done, I can come back and visit for longer. The summer could work. Pain shone out of her, as if from her very soul. Hans, do you ever think about Mom? Honestly, I tried not to, but I wouldn't tell my sister that. She's in my heart. I miss her so much. She hasn't been back for years. Nicoletta's dark eyes found mine. I want us all together again. I worry about her. Lilith can take care of herself, I assured her. She's been around for thousands of years. She's tough. Obviously. Where do you think you get it from? She beamed at me, and I grinned back. It was nice to get a compliment from my sister. They were rare. Father misses her too. Unable to add more to that, I nodded. Father had always loved our mother, and Lilith loved him in return, though she could never stay true. Their relationship had been one-sided in that regard, and it's killed me. Hans, I wasn't sure I should say this, but I won't be able to forgive myself if I don't. Nicoletta's dark eyes met mine. I'm positive that I can secure the portal and erase any trace of mother slipping through. If she was here... When I did that, she could stay. I stopped walking. What? How? And why consider this? It's dangerous, sister. I don't care how dangerous it is. Her tone became high-pitched, almost frantic. She'd never sounded more like a teenager. I miss her. I love her. And I want her here, brother. Nicoletta's hand found my wrist, and she turned me so that we stared in each other's eyes. Can you bring her back for me? My heart lodged in my throat. Bring Lilith, Lucifer's wife, here? My sister had gone insane. The princess can't leave hell, she argued. That doesn't mean they can't find a way. The seven princes were banished to hell long ago and kept there by magic. Only hell-blooded now in this realm were distant descendants of demons who had long since been shunted into hell, are monsters created with demon blood by sorcerers. Well, all except Nick and me. The last time Mother was here, she told me that her portal was the only exit. Every time she uses the portal, she fears Lucifer will find it. Then he'll come here too. Nicoletta gestured behind us. But I really think that I can seal it for good, make it stick. And if I do that, though, I need her on this side first. You're more powerful than her? I arched my eyebrows. If that's what she thought, my sister's hubris proved out of this world. Not more, but maybe equal. Mostly we have different skills, but I really think she needs a counterpart to keep her safe. I can do that. You'd be putting the entire village in danger. Maybe the world... Would Lucifer try to break through to this realm if his wife was here? How long would he wait? A day? A decade? For immortals, time ran differently. Please, brother. I never ask you for anything. It was true. Nicoletta did not ask much of me, and I owed her. I'd been gone so long. I'll look for her. And bring her back? My sister's eyes lit up. If I see her which you know isn't likely. Our mother had taught us that the underworld was made of seven kingdoms, each ruled over by a prince. Hell is vast, and I can't go questing about and sabotage this mission, Nick. A life is at stake. She frowned. But that doesn't mean I can't try later. Try your hardest now. Our eyes met, hers so dark they were almost black and hard, unyielding. Promise me that you'll try your hardest, brother. I swallowed, not liking what I was about to do, but about to do it all the same. I will, and if I see our mother, I will bring her back. With a squeal, Nicoletta leapt at me, her arms wrapping around my neck. As we embraced, I realized we hadn't done so since she stood on the cusp of seven years of age. My throat tightened with regret. 
goddess, I was a horrible older brother. I gave her another squeeze before we parted. Tears shimmered in my sister's eyes, and I patted her shoulder. We'll be back as soon as we can. Safe journey, brother. I'll be waiting for your return. With that, I turned. I stomped through the snow back to my friends. That looked like progress, Meredith said as I neared. Did you two make up? We did, I conceded, not ready to tell them about the promise I'd made. If we came across Lilith, an unlikely event, I'd break the news. Actually, that might be good. Lilith could help us out of hell. Until then, we needed to focus on the mission at hand. That's great, man. Glad to hear it. The wolf tightened the straps on his backpack, looking pleased by my family's development. Are you two ready? I craned my head to make sure Benedict was in the backpack. He could go invisible, or at least he could in this realm. Before we tested that premise in hell, we wanted him to be secure and with Meredith. Ready, she confirmed, and Gunnar gave me a nod. Both of you, grasp my hands. You have to enter the circle at the same time as me. What happens if we don't? The witch eyed the ring of dead trees warily. It will hurt. I admitted, choosing not to go into the murderous lengths Mom went to keep this area and our family secret safe. Without hesitation, the pair took my hands, and we stood in a line in front of the largest break in the trees. There will be a lot of heat. Close your eyes to protect them. Giving them a sidelong glance, I inhaled deeply, steeling myself as they followed my directions. Together. I took a step, and the others matched me. When we passed through the barrier, a sizzle of flame caressed my skin, then washed away. You guys okay? They affirmed they were, and I was glad because that had been the easy part. Keep a tight grip. Now that we are in the circle, I have to use the incantation my mother gave me. It will open the portal and take us to the underworld. All right, Meredith replied, and for the first time, nerves laced her voice. Ready? The wolf grunted. Close your eyes again. When they did, I too closed my eyes. Clenching their hands tighter, the dark magic I normally kept tightly locked up inside me surged. It knew where I was, where I would soon enter, and it hoped that now was its time. Not today. I inhaled and then breathed out the word my mother had taught me all those years ago. Altkrix. The cold of the mountain disappeared, and heat, vicious, searing heat, took its place. A gasp escaped Meredith, and I felt Gunnar tense. Stay still, I murmured. It will pass. No sooner than I'd said it, the heat dissipated, and our feet slammed down into hard rock, the snow we trudged through gone. An ear-piercing scream jolted through me. I opened my eyes and nearly vomited. We stood in a shallow, rocky depression, partially hidden by black stone jutting out in front of us. Though small, the outcropping would be enough to hide my mother from sight. But since there were three of us, it was not as effective. Hence, I had a clear view of the horrendous scene before us. Some yards away, a field of demons grew out of the ground, like daisies. Only a dozen of them were still alive, but each and every head was aflame. What the actual shit? Meredith hissed as she peered around the jutting rock. This is the field of punishment, I said, when another demon grew out of the ground and his ugly head ignited. Mom told us about it. Seeing it was so much worse. I hadn't been able to fully visualize the horror before, but now I had no question as to why my mother had placed her portal here. The punished demons just appeared. No one brought them to this place, and they were in no condition to tell anyone about her portal. That's nasty. Gunner's nose wrinkled. Get used to it, because that's only the beginning of the horrors we'll see. I murmured. Chapter 8 Meredith a cascade of shivers rushed down my spine as I followed Hans and Gunnar along the edges of the field of punishment. Though I tried not to look to the side, occasionally a demon head would push out of the ground and ignite. Shrieks of agony followed, making my skin crawl. Between the screaming and the rotting stench of sulfur in the air, 
I was officially regretting signing up for this task. Not that I would turn back. Luca depended on us, and I owed him so much. But damn, I wanted to get this shit over with and leave ASAP. This way. Hans guided, scaling a mess of obsidian rocks on the opposite side of the cavern from the portal. Hoping he was as knowledgeable about where to go as he was seemingly confident, I followed, gripping the rocks and climbing. At the top, I was surprised to find myself at the opening of a tunnel. A few steps in, the screaming faded, and I could breathe easier. How do you know where to go, anyway? Gunner asked. Haven't seen you bust out a map. My mother burned a rudimentary map of hell into my mind. Nicoletta's, too. You know, in case we really needed her help. What's considered rudimentary? I asked, surprised by Lilith's forethought. Then again, she'd been around for, well, probably a long-ass time. Surely she knew how to make sure those she loved were safe. I know where the most demon populous areas are, Hans replied. Where the various suborders of demons live and work, and where the prince's primary palaces are located. How about where the herb grows? I asked, hopeful. If I possessed such a granular knowledge, I wouldn't have brought you, Hans assured me. But I do have a general idea of where it might be. Down here, they can grow plants for potions and food in only a few places. I bet the herb is in one of those areas. And this will take us to one of those locations? Gunner gestured to the black walls of the tunnel. This tunnel has many offshoots and openings, Hans said, but the final one ends in a wide open space, a valley where my map tells me food is grown. There's a castle nearby, and dwellings, which tells me this area is probably actively growing stuff all the time. That's the direction we need to go. Shouldn't we use that invisibility potion? Gunner asked. It will only last an hour, the wizard reminded us, as if I could forget. We'll have to wait until it is absolutely necessary. At the edge of the field would be ideal. How long of a journey through this? I gestured down the tunnel, into the darkness. A few hours? Red flushed Hans's cheeks. I have the map, but distance is hard to determine. There's no scale. I scoffed. The anxiety rippling across his face said it all. He had a map, but no context. What if this took days? Would we survive? Then, then we should move, Gunner urged, and Hans nodded, leading the way. I trailed at the back, my anxiety rising by the second. So much was left to chance, far more than I'd counted on. There should have been a better plan, Benedict whispered. Though I agreed with the familiar, I wouldn't actually voice any negative thoughts. They might become our reality, and we could not risk anything going wrong. Instead, I focused on breathing to calm the heck down and stayed quiet, as did the rest of the group. It didn't take long for sweat to drip down my face. With each step, the heat amped up a notch or two, so I took a glug of water, attempting to stay hydrated in the land of fire and brimstone. Try as I might, as minutes stretched into hours, I kept sweating, and my tongue grew heavier, drier in my mouth. I was weakening and needed a jolt of energy. Reaching for my pack, I grabbed a bar, stuffing it in my mouth. Might I have a bite? Benedict asked. His voice sounded faint, making my heart race. I hadn't even thought to bring him cat food. Benedict preferred tuna, but Hans's father had purchased the high-quality wet cat food, and I hadn't packed a single tin. My stomach hardened with guilt. Sure. I pulled a sizable chunk from the bar and passed it behind me. His feline paws grabbed it, and the sound of chewing filled my ear. Awful, he muttered, making me snort. It's all we have. Be grateful. I'd like down, Benedict replied, some strength returning to his voice. I need to walk to wake up. Without stopping, I slipped off my backpack and unzipped it. He leapt out, stumbling as he hit the ground. I winced. He'd been in there so long his legs were probably asleep. Sorry, I should have let you out sooner. My familiar turned to me, light amber eyes gleaming in the relative darkness. 
his mouth opened, on the edge of replying. And then my vision clouded. The scene before me grew smaller, fading away until my familiar disappeared. Everything did. What the hell? I spun, trying to orient myself, to find my friends. When my vision cleared, as suddenly as it had clouded, I stood in a home, in a wood-paneled corridor lined with photos. There was no more rotten egg smell, but rather the clean tang of sage and peppermint. Voices came from down the hall behind me, and I turned with a gasp. A girl of about nine or ten stood at the end of the hall, her ear pressed to a door. Though I had no memories of my childhood, nor pictures, the girl had my mismatched colored eyes, one blue and one green. She had to be me. I was spying on my parents? Something about the idea rang so true that I snorted out a laugh that choked to a close when a woman yelled. We can't take her to them. She's too young, Gavin. I won't do it. Not yet. Lynn? The man's tone sounded softer, appeasing. Her power is growing by the day. We've told her to keep it hidden. And she's a child. Did you do everything you were told when your magic appeared at the tender age of eight? Silence. No one does, honey. The man, Gavin, my father, reasoned. I didn't, you didn't, and Meredith won't either. I don't want to lose her. The moment we take her to meet them, they'll want to hide her. Perhaps we go on a sabbatical and join her. Before my mother could counter, the girl, me, sneezed. She stiffened, eyes wide, and I sensed she was on the verge of scampering off. But it was too late. The door opened, and a woman appeared. I sucked in a breath. Previously, I'd only seen my father in memories. This was my first time seeing memories of my mother, seeing the other half of what I'd lost. She was absolutely beautiful. Light, glowing brown eyes illuminated her features, her hair dark and shiny. She held herself like a queen, tall, regal, and... My throat choked up as she knelt, pressing a hand to my childish, chubby cheeks. Meredith, darling, it's not polite to listen through doors. You're supposed to be in bed. You were yelling. Daddy and I are talking about the future. Tears shimmered in her eyes. It's about me. I want to know. No, honey. This is for Mommy and Daddy to figure out. She stood, patting my hair. Two rings graced her fingers, her wedding ring, and another that glowed faintly white, like moonlight. We'll choose what's best for the family. Meredith. A voice that sounded far away and deeper than my father's called. Stony. Another male voice added to the mix. Suddenly, I shook, and the hallway disappeared. So did the coolness and the scent of sage. All of them were gone, and sulfur bombarded me once more. Then Gunner appeared in front of me, his eyes narrow and his beefy hand on my shoulder. Stony, what happened? You stopped. Are you hurt? My mouth opened, then closed, only to open again. I saw a memory... Oh, wow. Kind of shitty timing, but good for you, eh? Yeah. I chewed on my bottom lip. Normally, the understatement would have drawn a chuckle from me, but not here. Not now. Not after what I'd heard and seen. I've only had one before, and it wasn't like that. This one was more immersive. We can talk about that later. Han stood beyond the wolf, sweat pouring off his face. We need to keep moving. Or... Whatever he said next was lost as a demon rounded a blind corner with a roar and sprinted our way. A scream threatened to rip from my throat, but I slammed my hands over my mouth, stopping it in time. The beast was huge and disgustingly white, almost see-through, except for the horns on his head and the claws on his hands and feet, which ended in red tips. The wizard whirled, a blaze of red light, magic, soared from his palms, slamming into the demon's chest. The monster flew into the wall, and Hans ran up to it. He hauled the creature up by the horns and whispered something in his ear. Gunner stiffened. What did he say? I asked, 
all the while waiting for a horrible alarm to sound or something that announced our presence. Something about Lilith. I didn't hear the first part. Too shocked. Did Hans think his mother somehow knew he was here and had betrayed us? The question was on the tip of my tongue when Hans sliced his aslinky blade across the demon's neck. Before my eyes, the monster began to disintegrate, turning to white ash. When he was gone, Hans spoke another spell, and a strong breeze distributed the ash down the tunnel. He was alone, Hans assured, but someone might look for him. Will your magic be enough to tip them off that we're here? I asked, terrified that the answer might be yes. I don't think so, but we should haul ass either way. Gunner and I exchanged a glance. Hans didn't sound certain at all. He also hadn't mentioned his mother. As the wizard turned his back on us and began marching down the tunnel, my eyebrows knitted together. Something was off here. Still, I followed. The wizard was acting oddly, but my trust in Hans was strong, especially considering I'd only known him a few days. But he'd been acting off since we learned of this mission. He was not at peace with his demon side, and I suspected that was affecting him in ways I couldn't understand. What could I say to that? It wasn't my battle to fight, nor could I even pretend to understand it. So I stayed quiet and alert as we continued down the tunnel for another unknowable stretch of time. My legs told me that we'd gone maybe another mile when I started to hear voices. Another noise came, and the muscles in my jaw tightened. Not voices. Wailing. I sped up to stride alongside Gunner. Benedict glued to my right. Are there more coming? In front of us, the wizard slowed, and though I couldn't see his face, I suspected he was reading the map his mother had put in his mind. No. A river is up ahead. And there's an opening in the tunnel so demons can get to it. We have to go past the opening carefully. The second he mentioned it, the gaping hole in the side of the tunnel came into sight. My steps became lighter, taking me ever closer to the sounds of wailing that only got louder with each step. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as we closed in on the opening, and the smell of water filled my nostrils. If I listened closely, the slush of running water echoed too. Yes, that had to be the river. Look. Hans reached the door to the outside first and pressed his fingers to the tunnel wall. Etched in the black stone was the word, Lethe. I sucked in a breath. I've read about this before. Because so many of the items the Ringmaster's clients desired had roots in lore or history, my old boss insisted that his thieves be knowledgeable about mythology and legends of other cultures. Lethe is a river in hell, I whispered, which earned me dull looks from the guys, but I wasn't done yet. It's Greek, and one of five waterways documented in literature. They called it the River of Forgetfulness. What does that have to do with us? Gunner asked, eyes trained on the opening, ever prepared for someone to enter the tunnel. It's supposed to flow around the cave of Hypnos, and by Hades's palace, I replied teasing what I'd read from the recesses of my mind, and whoever drinks from it experiences complete forgetfulness. It's so new souls will forget their lives. Is that all true? According to my mother, Hades actually goes by Lucifer. And yeah, you're right. Personally, I think the river is another punishment. Hans muttered with a shrug, like the field. I shrugged. That was an option but down here the river might just as well be a salvation. Who would want to recall their lives when they were stuck in hell? I could see it going both ways. No matter what it is, or where it goes, I don't want my head dipped in that water. We gotta get past this door without anyone seeing, Gunner said. I hear a lot of wailing, which I expect is from the drinkers, but they might have supervisors around, those who don't have to drink. Definitely. There's a hierarchy in the underworld. Hans's blue eyes went to the opening. But I still don't think now is the time to use invisibility. We really need to save that for when it matters most. An illusion? I'd seen him make one before, and it was one of the few castings I was certain Hans was capable of accomplishing. His previous illusion had covered the street outside the coven headquarters, so members could shuttle in blood. This should be cake. 
Hans nodded. I'm wary of keeping my magic up for too long. Don't want anyone to sense me. But at least the gap in the wall is fairly small. Let us know when it's in place. We'll run so you don't have to have it up too long. The wolf said. Have your blades at the ready in case a prince senses it and sends his minions after us, though. I unsheathed my blade from where it hung at my side. Our group clumped together, right at the edge of the opening, while Hans worked his magic. I held my breath, hoping no one sensed a wizard was traipsing around the underworld. When Hans gave the signal, we darted across the threshold. As we did, I stole a glance at the river, and pity stabbed through my heart. Lines and lines of people stood before a figure in black robes. The robed person had their back to us, but in full view were the faces of hundreds of people who waited a drink at the banks of the Lethe. They waited to forget their lives, only to live out their eternity in hell. A shudder gripped my spine. I hoped that we weren't caught and forced to join them. Chapter 9 Tobias Darkness whispered over the countryside, and as I turned down the drive to my brother's estate on Lake Como, a weary exhale left me. The drive had taken longer than it should have, and I was bloody tired of being stuck in the car. I'd always hated lengthy travel, whether it be by horseback, vehicle, or plane. Only standing on the deck of a ship, carving through the ocean waves, could I stomach long journeys. Though I suppose there was one good thing about driving so far— the road demanded my mental focus, so I couldn't wholly focus on those coven members in hell. Couldn't worry about if they lived. Couldn't picture the witch being assaulted by the hellborn. My grip on the wheel tightened and I forced myself to loosen. They will get in and out. Hans wouldn't offer to go if he didn't believe they could escape. And it wasn't just up to Hans. Gunnar was a fierce and capable warrior, and Meredith was a fighter who possessed a bunch of leucemesia. The dried herb she carried would guide her to where the rest grew. They'd find the Lucimesia. The trio would return. Luca would live. I exhaled, trying to believe the tale I'd spun. A gate presented itself about thirty yards down the drive. Off to the side, within view, but not so obvious as to put people off, a small gatehouse loomed. The keeper would perch inside, ready to fire a weapon should I prove to be an intruder. Stopping in front of the intercom, I rolled down my window and pressed the call button. See? Tobias Aston, here for Raphael. The air on the other end of the speaker crackled, going dead for a few seconds longer than normal. Then the gate buzzed open. I pulled through, coasting down the drive. Castel Ramono appeared slowly, in bits and pieces, as the cover of trees thinned. In the setting sun, it was as magnificent as the first time I'd laid eyes upon it, grand and imposing, just as my brother wished. The castle was larger than the Palazzo Medici Riccardi, where Raphael had worked during his youth, serving one of Italy's most famous families. In addition to the monstrous home, my brother had purchased much land, giving him the largest lot on the lake, expanding for miles on each side of his castle. A lover of the finer things, my elder brother had spared no expense. He showed his wealth like a peacock presented its feathers. He loved it, but in my opinion, his home was ostentatious, bordering on that of the imperial Russian style in their most gaudy periods. The road curled into a circular drive which I eased into, stopping the car before steps that led to a front door. Quickly, I grabbed my bag from the back and patted my pocket checking yet again that the moonstone ring was still there. By the time I exited, a man had appeared. He stood by my door, waiting open-handed for the keys. As I faced him, he bowed, and I cocked my head, sniffing the air. This was not a human, but a vampire. And a servant. Interesting. Who are you? I asked, not recognizing the vampire. He looked young, and couldn't have been over eighteen when turned. Valet. The young one answered in a thick accent born in the villages of northern Italy. How long have you been working here? A decade. A punch to the gut. When was the last time I'd visited? If it pleases, Signor Laurent, I will park your car. Wash it, too. Thank you. I handed over the keys. Where might I find my brother? He's Dane. His butler will show you the way. 
Thanks, I said, willing to be coddled, though I recall the way. Then again, a decade had passed. Raphael might have remodeled the entire castle a dozen times over in that span of years. I climbed the steps to the front door, which opened as I crested the staircase. As promised, a butler stood inside, also a vampire, turned in his fifties and clearly Italian by birth, like my brother. He bowed at my approach. My eyes widened. So bowing was common in Raphael's castle now. Like my brother, I descended from royal vampires, and other vampires respected my line in this realm, but they didn't bow. I never would have expected it, but apparently my brother did. Master Laurent is waiting for you, sir? The butler greeted, giving me another tidbit of information. Though the castle bore Raphael's birth family's name of Ramono, he now used his royal name. You may set down your bag, senor. Someone will see it to your room. The man paused. That is, if you are remaining with us for the evening. I'd hope to. I was in no hurry to get back on the road. Master Laurent thought so. The moment the gateman called, we began preparing your quarters. The butler smiled, revealing crooked teeth, an uncommon sight on a vampire. The change usually shifted our teeth into perfection. His teeth must have been even worse as a human. I'll show you to Master Raphael. I followed him, still surprised that Raphael had hired our kind to serve him. Were all his servants vampires now? Before, they'd been humans and regularly compelled to forget the stranger aspects of my brother's home, like why they sometimes left with sore necks, but no markings, because after feeding my brother gave them drops of his own blood to heal quickly. A trickle of cold washed through me. Had Raphael indulged too much, and the humans in the area grew wary? A memory of when Raphael had overindulged in feeding upon young starlets at a French film festival surfaced. That night he had been caught on camera. He'd remained in hiding until Giselle and Serena could take care of the evidence. We'd spent two weeks together, golfing, sampling from Raphael's cellar, discussing literature. Now that I thought about it, that was one of the last memories I had of my brother. The butler halted before the door to the den and opened it. Master, your brother Tobias Aston has arrived. Show him in. My jaw tightened. From the tone, I deduced two things. My brother was a touch drunk and not pleased to see me. Was he in one of his moods? Those would drive away a dragon. And yet... They didn't stop me from stepping into a room as moody and brooding as the vampire I was visiting. My lips curled into a smile. Brother. Tobias. Raphael replied, lifting a glass from where he stood by a window overlooking the lake. His face was steely, as it so often was, as if there was not a party to be had. The soft click of the door behind me announced the butler's retreat, leaving us alone. Only a few lights lit the study, draped in dark woods, rich fabric, and old money. I didn't expect your arrival. Apologies. I should have called, but I thought I might surprise my elder brother. You used to enjoy surprises. Only in the form of bosoms, drink, and money. I chuckled. It was true, and funny. Though, by the look on Raphael's face, you'd never know it. I'd hoped that long-absent family would make the list. But you still call yourself Aston. Am I to throw off my past as you've done? I arched an eyebrow. Does calling myself Aston rather than Laurent make us less than brothers? Of course not. I was merely making a point. "'Taken,' I said lightly, a playful smirk on my lips. "'Have you by chance taken up the study of law?' Raphael snorted. "'He despised lawyers, always had. "'Have a seat, Tobias. "'We have much to catch up on.' "'His steps took him to a bar at the edge of the den. "'Wine? "'You know what I like?' "'I reclined in a burgundy armchair by the window.' looking out over the vast expanse of lawn. Night had now fallen in earnest, 
and darkness settled on the land outside the castle. He poured me a glass of what I was sure was his best vintage, and I stared out the window. Beyond an expansive lawn, Lake Como glinted in the moonlight, and in my mind an image of Meredith materialized, bathed in the same silvery light. My throat tightened. Were they out of hell yet? Shay had promised that when she got word of their return, she'd text me. It might be days. Barolo. Raphael approached, handing me a wine glass. The vineyard no longer exists. A shame. With the first sip, my eyes widened as notes of rose, licorice and leather swept my tongue. Agreed. Did you buy the lot? You know me well. You love the best, always have. A lesson you could learn. So do you still hide your royal name in the coven of yours? Luca knows, and now Hans has known for a while too. I shrugged. A couple of others know too, but I don't flaunt it. I used to think the same, but perhaps you should. What did that mean? I sipped my wine again determined to change the subject to protect SNS's secrets. This is exquisite. Swirling the wine in his glass, my brother sat in the chair next to me. Did Giselle send you? She suggested I visit, but I would have come anyway. I admitted. Perhaps not at this exact moment, if it weren't so convenient to travel here, but that was better left unsaid. She should have come too. The ease gracing his face fell a touch. I often got the sense that my older brother believed our sire did not pay him enough attention. I tell Raphael he's my favourite child to mollify him. You know how moody he gets. Giselle's words came back to me, and for the first time, I wondered if maybe he wasn't a bit right. She will, I promised. She's working on something for the blood right now and can't get away. Why she bothers with them is beyond me. Another touchy subject. Decades ago, Raphael spent time in the royal vampire court of Asila, and they did not celebrate his presence. As a result, his regard for our royal kin had diminished. Best not to dwell on them. So, Raph, what have you been up to these long years? I used his nickname cautiously and didn't miss the look of surprise my brother threw at me. I see you've replaced your staff with our kind. Shocking, that. One of many surprises, to be sure. The humans stopped coming. Raphael had driven them away. Do your neighbours suspect anything? I gestured to the large homes on either side of his castle, due to the size of Raphael's estate and the trees surrounding it. One couldn't see much of them, but they were present, looming aside Castle Romano. They're both American celebrities. Never there, nor would they listen to those from the village. Ideal neighbours. Still, it is good to be careful. I don't see why we have to. We're more powerful than humans by a long shot. He focused on the wine in his glass. I bore of bowing to them. This wasn't the first time my brother had expressed such views. Taken a touch further, he was a prime candidate for the Ordo Returnum. That was, if they didn't want to create an apocalypse to maintain their new world order. My brother would loathe an apocalypse. All that luxury gone, how would he survive? I jest, Tobias. Truly? Yes. He replied, a lie tainting his tone. Unsure of how to proceed, I took another sip of wine. For a brief spell, things had become lighter, more like in the days when I was a young vampire and Raphael didn't see me as a thief of our sire's attention. One more drink, and the wine was gone. I looked at the glass, sad that I'd paid it less attention than it deserved. There's more, Raphael offered knowingly. Help yourself. I will. Thankful for the break in our conversation, I rose and strolled to the bar, 
taking time to appreciate the pieces furnishing my brother's den along the way. A handcrafted cabinet with quartz handles that, on my last visit, I'd learned cost millions to acquire. My brother's Fabergé egg, once owned by the Russian imperial family, now rested, nearly innocuous, on an end table by a settee. My eye swept over a Renaissance painting of Raphael's hometown, done in the style of da Vinci, and focused on the gold plaque that glinted at the bottom. The painting wasn't in the master's style. It was by the master. Where did you acquire this? I asked, gesturing to the painting while I continued to the bar. I have not seen this before. Two years back. It was a privately owned work, but the moment I saw it, I had to have it. Of course, it's of your home. This is my home. I shut my mouth. Raphael might have wanted the painting because of who created it, but perhaps there was something about it that bugged him, too. Perhaps it reminded him of his downtrodden roots. Finally slipping behind the bar, I searched for the bottle. First, however, my gaze snagged on something else. A pair of sunglasses, flat at the top, black, and so modern that they stuck out amidst the finery of the past. My head tilted as I plucked the pair up with my fingers. They were nothing special, definitely not designer glasses, hence not Raphael's. Yet they seemed so familiar. Where had I seen those before? What are you doing? Raphael's tone hardened, and I looked up to find him watching me with a stern expression. Are these yours? I held up the glasses. Of course. His tone was the same as when he'd lied, and I wanted to call him on it, but refrained. Tonight was my time to speak with my brother. Bond. Now that I was here, guilt over staying away for so long swarmed me. I placed the glasses down and reached for the Barolo. Not your usual style. An impulsive and poor choice, I admit. My brother conceded, with a hint of a smile. But enough about me. What have you been doing of late, brother? Shocked, I blinked. Raphael didn't ask about me often. Don't look at me like that. You and Serena have always acted like I didn't care about you two. Not exactly. More like I'd rather discuss myself. I had nothing to say to that, which apparently hit my brother hard. A sheepish shadow crossed his expression, the sight strange on his strong, classic Roman features. For a while, I've been thinking it's time to change my ways and it must be a sign that you drove all the way here to check in. He waved me back to him. So please, tell me what Tobias Blake Aston has been doing these past years. Taking the bottle back to where we sat, I reclined in the chair. The ring in my pocket felt suddenly heavier. There was much I couldn't discuss with Raphael, but I had many facets to my life. I'd only have to steer clear of those regarding the Lapis Calesti. Easily done. So I dove into my personal studies, mostly focusing on various sciences, which evolved so much over the years that they held me captivated. Raphael listened intently and asked questions. We laughed. We drank. We discussed literature like old times. And before we realized it, the night slipped away, and the sun climbed the sky, shedding light upon the lake. At nine, a knock at the door finally interrupted us, and the butler poked his head into the room. Master? Yes. The human from the museum in Florence is here to appraise your latest acquisition. Do you wish to speak with her? I'll be right there. Raphael's eyes fell on me. This has been quite an evening, brother. It has, I said a little drunk from the many bottles of wine we'd gone through. And tired. More tired than I had been in ages. The vampires didn't need sleep in the same way that mortals did. We still required rest. I think I might lie down. When you wake, 
Perhaps we can hunt. I arched an eyebrow. Pheasant or bontings. Your pick. Sounds like fun. I'm waiting for a message from my employer, but if I don't hear from them, then yes, I'll stay the day. Raphael rose. I'll see you later, then. The master of the house exited the den, but the butler remained. I'll show you to your room, Signor Aston. Tobias, I corrected. Very well. The older vampire led me through the castle, up the stairs and down a narrow corridor. While we walked, I stole a glance at my phone. Shay still hadn't contacted me. Then again, she couldn't have been in the States long. There was no call or text from Luca either, which was more telling. The trio who'd quested to hell had not returned. My fists clenched, but I forced myself to shrug off the frustration from not being able to help Meredith, Hans, or Gunnar. I'd done my job, discovered who the vault and Le Bastion belonged to, and that the theft was connected to the mystery group of thieves. Now, I had to trust that the other team could handle their jobs too. Forcing my attention away from that which I could not change, I focused on the paintings and the other pieces of artwork we passed, many Italian in provenance. The palace was abnormally quiet, seemingly empty of souls, though I suspected most were just out of sight. Raphael was probably of the belief that unless he required their assistance, servants should be neither seen nor heard. The corridor ended in another hallway. When we reached the tea, the butler went left, but I stopped. A few of the windows in this corridor were open, and a scent hung in the air, faint, yet strong enough to catch my attention after bottles of wine. Smoke? A hint of brimstone? Signor! I turned to find the butler waiting. Is someone burning incense? That would be most unusual in a vampire household. We avoided strong smells. Not that I'm aware of. If it displeases you, I can find the source and eliminate it. Lifting my nose, I sniffed the air again. But the scent had disappeared. It must have been passing, blown away by a lake breeze. Perhaps Raphael was incorrect, and one of his celebrity neighbours was at Como, practising morning yoga. That won't be necessary. I can barely smell it now. I admitted to the butler, even though something still felt off. Best not to rock the ship in Raphael's home, and a faint whiff meant little. Carry on. Very good. This way, senor. Chapter 10 Meredith Time had officially become meaningless in hell. The heat shimmered in the air, oppressive, pulling sweat from our pores so that it dripped down our chins. Benedict had lost the pep in his step the energy bar had given him, and my own steps resonated as heavy, achy, too. Though we were careful to conserve water, I was growing ever more fearful that our supply would not last. At the thought of water, my throat itched and burned. I reached for my canteen, needing a sip, but became distracted when Hans stopped. The opening into the farming field is around an upcoming bend. Are you two ready? I was dying to get out of this tunnel. But was I ready to seek amidst a field of demons? Who in their right mind would say yes to that? Still, when Gunnar nodded, I did too. Not about to be the weak link in our chain. Time for these babies, then. Hans slipped a hand in his pocket, pulling out the vial of invisibility potion. Goosebumps dashed up my arms. Finally! Gunnar and I mimicked Hans extracting our potions from our packs. My bag was soaked through with sweat, only driving home the fact that I was dehydrating quickly, so I also grabbed my water and took two large gulps. Finally, I extracted the small bundle of leucemesia herb Daphne had given me. This bunch of herbs was the only thing I needed to seek. Though tempted to call on my magic right away, to feel how strong the pull was, hence how close the herb, I didn't. Any use of magic put us in danger, and unlike Hans, I had less skill at controlling the fluctuations in my power. It was best to wait until we entered the farming area and got the lay of the land, until we absolutely needed my seeker magic. We have an hour to find the leucemesia after the potion takes effect. Bottoms up. 
The wizard popped the top off his vial and downed its contents. I followed suit, delighting in the moisture and the taste of mint. How long do you think we walked for? I asked. Time runs different here, Hans explained, but my legs say hours. My body agreed. That meant we'd be trekking for hours back. On autopilot, I pulled my second-to-last energy bar from my pack, gobbling down two-thirds of it. The rest I gave to Benedict. Hans nodded his approval. Good thinking. Keeping up your energy. You good, Gunner? Yeah. Stone, give me a whiff of that herb. Maybe I can help scent it out while we're in the field. The instant I offered him the bundle, the wolf put it to his nose, inhaling deeply. Then he returned it. My first order of business is to watch your back, but if I catch the scent of the leucemesia, I'll tell you. Thanks. Having help would be welcomed, if it meant we could get the hell out of Dodge quicker. I... Cold washed over me, and out of nowhere I felt... Wispier? Like a strong breeze might blow me away. My potion kicked in, Hans announced. You're blurry. What? Your edges are blurred. Daphne told me that's a sign that you're invisible to others, Hans said. Are you too cold and kind of weak? Yeah, I murmured, super confused. But we can still see each other. That's because the potions are from the same batch. If you're cold, not quite feeling all there, and fuzzy looking to other potion takers, then you're invisible. I'm blurry too, right? You are, I turned to Gunner. He too seemed fuzzy. This was so odd. Both of you. Then let's not waste any time, Hans said, gesturing for us to follow. We set off, and soon enough rounded the bend. The tunnel opened before us, light spilling into the ring of obsidian we'd been walking through for hours. I sucked in a breath. As Hans had predicted, a field spread out in front of us. A field filled with hundreds of monstrous-looking creatures working the soil. I scanned the valley, fear gripping me tighter and tighter by the second. There were more types of devils than I ever could have imagined, and during our walk, I'd been imagining a hell of a lot. Some of them loomed over others, massive brutes, all muscle and mean red eyes below their curled horns. The largest among them looked like pure meat shells, with plows attached to their bodies, while they trudged down the fields to dig up the earth. Most suborders were smaller many with black wings and carrying cans of water in clawed hands. The supervisors looked the most human, though with barbed tails and horns. They walked up and down the paths between the plantings, whipping anyone who didn't move fast enough. Or maybe just because they wanted to? Every few seconds, the sound of a whip cracked on flesh, and a growl or shriek of pain filled the air. Excessive and disgusting. On the far side of the valley, miles away, steam rose. From the dripping of lava down one mountainside, I suspected a river of lava flowed over there, bubbling and boiling hot. Please don't let the herb be close to that. It was so far away that it would take us the better part of an hour to get there. Returning to the relative safety of the tunnel would be impossible. Stay close, Hans whispered. Benedict, that means you. The cat peered around the corner and glared at Hans before turning invisible with his own magic. Truth be told, the wizard had a point. Benedict often trailed off, separating himself from the group. He couldn't do that here. We rounded the edge of the valley, steering clear of the demons working the fields. As we trod, I gawked at the massive black castle on the opposite side of the valley. Which prince of hell did that belong to? Were they in residence now? Close enough to feel my magic when I used it? Gunner, can you smell the herb? The wizard whispered. Not a whiff. Can't smell much over the stink of demons, though. It's way stronger in the field. Let's hope they can't detect us over their stench, then. My stomach dropped. Did the demons have enhanced senses, like wolves? There were so many kinds that surely they did, right? Oh, God. Okay, Meredith. Hans twisted, catching my eye and ripping me out of what would have likely become an epic mental freakout session. Are you seeking? We can't put it off any longer. Oh, crap. I've been so caught up in the demons and the castle and, well, everything else, 
that I'd spaced. My hands grew clammy. So far, it didn't seem that Benedict's invisibility had set off any alarms. But would adding my magic be the tipping point? Would mine be more powerful, more noticeable? An image of Luca clinging to life in the infirmary bed swam in my mind, and my throat tightened. No matter the risk of using magic, I had to do it. My power was our best chance to find the Lucimesia and get the hell out of here. On it. I gripped the bunch of herbs in my hand and called my magic. It sprang to life inside of me, as if it too had been waiting for this moment. Tingles rippled across the skin of my hand, holding the Lucimesia, flew up my arm and into my core. I took in a stealing breath and no longer noticed the stench of sulfur but instead waiting for the sensation that would tell me if we were on the right track. One more step. Two. Then three. The pull struck behind my breastbone, and suddenly I sensed the loose amnesia, knew it was here. Not close enough to bend down and pull it from the soil, but here. Somewhere. It's in the field, I whispered. Thank fuck, the wizard breathed hinting that he might have been more uncertain than he'd shown. Can we stop for a second? I want to get a clear read. For the time being, there wasn't a demon too close to us. The nearest one was about fifty feet away, a hulking beast pulling an old-fashioned plow to create new furrows in the soil. Obliging, Hans paused, and Gunner followed in line. As Benedict was using his own magic and not our potion, I couldn't see him, but hoped he was listening. Not about to waste a second— I honed in on the direction of the pull and scanned the field. As my magic searched, I did too. Daphne had informed me that living Lucimesia looked a lot like dillweed, and when she showed me a photo, I agreed. Though, the herb from the underworld had purple flowers with spiky petals on the top, which my dried herb did not have. I hoped the flowers would stand out in the field, but there were a lot of colors out here, mostly red, but enough blues and purples to make me doubt if I was looking at a patch of Lucimesia or not. The tug of seeker magic yanked me to the left, and I twisted, eyes widening when I caught a patch of purple amongst a bunch of red. That had to be it. Thank goodness it wasn't by the river of lava. There! I pointed for the guys. See the purple? Yup. Hans looked at Gunner, and I was struck by how weird they looked, all fuzzy around the edges of their body. As my extremities were blurred, I knew I looked the same to them too, but still... How bizarre. I'll take front. You stay behind her. Meredith, if your magic changes direction on you at any time, do not hesitate to tell us. There might be more crops, and if we need to, we'll make a couple of stops. Filling up the bags is imperative. That row of crops has some of the bigger monsters hanging around. Gunner considered, sizing up a demon who was indeed standing two rows over from the one we needed to pick. When we harvest... We do it carefully. Not too much from one place, like we talked about earlier, Hans added, clearly as worried as I was that the smallest thing would give us away. Shit, I was trying not to even breathe too loudly. And Benedict? On Meredith's left, the cat replied. You stay behind Gunner. We can't have anyone tripping over you. That means if we have to do a quick retreat, I best be quick about it. Yeah. Hans confirmed. For a second, a thoughtful expression crossed his face, but it seemed he had nothing else to add, so he rolled his shoulders back and gave the signal to move. Let's go. I fell in line behind the wizard, my magic still tugging me in the same direction. Steady, strong, reassuring. We were at the point where every minute counted. I didn't want to get halfway there, only to realize that I'd misspoken and the herb was actually a mile in the other direction— the tunnel might be relatively free of demons, but this field was crawling with them. We could not be in the open when the invisibility potion stopped working. We scurried down the row I was pulled to, our steps halting when two demons passed, talking to one another in a brutal-sounding language full of hard sounds and guttural noises. As soon as they passed, we were on the move again, reaching the patch of herbs a few minutes later. A relieved breath left me seeing that the plant in front of us matched the dried Lucimesia herb in my hand. Just the fresh version with flowers still attached. This is it. I knelt in front of it. I opened my bag, 
taking care to keep touching the fabric of the backpack so it wouldn't become visible. The guys did the same. We knew the drill. This was the moment that counted. With a gentle shake to vanquish the nerves, I wrapped my hands around the stem, as close to the roots as I could get. Haler Daphne had told us that if we got some root, the supplier in our world might be able to use the roots to replant his crops. It was a long shot, but we had to do our best to harvest properly. Every handful counted, and no one needed to undertake this quest again. I gripped and pulled. The herb came free of the dirt, which was loose and dry. Easily. Slowly, I shifted the plant into my bag. Reposition, I whispered, and as a team, each of us moved down two spots. We had to spread out what we took, so we wouldn't leave obvious patches in the field. Steadily, we worked together like machines, pulling and shifting down a few spaces, moving as fast as we dared. Behind you! Benedict hissed, and the rest of us froze when one of the supervising demons strode our way about four rows behind. The whip in his hand dragged along the ground, like a snake poised to strike. My pulse pounded so hard and fast that I feared he might hear it. Once the creature passed, and got far enough away, I exhaled a breath I hadn't even known I was holding. Too damn close for comfort, Gunner whispered. For sure, Hans rasped. My bag's half full. Yours? I nodded, as did Gunner. Relief dashed across Hans's face. Five more minutes. Get as much as we can, then we live. I'd never heard sweeter words. I went to work, counting the seconds as I harvested, hitting sixty, and starting again at zero. When I'd done so five times, I looked at Hans, and blinked. He'd stopped harvesting altogether, and was turned the other way, his shoulders rigid, his gaze on something in the distance. A castle? A foe? My attention drifted up, and I shifted so that I could see around him. Catching his view, I sucked in a breath. A woman stood off the fields, her hair a brilliant red, her beauty striking in a landscape of demons and darkness. A strength wafted off of her, unlike anything I'd ever seen. But he couldn't just be looking at her beauty, nor because power radiated from her. Was that Hans's mother? She didn't look old enough to be. But Lilith was eternal, a demon prince's wife. She might not age. Hans? I whispered, trying to break him out of his trance. In answer, he zipped up his bag, rose, and began walking toward the woman. What in the hell is he up to? Gunner asked, too loudly, and a nearby demon turned our way. Eyes narrowed. The brute grunted, though it sounded like a question, like he was wondering who had spoken but I couldn't spare the demon another thought. Hans was getting too far away. We had to stop him before he blew our mission. Securing my bag, I darted after the wizard. The sound of footsteps told me that Gunner jogged at my heels. Unable to see him and check, I hoped Benedict trailed us too. As we ran after Hans, he picked up speed. The red-haired woman had entranced him, so much so that he didn't even look back at us. I watched in horror as he stopped in front of her, reached for her. He's giving away that we're here. Hans's hand landed on the woman's shoulder, and she jerked back. But he must have said something, too, because an instant later, a smile bloomed on her face. Her shoulders loosened. Okay. She knows him. It has to be his mom. She... Oh, shit! Hans had not just announced himself to someone, thereby risking our mission... He'd also stopped looking fuzzy, an indicator that the invisibility potion was wearing off. But we couldn't have already been out here for an hour. Stony, Gunner whispered. I know, I shot back, unable to take my eyes off Hans and the woman, who stared at where he stood, though the blur around the edges of his body had reappeared, so I didn't think she saw him. Pure shock on her beautiful face. We had to get the hell out of Dodge. Fast. With a burst of speed. I sprinted toward them, nearly colliding with the wizard. Hans! I hissed, which made the red-haired woman jump. What are you doing, you idiot? We have to get out of here. Mother, you have to come with me. Hans ignored me, 
redirecting Lilith's attention to him. I stiffened as again, for a heartbeat, Hans became solid and therefore visible. Nicoletta needs you. The demoness stared right at where Hans stood, now invisible once more. But who knew for how long? Her expression was loving, yet pained. I expected that she couldn't see him, but she envisioned him there, with her. Son, your friend is right. You must leave. Now. But... I slammed my hand onto his shoulder and whirled Hans around to face me. You're flickering back to solid. No one has noticed yet, but they will. We have to... The blur around my arm vanished and returned. Oh, no. Now I was flickering into sight, too. Intruders! Someone roared from deep in the field. Queen of Darkness, they're right next to you. We'd run out of time. Lilith's eyes hardened. I can't join you, son. Go, now. But I promised Nicoletta I'd bring you back. He'd done what? Heat that had nothing to do with how unbearably roasting it was down here flared within me. It was a foolish promise, my son. I'll visit when I can. Lilith's eyes trailed to something behind me, and my blood ran cold as terror flashed in her eyes. I'll cover for you. Fire bloomed in the queen's hands, and she blasted it over our heads. Go, son. If you don't, you and your friends shall perish. Gripping Hans's arm, I pulled him. He didn't budge an inch, but Gunner butted in. And when he grabbed Hans, he couldn't fight the Alpha Blood strength. Gunner dragged the wizard across the crops, rustling them as we went, but considering our time constraints, I figured that was the least of our worries. I ran after them, sweat pouring down my face. Benedict! I yelled, panicking and forgetting to stay quiet. Right next to you. Jump into my arms! I held them out, urging him to make the leap. A second later, a furry weight landed. I clutched him to my chest, holding on for dear life. We had to make it to the tunnel. If we could stay invisible and do that, there was no reason to believe the demons would go there. The tunnel had been empty before, unused. I had to believe it would be that way again, that we wouldn't have a horde chase us. A vicious roar came from behind, and against my better judgment, I twisted. And that second, the glimmer of hope I'd been clinging to crashed and burned. Three of the skinny winged demons were already chasing us. Faster! I gritted out. We were fuzzy around our edges, so the demons couldn't see us, but we were leaving a trail through the field. Once we got to the tunnel, we'd be much more difficult to follow. Guys, we have to... A rope of fire lashed from behind the winged beasts, lassoing them and ripping them in half. What the heck? My questions were answered, as I caught sight of Lilith pulling the lasso of flame back. I exhaled. Hans's mother had our sixes, and I had to trust that she would do everything to allow us to escape. We need to pick up the... When I turned to face my team, the words died in my throat. Two rows down, coming from the side, a muscular horned demon charged toward Hans and Gunner, the latter of whom was focusing solely on forcing the wizard forward. Guys! I yelled, but the beast ran at an astonishing speed and had already launched himself at Hans, claws extended, mouth gaping. By some miracle... The demon miscalculated, hitting the ground before he could grasp our friend. Yet, his claws were so long that they still sank into Hans's leg. The wizard roared, and magic flew from him, sending the demon soaring back the way he'd come. If our flickering invisibility and me yelling like a madwoman hadn't given us away, that surely had. Not that I was angry at Hans for fighting back. That demon was out for blood, and he'd gotten it too, but Hans had made him pay for it. Thankfully. The wizard could still run, though now with a limp. My heart began to beat frantically. If only using more invisibility potion was an option, that would save our butts. As it was, it would be a miracle if we got out of here alive. A screech shot another surge of adrenaline through me, and I glanced behind us once more. Again, Lilith was wielding fire, but somehow she was even fiercer than before. With astonishing accuracy, she hurled fire at anyone who was close or chasing us, including the flock of demons. They dropped from the sky, rolling through the crops, and setting row after row aflame. 
I found it almost impossible to tear my eyes away from Hans's mother. She was so powerful. It was like she was the flame. Better yet, her attacks were causing other demons, probably the ones for which tending the crops was their occupation, to give up on following the intruders. They were now focused on trying to save the plants. I'd bet money that if the crops died, they did too. This was hell, after all. Determined not to let the Queen of Darkness's actions be in vain, I put on a burst of speed and raced for the tunnel. Chapter 11 Hans Regret tore at every fiber of my being as we rushed through the tunnel. Though it was lunacy, with each step my heart urged me to return to my mother, to pull her behind me, to make good on my promise to Nicoletta. But somehow my brain stayed in control. As the only one capable of working the spell to open the portal, Gunnar, Meredith, and Benedict were counting on me to get them back home. I couldn't risk their lives. Not again. I'd already royally screwed up by blowing our cover. My mother had had to save our asses. What made it even harder was that I'd seen how much Lilith wanted to come. The yearning to be with my father, the man she loved, and her children shone plainly in her eyes. The moment I flickered out of invisibility, however, that desire had vanished, replaced by the fierceness of a lioness. My fists clenched so tightly that my nails cut into the skin of my palms. If only I'd spotted her five minutes earlier. If that had been the case, we all might have been able to sneak out of hell. As it stood, I'd returned only with a broken promise, with lives put at risk and my coven mate's ire upon me. Worst of all. My mother was likely now in danger because she'd protected us. A burning sensation flared in my dry throat when I swallowed, my body begging for water. Was this the day my mother came clean about her family in my world? Would Lucifer kill her for her adultery? If so, it would be all my fault. My soul cracked in half, and my breath ripped out of me, leaving me feeling empty save for the pain washing through my body. We're close, right? Meredith wheezed just before we burst out of the tunnel and scrambled down a mountain of black, shiny rocks. She hitched her bag full of Lucemesia higher, shifted Benedict's weight in her arms, but her attention remained trained on me, demanding an answer. The portal entrance is close? Yes, as it opened to our side. We're close. Do you hear anyone? No, Gunnar replied. He'd been listening for trailing footsteps for hours. Good. I'll go first, I offered, while Meredith and Gunnar slowed so that even with my limping gait I overtook them. We were within twenty feet of the portal, a hidden niche in the otherwise black expanse of wall, when I held up my hands. Grab on. Meredith grunted, shifting Benedict's weight yet again, from both arms to one. Then one of her hands latched onto mine, while Gunnar took the other, and we shuffled into the depression in the rock wall. Altcrix. Hale disappeared and a bitter cold wrapped around me, sucking away the stifling heat. The abrupt change in temperature shocked my body, and I was unable to brace myself as we entered the human world. I fell like a rag doll, snow shoving its way up my nostrils, when I face-planted in the centre of the circle of dead trees. A moan escaped my lips, half from exhaustion, half from relief. The oppressive heat was gone. We'd retrieved the herb. Against all odds, and despite my idiocy, we'd survived. Thank the goddess. Meredith shifted to her side, groaning as she did so. You okay, Benedict? F -f -f Fine. The stutter, so unlike the pull-together feline, betrayed the truth. No one here was fine. We were all reeling from what we'd seen, how we'd almost died, and the marathon sprint back to safety. How we'd run so far for so long, I don't think I'd ever know. It had to have been the adrenaline pushing us through. Well, I feel like hell, Meredith grunted. Another shift in the snow, another groan. Gunner? Wish I had a cold brewski to calm the old nerves. At that, a strangled laugh worked its way up my throat, and I pushed myself up, grabbing a handful of snow and shoving it in my mouth. Damn, that was good. Cold and wet. My vision, which I hadn't even noticed was cloudy from dehydration, cleared a touch, and I looked around us. 
The forest was still, stars glinting in the pitch-black sky. So it was night. What day? What time? Somewhere in the distance, a wolf howled, then another, only to be joined by a third. I scrubbed a wet hand over my nape. That's a real one. Gunner rasped from where he lay, face up, staring at the sky. Not my kind. Uh, we should go then? Meredith asked, already sitting up and looking worried that a wolf might jump through the circle of trees and attack. It won't come here, I assured her. Nothing does. But we have to walk a long way back to the village. That's plenty of time for a wolf pack to find us. Meredith sounded like the very thought of walking to Menim might do her in. I didn't blame her. With my limp, I wasn't looking forward to the hours of hiking through the snow either. But at least, we had plenty of water and the extra energy bars we left here to sustain us. The plastic baggies filled with goods were half buried in the snow. We were beat, but strong. Get some calories in us and we'd be fine. The wolves won't bug us as we walk either, Gunner added. The pack will sense me and stay away. He rose to sit, his shirt soaked through with sweat. The first brave soul to attempt walking around was Benedict, which he did as if he were a kitten trying out his legs for the first time. When I tried standing, too, I nearly fell over. The dehydration was real, more serious than I'd let myself feel in the underworld, so I ate five more handfuls of snow. Slowly, my energy rekindled to where I thought moving might be an option. I took a tentative step toward the edge of the trees. I blinked. Someone was walking toward us. Wiping my eyes, I focused on the shadow again. Is that Nicoletta? Sister? It's me. What are you doing out here? It's late. The woods were dangerous at night. The spot we stood in was safe, but she would have walked for miles to get here, and the rest of the forest was crawling with animals. Waiting for you, brother. I didn't go home. What? How long have you been out here? It's the day you left, a few minutes before midnight. We'd been in hell for twelve hours. It felt like so much longer. Where's mother? She's still in hell. I admitted to Nicoletta. I'm so sorry, Nick. I tried to bring her. I really did. My sister's face turned hard as stone. He tried so hard it nearly got us killed. Meredith spat out. Which, by the way, I have questions about. Why didn't you tell us you were on the lookout for your mom? I turned to the other two. I'm sorry. I told Nicoletta I'd bring our mother back if the opportunity presented itself, and it did, so... You did see her, then? My sister asked, her tone twisted with venom and steel. Yes. She'd come closer, and now stood right in front of me, her hands clenched at her sides. I spoke with Mom Nick. She was so happy to see me, to hear of you. You saw her? You spoke with her? And you didn't bring her? Tendrils of darkness, illuminated by the moonlight, spooled out of Nicoletta. My eyes widened, and I took a step back. Clearly, she was so upset that she couldn't control herself right now. It had been a long time since that happened, and spoke to how badly my sister had wanted our mother back. We ran out of time, and were in a dangerous position. You broke your promise. You're worthless. Black wings unfurled from her back, whipping the wind around me and stealing all the breath from my lungs. What the hell? She'd never had those. Nicoletta! I called, taking a faltering step as she beat cold wind into my face. What are you doing? What I should have done when you showed up here, you worthless piece of rahat! A blade appeared in her hand, one I recognized from Father's collection, the silver glinting in the moonlight. My heart rate kicked up as I dove into the snow, only to be caught by black tendrils of magic. I struggled but they wound their way around my body, my neck, covering my mouth and stealing my air. Flat on my back, my sister sneered viciously down on me. Leave him alone! Meredith screamed, to which my sister laughed, a lyrical crow's laugh. 
in the dark. Nick's eyes glowed red. He failed me. Failed our family. Hans is weak. He always has been. It's why he ran away instead of facing those in our tiny village. She spat on the ground. The pressure around my throat tightened, and I began to choke. I reached up, pulling at the ribbons of darkness and failing. Nicoletta's smile widened, a cruel slash in an otherwise angelic face. She was strangling me with her tendrils. Huh! I tried to cry for help, but only managed part of the word. It was enough. The air shifted in a way that I recognized Gunner was transforming, but my vision was already going fuzzy. The Alpha wouldn't be fast enough to counteract Nicoletta's assault. Benedict, however, was. With shocking viciousness, the cat leapt over my sister with a hiss, claws extended. He struck true, clawing at my sister's cheeks, slicing her skin open. A pain-filled scream ripped from her throat, and her tendrils released me, allowing breath to swoop into my lungs once more. I gulped it down, and slowly the world shifted back into focus. Vile beast! Nicoletta screamed, and the cat wailed, disappearing from my starry field of vision. A thunk told me he'd been hurled against a tree. Benedict! Meredith screamed. Desperate to help, I drew in another breath and staggered to my feet, calling on my magic. I faced my sister, who was now sneering at Meredith while she kneeled outside the circle of trees, cradling her unconscious familiar. How could you? Meredith spat, her free hand reaching for her ass slinky blade. At the sight of the dagger, my sister snorted, shooting a dark tendril at Meredith. It struck her square in the temple, and the witch collapsed with the cat in her arms. Nicoletta! I roared. She's knocked out, Nicoletta sang. I don't need to kill. My prince will eliminate all the weaklings when he takes over. He will be the great decider of fates. Was she insane? What was she talking about? Gunner's vicious growl called my attention, his wolfish silver eyes glinting with a warning that he was about to strike, but I held out a hand. It was my failure that had upset her, and I knew firsthand how hot the darkness burned through us when we were in that state. I had to control her, to make her see sense and get answers. She'd done damage, but she could still come back from it. I just needed to talk sense into my sister. What are you talking about, Nicoletta? Why would you or some prince want to... I swallowed, recalling her cruel words. Eliminate anyone. Nicoletta's wings beat, lifting her higher into the air, and as she rose her eyes glowed red in the center. The sight froze my every muscle. No, this couldn't be real. Nicoletta had embraced her demon side more than I'd known, more than I thought was possible. You didn't really believe I sat in Menim for a decade, waiting for my stupid big brother to return. For mother to make an appearance. My sister sneered. No, Hans. After a year, it became clear you weren't coming back. So I took matters into my own hands. I sought mentors. Practiced my magic. You understood how to use magic when I left, I countered. I made sure of it, and father could have helped you too. Father can help me with witch magic. Weak, power, unworthy of someone of my line. Nicoletta spat into the snow. Your line too, brother, if you weren't too cowardly to claim the blood in our veins. The moonlight fell on her back, illuminating the tendrils that spooled out of her, both mesmerizing and threatening as they twisted toward the heavens. My teeth gnashed together. What prince are you talking about? A lord of darkness, of course. Gunner growled again, but I kept my arm out, hoping he'd stay put. If he wanted to, he could push past me. He was, after all, an alpha wolf, the strongest of his kind. But I had to get to the bottom of this, had to understand. Impossible, I argued. The princes of darkness are all banished to the underworld. For a brief period during the Second World War, the princes had figured out a way to escape their underworld prison. They flitted in and out of hell. Their minions had too, and all had wreaked havoc on humanity. Once the human war ended, supernaturals banished the demons, 
and lock them up tight. This included the worst of their kind, the seven princes of darkness, Lilith, the other royal brides, and the royal heirs. Until they weren't. Dread exploded inside me. Mother had returned, and she wasn't just a royal bride. She was the strongest among them, her power equaling the princes. But Lilith always swore that she worked alone. Still, had other demons escaped too? Wouldn't supernaturals have noticed? You're finally using your brain, Nicoletta sneered. Mother isn't the only royal to have created an escape hatch. My lord, Orion, did too. And he's putting things in place for when his brothers arrive. For when we blow the eyes of darkness open wide. She threw her arms out to the side, reveling in the horrible idea. You can't, I ground out. If you do, I know what will happen, Nicoletta shrieked. When my lord rules, all those who doubted him will bow before him. The Darkborn will stand at his glorious side while we purge the earth. At that ominous proclamation, Gunnar lunged, teeth bared, claws ready to dig into my sister's skin. But Nicoletta retaliated just as fast, her tendrils snapping out. They seized the wolf, lifting him forty feet in the air. Let him go, I ordered. If you insist. Nicoletta dropped Gunnar, and as he fell, his silver eyes flashed with fear. Bestu! I hurled the protection spell at the Alphaba to slow his fall before facing my sister. Her eyes narrowed on me, the irises burning crimson. Off to the side, a crash, and a whimper announced Gunnar had hit the ground. But I couldn't turn away from Nicoletta to check on him. It was far too dangerous to turn my back on her. Hide them though you might, brother. You have wings too. Buried in all the weakness. You could have flown to get him. Or use these. Her tendrils surged my way once again. Bestu! The dark wisps slowed, but kept coming, so I flung another spell, another protection. Sweat dripped down my face as I tried to stop my sister. Her sinister laughter split the night. Can't you see? The dark side is where the real power is. Nicoletta paused, as if realizing something for the first time. You failed, but you do have the same potential as me. So, I'll make one more request of you, brother. I drew in a breath, not liking where this was going. Join me, Hans. We'll have to stop in the village before we meet my lord, but he'll welcome another warrior, another of our bloodline. Why the village? I asked. You can't take father. The prince will kill him. I'd never endanger father, Nicoletta shot back. And don't you worry about him. Orion will appease Lucifer. But we must stop in Minim, for you need to feed before you meet my prince. My stomach dropped to my knees. Feed? How else do you think I gain so much strength? Mother's blood could only do so much. I feed on the life forces of those who mocked us and called us monsters. You will too, and then my lord will be less likely to discard you as one of the weaklings he so despises. She called off her tendrils with a wave. You might have failed me in returning mother to my side. But as I said, I love my family. So I give you this chance, brother. One more chance to pair with our kind, to serve my lord. Will you join me? Ice crawled through my veins. My sister fed off the life forces of those we'd grown up with? Mihai had mentioned that the wolves kept their distance from her. Did they know this? Did she do it to them? It doesn't hurt the villagers, Nicoletta added, as if reading my mind was part of her arsenal too. Could she? If one thing was clear to me, it was that her powers had grown. I didn't know my sister as well as I once had. Not well at all. And I make sure they are happy afterward. Her black wings lowered her from where she'd hovered to land on the snow, a hand still extended for me. I couldn't bear to watch my sister spiraling into darkness. She sounded like a lunatic, and though even our mother had a dark side, she never spoke like this, never acted this way. No, 
I'd be damned if Nicoletta went full dark. Striking like a viper, magic sprayed from my hands, meant to stun, to disarm, but my sister anticipated my move. Twirling out of the way, she retaliated by sending a blaze of black power my way. I braced myself half a second before it hit, and I soared backward ten feet. I slammed into a tree, groaning when I slumped onto the ground. Get away from me, you filthy witch! Nicoletta shouted. Meredith? I shot up to find the witch stumbling away from my sister, a dagger in her hand. Hans! Her shirt! Meredith screamed. I squinted to find the witch had torn a part of Nicoletta's shirt. And through the tear, a necklace from my paternal grandmother gleamed, the moonlight reflecting off the central black-blue stone. The symbol! Meredith roared. The what? I squinted, and this time I saw it. A breath of frigid air filled my lungs, freezing my body as it plunged. The sigil of Lucifer was branded on the right side of my sister's chest. Meredith slashed her again, and determined to help, Gunner rose from where he'd hit the earth. The wolf lunged. Nicoletta moved as fast as a serpent, wings unfurling again. Tendrils swam through the air, but she thought twice about taking on the three of us alone, instead throwing me a glare. Tell father I'll keep him safe. The Darkborn will stay away from him, from Minim. But I make no such promise to you, brother. Beating her wings, she lifted from the earth and soared into the sky. Chapter 12 Meredith I'll drop you here. Hans pulled over, as close to the entrance of the s, &S tomb as he could get, given all the cars parked on the street side. You good? Yeah, I'll be fine. I mumbled, bones and muscles aching as I looped the duffel containing my clothes, a sleeping Benedict, and the loose amnesia herb around my body. Only Gunner, who we'd already dropped off at home because it was on the way, was physically fine after hiking so far through the Romanian woods and practically running a marathon in hell. I was envious of his shifter abilities, but I'd heal in a day or two. Or at least, that's what I kept telling myself as I slid out of the car, stifling a groan. I'll bring in the other bags. See you there. Driving off, Hans went to find a place to park. Mentally, I wished him luck. The blocks surrounding campus were more packed than usual. There must be a concert going on or something tonight. Hobbling down the sidewalk, my ankle twisted, making me wince. Okay, maybe I need more than a day to feel normal again. A week of sleep should do it. Had I pulled my Achilles tendon? As if to really stick it to me, my lower back spasmed. Groaning, I pressed my palms into the muscles around my spine. This must be what getting old is like. Finally, reaching the alley that hid the entrance to headquarters, I turned, and a wash of cold air rushed over me. A shiver gripped my spine, but the cold disappeared before I even got to the door. Though the students passing by on their way to their evening courses couldn't see me, I still shot a wary glance to the road before extending my hand and whispering the password. The single word, in combination with my unique magical fingerprint, opened the door to SNS's tomb. Slipping inside, I exhaled and made my way to the healing wing as fast as my body would permit. Thankfully, it was late, so the hallway was empty, as was the atrium. In all, I only passed one person while I climbed the stairs to the infirmary wing. When I reached the healer's wing, Shay was there, and at the sound of someone entering, her head swiveled toward the door. Her blue eyes lit up. Rooms! You're back! She shrieked and leapt off the empty bed next to Lucas. As she ran my way, Shay typed on her phone. Shay, remember where you are! A voice I recognized as Daphne's yelled from the back. Oh my god, Meredith! I'm so happy to see you. Where are the others? She threw herself at me, arms wrapping around my aching body, phone still in hand as she squished me in my bag. Inside the duffel, Benedict squirmed and hissed. Hey! The girl didn't seem to know her own strength, so I pulled away softly. Hans is coming. Benedict is in here. I unzipped the bag, and the cat poked his head out, his light amber eyes narrowed. Oops! Sorry, Benny. She reached out to pet the cat, who batted her hand away. He hated being treated like a normal cat. 
I was wondering where you were. Thought maybe you went mousing. That earned her a hiss. The little shit snuck into my bag and came to hell with us. My gaze traveled over my roommate's shoulder, landing on Luca. How is he? Shay swallowed thickly. Not any better. You got the leucemesia, though? Tons. Good. And well within the week time frame. Daphne appeared from the back room. Sarah, the necromancer, trailed behind the lead healer, her strawberry blonde hair a mess. I squinted. Was that a twig sticking out of it? Once in front of me, Daphne extended her hand. This close up, I could see the dark circles beneath her eyes. Had she been here all day? Since Luca was admitted? I have the potion half prepared and will give it to him as soon as it's ready. This gives him the best chance to wake up. I pulled out a bunch of the herb and passed it to her. As I did, Benedict hopped out of the bag. He stretched and loped toward the line of beds, where he hopped onto one and curled into a ball. I snorted. The lazy-ass cat was going to snooze again. He hadn't even run to the portal or trudged through the snow back to the Novak's home. I'd carried him. I was the one who needed sleep. Days of it. Is there more? The healer asked, pulling me from my ire with my familiar. Oh, yeah. Two bags full, I assured her. Hans had to illusion them to get them past security at the airport. He'll bring the rest in. Did you harvest them as I specified? Pulled them out by the roots. Your supplier will hopefully be able to replant his field, and no one will have to journey to the underworld again for leucemia. Thank the goddess. Relief washed over Daphne's face. You did a splendid job. I'll have the elixir out as soon as possible, and we'll want to get the roots in water quickly. Bring the rest back when Hans arrives. I nodded, and she disappeared, leaving me with Shay, Sarah, and Benedict. Sarah smiled at me. The beams of sun coming in from the skylight above really made her freckles pop. So glad you guys made it back safe. Me too. I agreed. You okay? She'd come from the back of the infirmary, but to my knowledge, she wasn't a healer. Okay? You're in an infirmary. Oh, yeah, right. Sarah gave me a soft grin. I'm applying to medical school, so I sometimes hang out with the healers. Since she was a necromancer, the idea of her being a doctor surprised me. That conflict must have shown on my face, because Sarah grinned good-naturedly. I get that a lot, but healing has always been a passion. Suddenly, a timer on her watch went off. Oh no, I'm late to meet Josiah for dinner. I have to go. With an apologetic look, she turned. I'm glad you're back. Joe will be too. See you two later. When the door shut behind Sarah, I faced my roommate. How'd your mission go? Shay's eyes widened, but she quickly masked the expression and replied, so I didn't question it. It was pretty good. A few hiccups, but Tobias and I work well as a team. He worries about you, you know. My heart spasmed, and oddly, my blood warmed at the thought of the vampire. Weird. That's who I texted. Tobias wanted to know when you guys returned. Her eyes studied me intently. Yet, even though my heart had done an odd sort of stutter when she said the vampire's name, I refused to acknowledge or dwell on it. Tobias had been so rude, so unsupportive before my mission, and that still stung. Actually, Shay's admission only confused me, and I didn't need that. Right now, the best thing for me was to move on to something else, rather than ask why Tobias would care so much. The vampire, though frustrating most of the time, affected me in ways no one else ever had. So did you get inside the vault? I asked, trying to change the subject. We did. The Sigil of Lucifer was there. Same group that took the Pearl of Hell took the Opal, too. No way. The memory of the symbol on Nicoletta returned, but I pushed it to the side for later. It felt wrong talking about Hans's family without him present. What about the identity of the vault owner? Shay's mouth opened, but she closed it quickly, shaking her head. I got the sense she might be holding something back, and for a moment, annoyance flared. Yet, as quickly as it burned, the heat dimmed. Even if they did learn who the owner was, she probably wanted to tell Luca first. As the coven master, he deserved that much. Have there been any episodes of madness? I moved on so I wouldn't dwell on the vault. Besides, seeking the pearl and I suppose the Opal of Heaven now too, 
affected me. I needed to be prepared to move when the first bouts of mass madness started cropping up in the world. That was a sign that the pearl was in play, and my cue to go find the stone. Hopefully, the opal would be with it, and the coven could retrieve two at once. That's what I was researching when you showed up. She gestured to the bed where she'd been sitting. Newspapers spread across the blanket. Crossing toward the bed, I scanned the papers, my eyebrows knitting together. Publications in Italian, Spanish, German, Arabic, and what looked like Japanese stared back at me. You can read all these? I'm fluent in German and Arabic. The rest I know enough to get by. Shay shrugged. Remember, I'm not as young as I look. Angels, even half-angels, age really slowly. Strange that you're so immature, then. That earned me a slug to the arm, and a groan parted my lips. I rubbed my upper arm. Damn, Shay, why you gotta do me like that? I don't act immature. Truth hurts, girl. I shrugged, which also made me wince. Concern wrinkled Shay's features when she noticed the gesture. Seriously, though, how are you? Super sore, I admitted. We walked and ran a long way. But don't brush off my questions. The cases of madness? So far, nothing has cropped up. Be sure that when anyone finds something suspicious, you'll be the first to know. I hope Luca is awake by then. I turned to the coven master. He'd become almost a father figure to me in the short time I'd known him, and I felt a crapload of guilt over his illness. That shade had been sent for me. By who? We didn't know. And Luca had taken the brunt of its attack to save my butt. For a few seconds, only the sounds of Daphne bustling in the next room filled the vast space. Then the door opened again. Expecting to find Hans walking in with the other bags of herbs, I faced the entrance. Instead, green eyes met mine. You're back, Harper breathed. If I'd known, I would have picked you up something for dinner. She held up a greasy bag as the scent of burgers filled the air. Shay, why didn't you text me? She just got here. You can share mine, Rooms. I got two burgers anyway. Shay offered, leaving me to wonder where the heck she put it all. The wolf joined our group, and we worked around Benedict's sleeping form to clear the papers off the bed. Once there was enough space, we sat side by side and dug into the greasy fast food. With the first bite, I let out a moan. I hadn't realized how hungry I was. By the time Han stomped in, carrying the bags filled with loose amnesia, and muttering about the parking being ridiculous, my burger and allotment of fries were gone. Is Daphne already making the potion? Hans asked, eyeing the food with unmasked hunger. Yeah, Shay replied, her tone higher than normal. I stared at her, amused. Before I'd left, I'd gotten the sense that she had a thing for the wizard. Oh, no. My eyes widened. Hans wasn't just a wizard, though. He was part demon, and Shay was part angel, and I was pretty certain she liked him. I swallowed the lump rising in my throat. That couldn't work, right? Or could it? Did magical beings not distinguish in the way someone like me, a person new to this world, might assume? I'll get these to her. Hans held up the two bags. You got any more of that? Harper frowned. I was learning that her love language was related to food. In our home, she was the cook, the maker of tea, the one who decided what was for dinner. She'd probably hated it when people went hungry. No, I answered not wanting her to feel bad or blame Shay. But we can order some. That's okay. I won't stay too long and can grab something on the way home. With that, he went to the back where Daphne worked. Once Hans was out of sight, Shay's shoulders loosened. Yeah, she totally liked him. How had I not seen it before we left for hell? Had I been too focused on my own stuff and issues? Of which there'd been plenty. Or was I more in tune to the Nephilim now because I cared about her more? Considered her a friend, even. My throat tightened at the realization. That had happened so fast. And that it had happened at all for someone like me was sort of... magic. So? Harper broke the silence that had come over us. How was it? Hell? Yeah. Pretty much as expected. Hot. It reeked of sulfur. And was filled with monsters. An image of the field of punishment filled my mind. Absolutely horrible. But you got in and out with no issue? She scanned me. You look all right. 
She was limping when she came in, the Nephilim announced. We ran into a few snags. I was of the mind that what happened was Hans's story to tell. Still, Shay and Harper were staring at me hardcore, so I had to say something. We were almost caught. No! Harper breathed, her fry stopping an inch in front of her lips. Yeah, we... Han slipped back into the room with Daphne on his heels. She held a glass like it was pure gold, her eyes trained on Luca. Is it ready? Extra strong, right? I asked, heart pounding as I leapt from the bed. My ankle rolled for a second time in an hour, the pain making me wince. The strongest I can make it, she affirmed, her gaze darting down to my feet, though she said nothing about it. If this doesn't work, then all I can do is keep making the same thing and hope it will take before... Before he died. I shook myself. That wouldn't happen. I refused to believe it. We were here way before the week was up. And we'd brought enough of the herb for the healers to make tons of doses. I'll prop him up. Hans eased his arm around the coven master and lifted him. Though he wasn't conscious, Daphne still got Luca to swallow. Hoping he would wake instantly, I stared at him, as if my attention would somehow help the matter. It will take some time, Daphne said, her attention locked on her patient. I'll check on him in the morning. Then she turned to me. You need a checkup too. I caught that ankle roll, and Hans told me that you got hurt on the way back from hell. I glared at Hans, ungrateful. Sure, I ached, but I wanted to sleep in my own bed. Sorry, Meredith. Hans shrugged. I'm going to be examined too, but that's a pretty obvious injury. How bad does it hurt? Daphne prompted. My Achilles tendon is pretty sore, I admitted. After hearing part of your team's story, I'm not surprised. You put in a lot of mileage and might have pulled it. Normally that can take months to heal, but, lucky for you, I have a remedy that is much faster. Though if you take it, you must stay here. It knocks people out for days at a time, and I'll need to give you the potion again in the morning. Plus, check your gate before you leave. I sighed. Before I signed on with the coven, I never went to the doctor, and definitely not the hospital. I'd rarely relied on others, and all that was changing quickly. While I found it difficult to accept help, I had to get over that quirk, and fast, because the coven had made it clear that they'd never leave me hanging. Fine. I'll go whip up that potion, then. Daphne disappeared into the back once more, leaving the four of us, an unconscious Luca, and a sleeping Benedict, to our own devices. Harper turned back to me. So how were you almost caught? Across the bed from Luca, Hans stiffened. Jeez, Harper, way not to miss a beat. We, uh... I looked at Hans. In two seconds, his face had grown red. It just happened. Harper's eyebrows pinched together. Like you were careless? Or was it worse than you thought? I guess it was. It was my fault. Hans blurted. The girls turned their attention to him, and I exhaled. Though I'd been pissed about his detour in the underworld, I didn't want to push him into anything because I also hadn't wanted to lie to my roommates. You're so practiced, though. Shay seemed shocked that our team's issues could come from the wizard. None of that matters when you run into your mother in the pits of hell, Hans muttered. Unable to look Shay in the eyes, his face tilted to the floor. I sucked in a breath. He'd gone there right away, despite how much it tore at him. My heart broke for Hans. Your mother died, and you found her soul there? A pained expression crossed Shay's features. I'm so sorry, Hans. Oh, God. She didn't get it. Of course she didn't. Who would assume that Hans's mother helped rule the underworld? Hans? I whispered, wanting to save him from the humiliation he experienced when he told us the truth. No one should be backed into a corner like this. You don't have to. I do. His pained blue eyes lifted to catch mine. You saw my sister, Meredith. You understand what's happening, what group she's part of. And everyone is going to learn eventually. I'd rather it come from me. He turned his attention to the other two, and he rolled his shoulders back, perhaps trying to release the tension obviously building there. 
My mother hasn't died. My mother is Lilith, Queen of Hell, and I'm half demon. Chapter 13 Hans The expression on the girl's face is cut deep into my soul, especially Shay's. Her angelic visage, so concerned for my plight seconds before, crumpled. Now the Nephilim's lips pinched painfully, her pert nose wrinkled and disgusted by my bloodline, like I was a fart in the room that she couldn't avoid. My stomach rolled. Of course someone with angel blood, archangel blood no less, would act like that. Most people considered those with demonic lineages untrustworthy, and as much as I hated to think it, most of the time they were right to do so. Are you sure? Shay's voice ground against me like brake pads pushed to the edge of viability. Positive. At my word, her irises brightened, became bluer than normal. Was she tearing up? I've known my whole life who my mother was. That's how I knew where an entrance to hell was located. Who else knew? Shay's chin tilted upward. Tobias, that's it. It had always been a source of annoyance to me, something the vampire held over my head, even if he never spoke of it, even if I knew his secret too, even if he never hinted at using the leverage the knowledge of my bloodline could give him. I didn't enjoy that someone else was aware of what I was, what I could become. Well, if he'd ever wanted to, now his chance was wasted. He no longer would be the only one in on the secret. Shay cleared her throat. The sound pained. I have to go. Without another word to her friends, she strode to the door, slamming it closed behind her so loudly that Daphne called out for quiet from the back room. Seeing Shay so upset unleashed something unexpected in me. I wanted to chase her, to assure her I wasn't bad, just as much as I wanted to stay away from the half-angel. Not because of what she was. I simply didn't want to make her uncomfortable to see my own discomfort with my lineage reflected in those azure eyes. That's how you got in, Harper mused, ripping me back to the wolf and the witch. I wondered how, but figured there must be a spell that you were forbidden from sharing, or maybe one that no one else could handle. So, now we understand how you saw your mother, but what's this about your sister? Hans, Meredith said again, her tone gentle. We don't have to go into all of it yet. Fuck it, why not? I had already begun unraveling my lies, my omissions. This would never get easier. I'm fine. I lied, focusing on the wolf listening intently. My sister wanted me to bring our mother back. Lilith is Lucifer's wife, and through all our lives she's had to return to him, leaving my sister and I behind. It was for our safety more than anything. If she stayed in the village... She was sure Lucifer would turn hell upside down to hunt her, and one day he'd discover us too, probably murder everyone in my family out of spite. My lips tightened. I'd had that nightmare often as a kid. The one of a faceless, evil man breaking into our home, wiping us all out with a snap of his fingers. Why would your sister want Lilith to come to this realm if that happened? Harper asked. Nicoletta didn't want our mother to be separated from us anymore, so she made me promise to bring our mother back if I found her. She also thought that she'd be able to seal the portal to our village permanently once Mom was earthside. Harper let out a low whistle. Yeah, I said. More than that, I screwed up the mission by approaching my mother in the middle of a field with hundreds of working demons. The invisibility potion stopped working. Mother saved our asses, but clearly I didn't bring her back. I took a stealing breath hating that I had to say the next part. When I told her what happened, my sister attacked us, and revealed that she's in league with a demon prince on Earth. The prince leads a group that Nicoletta referred to as the Darkborn. They want to take control. And get this, my own flesh and blood had the sigil of Lucifer branded on her chest, which makes me believe the Darkborn are the ones who got the pearl. What? It's true, Meredith confirmed. And get this, Hans, Shay said she found the sigil in the vault at Le Bastion, too. I blinked. So it was likely that the Darkborn took the Pearl of Hell 
and the opal of heaven. That was unwelcome news. What I don't understand is why she'd have that symbol if she's working for Prince... Brian? Meredith asked, her eyebrows pinched. Or Orion? What the heck was the name? Orion. Harper breathed. Isn't that it, Hans? Yeah, that's it. I didn't know all the prince's names by heart. Why would I when they were locked in the underworld? But I sure as hell knew that one. I don't understand it either. For a moment, silence fell. Then Harper shook her head. I'm sorry that happened to you. I want you to know that I don't look at you differently. Her eyes darted to the door. Really, I don't think Shay does either. She was just shocked. After all, she's on the other side of the heavenly divide. I finished for her, my tone strained. How often had I wished I stood on the opposite side to the one I'd been born, to exude light and not darkness, death, and despair. I get it. But we work with necromancers and vampires, and some might say they're creatures of darkness. Harper insisted, clearly not believing me. So I bet she'll get over it, eventually. I nodded, as if I believed it. I'll have to tell others. Wait until Luca wakes up, Harper suggested. He has a way with words and can help. Good point. My attention shifted to the mage. When I dropped Meredith on the street, all I'd wanted to do was go home and drink myself into oblivion yet again. But not anymore. Now I wanted more information on the symbol branded into my sister's chest and the group it represented. I'll go back to the Beinecke for a while, I announced. Harper's eyebrows pulled together. Why? To see if there's anything on that symbol? Because Meredith's right. It makes little sense that Orion would brand Nicoletta with the symbol of his brother. Unless she worked for both princes, but Nicoletta hadn't mentioned that, and she'd sounded devoted to Orion alone. Plus, we'd both always despised Lucifer because he kept our mother from us. There has to be more to the sigil of Lucifer than we know. How will you get inside? Harper asked. The Beinecke is closed. Some of us have special privileges, I confessed. Namely, it was just me, Luca, and Tobias. The wolf gaped. You have access at all time? I do. I want those too, and a chance to get into the supernatural section, on my own. The wolf clarified. I'll see what I can do. Luca had extended the privileges to me and Tobias because we were his right and left hands, but Harper was wicked smart. She'd have to pass the test the hedge witches who acted as librarians to the elite section gave to those who wanted access, but I was sure Harper would succeed on that front. Plus, with all the trouble looming on the horizon, it would be good for more people in the coven to have access to the texts on supernaturals. Feeling as though I had nothing else to say, I took a step away from Luca's bed. I'll check with you ladies tomorrow. Heal up, Meredith. She frowned. Thanks. The witch sounded a touch annoyed to have to stay in the infirmary, but it really was for the best. She had classes to get back to, and a mission that might start at any given moment. We needed her to be ready when signs of madness, of the Pearl of Hell's influence, began cropping up. Demons and those who followed them possessed it, so there was no longer a question of if insanity would strike, but when. Leaving the infirmary, I walked through the halls of the empty coven headquarters, Shay was nowhere in sight, both a relief and, oddly, a disappointment. Where had she gone? Home? Was she crying? Something about the thought tore me up inside. I hated when women cried, and though I couldn't explain it, the idea of disappointing Shay hurt me more than I expected. Slipping onto the streets of New Haven, I breathed in the chilled autumn air. The stench of sulfur still filled my nostrils, though that had to be all in my head. I'd showered and changed at my father's, desperate to get every speck of hell off me before we drove to the airport. But some things proved more difficult to shake than one would imagine. Though miles from the portal, the presence of the underworld, how it smelled of sulfur and rot and death, how the heat of the place seemed to caress my skin, struck me at random times. 
I might never be able to deny the darkness inside of me. But I hope to learn how to win the fight of good versus evil that was sure to come and get my sister back on my side. I swallowed. Nicoletta's face when she'd flown away was burned into my mind, crushing and devastating. I had to win her back, for her sake, and for our father's. The kind baker of Menim had shattered when we told him his daughter had gone dark, that I failed to save her. She surely wasn't going to waltz back into Menim and rejoin society. The village girl was gone, and in her place was a half-demon who'd embraced the darkness and teamed up with a prince of hell. Now, I needed to learn about the devil who'd stolen my sister from my family. Then I could take down the bastard. My feet guided me through campus, on autopilot. When I reached the door to the library, I scanned the area. Just because I could get in, and wouldn't be detected on camera, didn't mean random students needed to see me slip inside late at night. Thankfully, the coast was clear. With my hands on the door, and a whispered password leaving my lips, the door opened. Once inside, light appeared in my hand with a snap of my fingers. Quickly, I descended the stairs to the bottom level and kept going all the way to the very back, an area where few students ventured because a persistent draft plagued the space. When I reached the charmed entrance, I turned to it and pressed my hand into the wall. A jolt of magic rushed through me as the library made sure I was, in fact, Hans Novak. Here, passwords were not used. Every person with access to the supernatural section had to be vetted and approved by Wisteria and Bellamy, the elderly hedge witch and wizard who ran the place. They were husband and wife, and lifelong librarians. Both were committed to excellent curation and academics. Though, during the time that I'd waited for my acceptance to access the library, I'd found their pickiness annoying, it was actually a good thing. The supernatural librarians let no one pass who didn't deserve it, and those who gained access could only bring one guest, ever. That person did not have to go through such a rigorous search as those with memberships, but if they acted out, the person who'd invited them would have their own privileges revoked. With an exclusive entry on the line, few extended invitations. I never had. Maybe, if Luca doesn't think Harper is ready, I can use my invitation on her. Harper deserved it, and if it meant Shay, her roommate and friend, wouldn't hate me, I was tempted. Suddenly, the magic that had been checking my identity ceased flowing. The wall opened. It had taken longer than normal. Was it because the trip to my village brought out my demon side more? Was I confusing the identification process? I frowned, but dismissed the idea, entering the exclusive library. Currently... I was hyper-focused and sensitive, but really not everything was about my lineage. I was the same as before, a wizard, a Romanian immigrant turned American, a mechanic, and a jeeper. Those aspects would always be the same. Just as my heart would be, I had to work on my own how I perceived my demon blood. Starting with figuring out what the sigil of Lucifer actually means, I muttered, heading to the demonology section. Since magical beings could enter and leave at all hours of the day and night, enchanted candles came to life when they sensed motion in this part of the Beinecke. Enchanted, protective lanterns kept the sacrilegious flames in check. Letting the conjured light in my palm die, I exhaled, allowing the candlelight to soothe me as much as the scent of old tomes. Books dating back all the way to the period writing developed lined the shelves. In all... That comprised a few millennia's worth of knowledge. It was no library of Alexandria, but this hidden portion of the Beinecke was the closest thing magical beings possessed. Only two or three other libraries in the world rivaled it. Passing a slew of desks, I turned down an aisle of shelves. One of these marked for demons and creatures of the underworld. Since I'd gained access to this library, I mostly avoided this area. It brought up feelings I didn't want to acknowledge— but now I have to. My keen eyes scanned the shelves. There might not be a book on demon symbology, but something on the royals would be a good choice. It was too much to wish that we'd have a book labeled Darkborn, but soon enough, I did come across a tome with promise. The tome was titled 
noble lords of the underworld. I plucked it and backtracked to one of the desks I'd passed earlier. Carefully, I opened it to the beginning. There was not a table of contents, nor an author name. Yet seeing as the book was very old, I deduced that a monk had probably written this, a supernatural task with creating extra-special tomes that most believers would never see. I flipped the page, the paper dusty beneath my fingertips. The first portion of the tome documented the geography of hell. If I'd had more time, I would have compared it to the map my mother had implanted in my mind, but I didn't. And not seeing the sigil, I continued. It wasn't until I hit about a quarter of the way through the book that I got my first sighting of the sigil. I paused, reading as fast as the old-fashioned script would allow. Though many villagers call it a sign of Lucifer, the most feared of all lords of the underworld, the king of the princes, the darkest fallen star, the sigil does not belong to Prince Lucifer alone. In actuality, it is a symbol of the prince's brotherhood, their bond and family, their crest. It's a sign of devil worship on a greater scale than humankind has ever seen, one that believers pray will not come to light, for if the sigil arises, it is a portent that the end is nigh. So that symbol was actually something signifying the prince's brotherhood. Was it still? If so, did Nicoletta know that? Or did she believe it was the symbol of Orion, the prince she served, and that he used it for the Darkborn? And did Orion recognize her as Lilith's child? If he did, would he hold that over my sister? My jaw clenched. I had to learn more about Prince Orion. After skimming a few more pages, I began flipping them faster. When I struck individual entries of the princes, I exhaled. The author listed Orion right after Lucifer. According to this text, Prince Orion ruled the second largest swath of the underworld. Actually, in many things he was second. Only Lucifer could seem to best him. His one claim to the top was that Orion controlled those underlings who patrolled the river Leith. Hence, Prince Orion controlled the newest sinners entering hell and got his pick over those he wished to subjugate. His sin, because each prince claimed a sin as his own and the sinners as their people, was wrath. At that, my mouth went dry. The prince of wrath walked the surface of the earth, most likely stealing sacred stones and amassing followers like my sister. Strong supernaturals. I shudder to think what that meant. Chapter 14 Tobias Midday was threatening to crest into evening as I rushed into Shadows and Secrets Hall. The moment I read Shay's text that Meredith, Hans, and Gunnar had returned with Elusimesia, I'd left Castel Romano. I hadn't even gotten to say goodbye to Raphael, likely a slight he wouldn't forget. And yet I found it difficult to care, for forces pressed me to leave, to return home. I had to be here, to lay eyes on Luca, hopefully alive and well. And then, once I was sure of that, I'd request a bag of blood from Daphne and go see her. My eyes closed, confusion flooding me. Though I did have a reason to see the witch, the ring from Le Bastion sat heavy in my pocket, waiting to be given to her. That wasn't truly why I wished to lay eyes on her. Meredith had been on my mind for the duration of my flights. Why? I wasn't sure, but I did know that once I checked in on Luca, I had to see her. This odd twisting of bloodlust how it presently resembled infatuation and caring for the well-being of the witch rather than the burning thirst of days before, was almost enough for me to believe Giselle's theory, that we were blood-bound, fated, soulmates. Had Meredith been a vampire, it would have made sense. Alas, she was no vampire, so it made no sense at all. Fated mates never occurred outside one's own magical order, this was nothing more than a different kind of bloodlust for the witch. It had to be. Tobias! Hey, how was... Not now, Silas. I barked, interrupting the silver-haired fae trying to flag me down to talk. Silas stared, and as I passed, I felt his unwavering gaze on my back. 
since many eyes on me, in fact. No doubt they wanted to know of Le Bastion, a place shrouded in mystery, and they would, in time. Only when I reached the infirmary's floor did I slow. I was still a fair distance away, but Josiah was outside the healing area, pacing and muttering to himself. I was halfway to the necromancer before he noticed me, stopping in his tracks. His dark brown eyes widened. Oh, hey, Tobias. Is something wrong? I gestured to the door. What? You were pacing. Trying to be kind, I omitted mentioning the muttering as I took in his face. Only then did I notice the bags beneath his eyes. I'd never seen the necromancer so exhausted. Oh, right. Just worried. About? Is Luca okay? The skin on the back of my neck tightened. Had the other team been too late? What? Oh, he's in there, resting, I think. They gave him a potion, and he should be fine. Josiah shook his head, and the words relieved me greatly. It also gave me a moment to be more compassionate, a quality Giselle had told me many times that I tended to lack. Then what's wrong? I asked. The necromancer was normally so steady. This was odd behavior. It's Igbo, one of my ravens. She ate something bad. She's always sneaking into places she shouldn't be and helping herself to whatever is there. Anyway, she got sick last night and I know the healers aren't vets, but you try taking a raven like that to a normal vet. So many damned questions. His eyes darted to the door, then back to me. I dropped her off and was thinking about going back in, but the healers have their hands full. With a resigned breath, he shrugged. I guess I'm an overprotective raven, Dad. At that, he managed a weak smile. Sounds lame when I say it like that, but I do think of them that way. I suspect they'll be fine, I assured him, regretting that I'd stopped, over bloody birds of all things, and desperate to go inside. Ravens are resilient, and the healers have many remedies to ensure the expulsion of poison. That's what they said, too. He swung his arm so that his hands clapped in front of him. You're right. I shouldn't take up more of their time. Igbo will be fine under their care. I'll go. Thanks for the words of wisdom. With that, Josiah turned and walked down the hall, out of sight. Now, back to business. I went to the infirmary door, only to pause. Something beyond it warmed me and made me feel good, comforted, which an infirmary certainly shouldn't do. Strange that, I thought, opening the door. As I expected, Luca reclined in a bed, his eyes closed, his chest rising and falling. My steps halted when I saw that she, Meredith, was in the bed next to him. My usually still heart gave a single hard thump, and concern tightened my gut. Why was she here? Was she hurt? Shay had mentioned nothing of the sort, only that the witch had returned to New Haven. Still on the edge of the room, I remained frozen. Bloody hell, I shouldn't be here. I had not prepared myself for seeing Meredith. Usually I needed at least a bag of blood to curb my bloodlust. But then, I didn't feel it now. Did I? A quick scan assured me that no, I didn't. Odd, that. I hadn't eaten properly in days. But there was no urge to go to Meredith and drink from her. And now that I'd laid eyes on her, I couldn't turn back. Proceed with care. Muscles tensing, I approached the beds, unable to take my eyes off the witch. Judging by her breathing, the witch was sleeping heavily. My eyes feasted upon her face, enchanted by how angelic she looked, nothing at all like the sassy witch who loved to get a rise out of me, nor did she have the pallor of the ill. Stopping by Meredith's bedside, I waited once again for bloodlust to strike. When it did not, I took a seat on the stool, telling myself that at the first urge to drink from her vein, I'd run out of the infirmary. A bottle of potion was on the nightstand, so I read the label. 
It was an elixir to help regrow and strengthen tendons. At that moment, the witch murmured something in her sleep and rolled to face me, her lips parting softly. Skylights allowed the sunlight to filter in from above, and yellow beams dappled her cheeks, dancing on her smooth skin. Meredith's hair flowed behind her, so long and silky. I yearned to touch it. In the back, noises arose. A clanging of metal, a bubbling of liquid, someone asking a question. The healers were hard at work, but instead of going to inquire about Luca, as I should have done, I merely sat there, transfixed by the witch. Annoying though the witch could be, she radiated beauty. In truth, she was one of the loveliest women I'd ever set eyes upon. As if she could hear my thoughts, her lips curved into a smile. In response, my jaw tightened. What was I doing sitting here and watching her like some besotted fool? The last time I'd been so taken with a woman, she'd perished horribly. I'd sworn to myself that would never happen again. But presently, I walked a thin line. I needed to ask about Luca and leave. Determined to do just that, I stood, the stool I'd taken pushing back and scraping the floor. With the sound, Meredith's eyes, one blue, one green, flew open and landed on me. Tobias? I swallowed, aware of how close I stood to her bed, how this looked. How I couldn't leave now, or even look away. Bloody hell, what was wrong with me? Yes. Where have you been? Her hand lifted to wipe the crust of sleep from her lashes. Meredith's voice sounded smaller than usual, tired, of course, but also sweet. Though I remained standing, I could no longer find it in myself to leave. Italy. My sire requested I visit my brother. Oh. Meredith sat up, and her hand fluttered to her heart. Only days ago she'd had my blood, needed it to live, which would affect how she felt in my presence. Was that why she hadn't hurled her normal allotment of sass my way? Was it also why I did not feel compelled to drink from her, though I hadn't had blood in days? That made a certain amount of sense. Are you well? I asked, my protective instinct surging as it sometimes did with this witch. Yeah, I've been here for... She peered around the room. Hey. She looked about again. Where's Benedict? Why are you here? I asked, my tone a low growl. I didn't care about the cat, but rather why she was in the healing wing. She met my eyes, her eyebrows knitting together. I pulled my Achilles. We had to run to get out of hell and then walk back to the village. She seemed like she wanted to say more, but stopped. I had a sense of what might be on her mind. Did Hans's blood call to him there? I pressed. Her answer had eased my anxiety, but now I wished to know why the running had been necessary. She exhaled, relieved. That's right. You know about him. Thank goodness. I didn't want to spill the beans. The witch ran her hands through her long hair, a careless gesture that intensified her tempting scent. Hans got us there just fine, but in the end his demon side almost cost us our lives, though, and instigated the running. I'd worry that something would snap in Hans if he traveled to the underworld. How spot on had I been? But we're okay, Meredith assured me, her focus darting to my fists, clenched in tight balls. Everyone got out. We harvested enough of the herb that the supplier should be able to regrow in this realm. There's more, but I'm going to let Hans tell it. Nodding, I exhaled. They'd been in danger, but they were fine now. I needed to calm down, but feared I was failing because her gaze continued to study me intensely, almost like she was trying to peer into my very soul. Suddenly, I had the ridiculous notion to cup her face in my hand and kiss her, the warmth inside me heated even more. Was the fact that she had ingested my blood affecting me in this manner too? What was happening between us? Were you really worried that I'd screw everything up? I blinked, 
the spell that had lingered in the air broken by her words. Pardon? Before I left, you told me not to go. You said I'd put everyone in danger, which, for the record, I didn't. And now you look so relieved. Hurt flashed across her face. You thought I'd fail them, that I wasn't good enough. Did I believe that Meredith put them in any more trouble than Gunnar and Hans? No. Though I'd let her think that, hoping it would keep her safe, relatively safe. I underestimated you, I offered, knowing that admitting the truth, that thinking of her in hell physically pained me wouldn't do either of us a bit of good. It won't happen again. Her shoulders lowered. Well, thanks. She reached for her glass of water and took a drink before setting the cup back down. So, how was your mission? At the bank? My entire body froze. Shay has told you nothing? She said you got into the vault and found the sigil of Lucifer, but stopped there. I think she was waiting for Luca to wake up. I swallowed. Perhaps. Or she wasn't sure how to break the news to Meredith that it was she who owned the plundered vault. That somehow this seeker witch who'd found the Pearl of Hell was also tied to the Opal of Heaven. That she owned a bloody Lapis Calesti. Meredith's ring, the one we'd found in Akala's office, burned in my pocket. I'd kept it safe as I travelled Europe. On the flight home, I'd patted the ring in my pocket so many times people likely thought I had a tick. Nonetheless, if Shay had mentioned nothing of the vault, then I didn't feel right about doing so yet. I'd wait until Luca woke up, too. Then I'd share the news with them both. We came across shocking information. I started. But I agree with... Suddenly. Luca coughed and shot straight up in bed. Healers! I called when Luca grabbed his throat and gasped for air. The mage awakens! The thundering of steps met my ears and a duo of healers burst from the back. Daphne was there, a small rubbish bin in her hands. Stay back! He'll vomit the concentrated poison! She warned. Indeed, Luca appeared ready to be ill. Thankfully, the healer was fast and reached the mage in time for him to bury his head in the bin. Sick exploded from him and the stench of rotted meat plumed in the air. I stopped breathing, thankful that I could do so without repercussions. Meredith and the healers, however, had no such skill, and each began to gag. Tobias! Daphne gestured to the can. When Luca's done, take this to the back. There's a cauldron there filled with blue liquid. We brewed it specifically for this purpose. Dump the poison in so it can neutralize. After a full five minutes, the coven master ceased heaving and pulled his head from the bin. Are you quite finished? I asked, approaching quickly for the sake of the others. The stench had started to make their eyes water. Water, Luca rasped. Tobias, be careful with it, Daphne gestured to the bin. That's a lot and very dangerous. Daphne pivoted for a pitcher. I'll get water. With care, I took the bin and strode to the back where healers kept their herbs, potions, and the like. Immediately, I caught sight of something odd. Josiah's raven, Igbo, stood on the counter, uncaged. That didn't seem right. Josiah had mentioned that she got into things. Was she an escape artist, too? As I walked deeper into the room, the raven's dark eyes blinked at me as if asking why I was back there. Got a job to do? I muttered, feeling ridiculous for talking to the bird. Don't muck up anything back here. The cauldron was easy to locate, and in went the poison, immediately turning the blue liquid black. I set the rubbish bin down next to the cauldron, and with my job done, ran back into the front room. Upon my return, Luca was already breathing easier, and Daphne was in the process of taking his vitals. Not wanting to be in the way, I stood back and waited. Finally, an age later, the healers stepped away, relief lining their faces. That extra strong dose of potion finally did the trick. I'll make you another batch— which means you'll need to stay the night again, but your heart and lungs are much stronger than when you arrived. I sure don't feel strong, the coven master admitted, though I had to agree with the head healer. Despite just vomiting, 
The grey tinge that had plagued the Italian's face in the days before he passed out was gone, warmth taking its place. You will soon. Daphne assured him, and gestured to me and Meredith. I assume that you have coven matters to discuss with these two, so I'll begin with that batch of potion. I cleared my throat. Don't know if you realized, but Josiah's raven is loose back there. Daphne rolled her eyes. The necromancer told me his ravens can't be caged. That they'll make a ruckus if they are, and eventually get out anyway. Guess he's right. You'll allow it to be loose? A poor choice in a sick house. It's not protocol in an infirmary. Daphne flung up a hand as if to say, I give up. I didn't even want it here, but what was I going to do? Let the creature die? Josiah was beside himself. I couldn't say no. That he had been. I don't mean to pressure you. It simply shocked me. That makes two of us. Daphne replied. I never thought I'd be taking care of a raven. I'll go check on it and get that potion going. The healers retreated to their workroom as Meredith's cat loped in from the back. Hey! Meredith called. Where were you? Hunting. I heard a mouse in one of the sick rooms. This coven should keep a feline on staff. So you got enough sleep? Meredith snorted. I apologize if I left you in a bind. The journey to hell and back taxed me greatly. My eyes widened. The familiar had gone with them? It wasn't planned. Meredith explained. He snuck in my bag and followed me for protection. I appraised the cat, liking him a bit more. Meredith, though, twisted to face Luca. Anyway, welcome back. How do you feel? Better by the second. Honestly? I glowered at him. The coven master had downplayed the shade poisoning for far too long, and it almost cost him his life. Truly this time, Luca promised. Have there been sightings of madness? He'd always been one to get down to business quickly. It was a characteristic I appreciated about Luca. None that Shay has found, Meredith answered. She was here with you reading a bunch of papers, when I arrived with the herb we needed to revive you. The sheer number of papers she had makes me think that she would know pretty well if madness is spreading. And I presume someone traveled to Le Bastion? Luca turned to me, dark eyes appraising. I did, with Shea, while the others journeyed to hell for the herb. Hell. Luca breathed. You didn't say. I'm so sorry. We couldn't leave you hanging, Meredith replied. It was my fault you got sick to begin with. Hardly, I said. There's a traitor in the coven. There has to be. The witch eyed me. Explain. Someone sent the shade for you, but it injected poison into Luca. And then, days later, the only crop of Lucimesia herb in the world burns... They may not have gotten to their target, but clearly they didn't want Luca healing either. Mages are powerful adversaries. My lips compressed. There has to be foul play at hand. You're right, Meredith mused. Do you suspect someone? Looking overwhelmed, Luca waved a hand. Can we back up? I need time to digest what happened. Regarding the trip to hell while I was gone but I really wish to hear about the vault. Did we get into La Bastion and learn the identity of the owner? Did La Tête, the head of the bank, he added for the witch's benefit, allow you to view his client roster? Meredith studied me with interest. Shay hadn't told her much at all. Maybe she believed we should be together to do it, but Luca was asking, and he was the coven master. I wouldn't say no to him. La Tête, Akala allowed us to enter the vault, I answered, and it's almost a certainty that the same group that took the pearl now has the opal. The sigil of Lucifer was there. And while I won't say why, because Hans should tell you, Meredith interjected, the sigil was spotted during our excursion too. It might mean more, 
or at least something different from what we think. Hans was going to do research. I'll ask him later. Luca nodded, absorbing it all at a speed most in his situation couldn't manage. Rapid assimilation and making quick connections were both characteristics the mage was known for, and I was glad to see that the poison hadn't changed that. The owner of the vault, Tobias. Did you obtain a name? Meredith owns the vault. Meredith? The witch asked, her voice high with disbelief. As in me? Meredith? Precisely. Luca leaned forward. Are you sure? Absolutely. I faced the witch, to find her mouth had dropped open. Your name was on the paperwork along with another, a woman in England. You had no idea? I... what? No! Her head shook adamantly, her attention shifting from Benedict, who also appeared shocked, to Luca. I remember almost nothing about my past, and that definitely does not include a vault. Were my parents' names on it? Gavin and Lynn? You recalled their names? Luca asked. Your memories are returning. That's wonderful. Meredith managed a small smile. It had never been a sure thing that her memories would return after her magic was unbound. I suspected the retrieval of her past was both joyous and confusing for her. It first happened the day you fell ill, she said. Now I've had two distinct memories come back to me, one with my dad, the other with both parents. Her two-toned gaze found me. Was it my mom's name on the paperwork? The woman's name was Miriam Black. Does that name mean anything to you? Meredith shook her head. No. How about you, Benedict? I'm sorry to say I'm of no help in this matter, the cat said. I've never heard of the woman, nor this bank. If you own the vault, your parents must have secured ownership long ago. Perhaps right after your birth? The vault is much older than that, I said. One of Le Bastion's first, which means it's centuries old. It must have been passed down through your family. Another dead end, Meredith huffed. I don't remember anyone named Miriam right now. Maybe that will change in time? She sounded hopeful, and I suspected Luca felt the same way. Whatever Meredith Stone was when we first learned of her existence... She was proving to be much more to the coven, to the world. There's more, I said, easing my hand into my pocket. Perhaps the ring will jog her memory. When we found Miriam's name, we also found a box in the cabinet, one with the same vault number that Latette showed us. Shay and I took it, since it's yours. I pulled the band out and handed it to her. Recognition flashed in her eyes. That was my mother's! Are you sure? I saw it in the memory I had in hell. She wore it. It appears to be a moonstone, Luca said. Pretty, but they generally are not of great monetary value, which means there has to be something else significant about the piece. Why would Akala hold it in his office? That I don't know. Do you, Meredith? She shook her head. No. Benedict? Surely, if I saw this, you did too. To me, it was always a normal ring. Well, I can sense it's not, and you can bet your ass that I'm going to do my best to remember. Meredith slipped the ring on, a look of determination on her face. The band fit perfectly, like the artisan made it for her hand, and the center stone gave off a soft glow that dimmed after a few seconds. She turned her hand examining the ring from different angles. A stone at the base is gone. There are six below the moonstone, but there should be seven. Did you notice that, Tobias? I leaned closer and discovered she was right. In the center, the moonstone glimmered, so large that it attracted the eye the most. But other stones, smaller white opals, it appeared, were embedded in a gold base, barely noticeable. I didn't take notice, I admitted. Shay and I found it not long before we had to run and leave the village, and I have not examined it much since. I didn't notice the base stones in my memory either, 
Meredith breathed softly, examining the ring with wonder. They're very small. Luca watched the seeker with a million questions in his dark eyes. I had many too, and knew only one thing for certain. The ring wasn't normal, just like the witch who owned it. Chapter 15 Meredith I hitched my backpack up higher and rushed down the sidewalk, on my way to my first class of the day. For someone who recently pulled a tendon, you're moving fast. Benedict drawled from somewhere at my side. He decided to tag along to my classes, which meant he was invisible. It also meant I'd stumbled over him twice in as many minutes. Super awesome. As to others, I look like a girl tripping over her own feet. Particularly for how early it is. Benedict yawned loudly. I wish you'd go in for the afternoon courses. My lips curled up slightly. It was after nine in the morning, but if given the chance, Benedict would snooze for half the day. My Achilles is like new. Daphne's potion was pure magic. Is school that interesting, though? Why not relax? Luca only needs you at Yale as a cover, right? I haven't been to some courses, but the classes I attended on the first day were interesting. That's all I have to go on. My heart hammered at the admission. I'd missed almost the whole first week of school, and I was at Yale. Me, a high school dropout, at Yale. Like, how? Would I be able to make up what I missed? Then again, Benedict was right. Would it really matter? Luca had pulled probably a million strings to get me enrolled. Surely he could move mountains to keep me here. As soon as the thought arose, I hated it. If I were going to get a degree from Yale, I wanted to earn it. I wanted that accolade. I wanted to have something I'd worked for that was mine. Even if it took me a decade to do so, I'd graduate. No shame in that. Earning it is earning it. What's on the agenda today? Benedict asked, oblivious to my inner turmoil. I have bio lab and introductory English later, but my women who ruled elective is the one I'm rushing to now. I said, ignoring the weird look I got from a passing student and hoped most others would buy that I had earbuds in because I was on the phone. I'm looking forward to the last one most. Sounds so human. I snorted. Whatever that meant. Is that why you're volunteering to come? Because you're interested in human culture? I'll nap during the lecture. Of course he would. Will your invisibility stay in place while you sleep? It didn't when you were sneaking across the world in my duffel bag. That's because I released it before sleeping. I was under a mountain of clothes. I thought myself safe until we got to our destination. Another person passed by and gave me a strange look, clearly having heard the invisible Benedict. I waved, trying to look friendly and, most of all, distracting. I won't do that today, Benedict added. K. Well, I have a meeting with Luca, Han, Shay, and Tobias later, so if you sleep past the end of my last class, I'll be at the Coven Tomb at three for my meeting. Then, we're having dinner at the house before going to Josiah's place— He's having a birthday party and invited the entire coven. I wasn't the most social person, and it had been ages since someone had invited me to a birthday party, but I had to admit I was excited. After the journey to hell, I was ready to let loose and have some fun. Benedict snorted. How you believe I'll sleep through a herd of humans stampeding from a room is beyond me. Most humans are not light of foot. Once we reached the campus, I checked my phone. This place was still so new, Maze like I think it's that way, I said to Benedict, who didn't reply. Hoping he was still next to me, I followed the map and found the correct building. I filed into class as the professor called her students to order. Softly, I shut the door. If Benedict wasn't with me, he'd have to wait outside. Take a seat. The instructor, Professor Lambeau, my schedule indicated, gestured to the wider room. I ducked my head, embarrassed to be cutting it so close to time, especially when the class was small. Only thirty people, one of whom I recognized. 
Josiah, the necromancer who commanded the ravens that watched over me when I first arrived in New Haven, was there. I hadn't expected that. Sarah, his girlfriend, graduated last year, and I'd assumed they were in the same class. Guess not, I thought as he waved at me. I returned the gesture, and then, trying not to draw any more attention, took one of the two empty seats near the back of the room. As promised, the professor began, today we begin our section on a woman who is arguably one of the best-known leaders of the ancient world, Cleopatra. She was actually the seventh of her name, and more than the vixen modern media likes to depict. Cleopatra. The door flew open, and in walked another latecomer. At the sight of him, my eyes narrowed. No freaking way. Mr. Sloan, so good of you to grace us with your presence. I had to grab a cap. Bentley lifted his coffee and grinned, probably thinking he looked cute and that a charming smile would get him out of trouble. The professor only scowled, which made me like her immensely. Take a seat. The instructor pointed to the empty desk, the one right next to mine. Bentley's eyes narrowed to slits as he climbed the steps. Heart rate spiking. I scanned the room again for a different desk. Nope. These were still the only open ones, a fact that Bentley Sloan III, king of dickwads, a total douche canoe, didn't look too pleased about either. When Bentley reached me, he threw down his bag and slid into the chair. Why are you here? I'm in the class, I growled back. This, out of all the courses I'd chosen, was the one I'd been looking forward to the most. Now I had to put up with Bentley... I must have pissed off a god in a past life. Drop it, he demanded. Oh, he did not say that. Want me to claw him? Benedict whispered, which made Bentley jump, nearly toppling his cappuccino. Swearing, he looked around us. When he found nothing, he glared at me again. What was that? A ghost? Are you using magic? I wouldn't waste it on you. Why are you even here anyway? And don't tell me you're a feminist. He'd followed me to the ladies' room once and tried to force himself on me. Bentley didn't give two flips of a fry basket about women's rights. It will look good when I run for office. So, I need to be here. Why don't you enroll in something more your speed? Underwater basket weaving or whatever? Excuse me! Professor Lambeau clapped her hands to get our attention, so I turned her way, slumping. If you two can't be quiet, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. The professor arched her eyebrows. And you'll want this information for when I discuss your upcoming project. Both partners will be required to contribute and show evidence of their work. A partner project? My stomach dropped. I didn't like the sound of that. Instead of focusing on the fact that I'd have to work with someone I didn't know, I resolutely ignored the mainstream asshole beside me and listened to the professor give a riveting lecture on Cleopatra the Seventh. Halfway through the class, I'd almost forgotten I was in school. Though I'd studied ancient history and culture a lot during my time as a Tomb Raider, I'd never focused on this queen, and I certainly hadn't learned half of what the professor taught. Cleopatra was one badass woman, Someone to look up to, for sure. Modern portrayals and a few snippets I'd read about her had never given me that impression. But they were dead wrong. Sexist and misogynistic. They expected the queen to play by the same rules as men in a world not built for her to rule. But she hadn't done so, and had refused. And I loved that. I enjoyed the lecture so much the class flew by, and I was shocked when at ten till the professor turned to her desk. We'll resume our segment on Cleopatra next time. But for now, I'd like to get you started with your partner project. I've assigned your partners alphabetically. Here they are. My mouth went dry. Oh, no. Not that. Stone was much too close to Sloane. Maybe someone else's name was closer? There might be a Smith, right? There was always a Smith. With each name she read... My breath tightened my chest a little more. There weren't many people in the class, and they were dwindling. But Bentley's name hadn't been called. 
and then there it was, paired with me. We need to work on your karma, Benedict whispered. A groan of agreement escaped me. Once Professor Lambeau finished, she held up a stack of papers. Find your partner and exchange numbers. Then grab one of these on your way out. It's instructions for the project which will need to be completed by midterm. This has got to be a fucking joke, my partner growled, marching out the door. I exhaled. For the first time, perhaps ever, I agreed with Bentley. Hours later, so much glorious knowledge filled my head. I'd almost forgotten about being paired with Bentley on a project. Almost. Benedict had brought up the idea of asking the professor for a new partner, but I didn't want to do that. I was certain the professor knew I'd skipped the first two sessions, so I didn't want to draw more unwanted attention to myself, especially not in my new favorite course. More than that, I didn't want to show weakness to Bentley. He was used to getting his way, and being my partner was sticking it to him as much as it was sticking it to me. However, unlike Bentley, I was used to being put in shitty situations, and could even thrive in them. I doubted he was like that. According to the paperwork the professor had handed out, our project could probably be completed in a couple of weeks. It was a half-hour-long presentation on one lesser-known female leader in history. Determined to get started as soon as possible, after my classes were over, I stopped by a bookshop and picked up a few volumes on female leaders who might be interesting. One on Cleopatra, too, of course. She was officially my new girl crush. Currently, I was moving on to the second part of my day. Already at the Shadows and Secrets headquarters, I climbed the stairs to Luca's office, where our meeting would take place. Along the way, I ran into Josiah. Hey. Josiah smiled a blindingly white smile. I didn't get to ask at class. Had to run to my next course. But are you coming tonight? I asked Shay to tell you. She did, I nodded. I'm coming with her and Harper. Thanks for the invite. You're part of the team now. Wouldn't want you to miss out. His lips stretched into a grin again, so warm and friendly. It was unfortunate that necromancers brought to mind some nasty stuff, cause Josiah hadn't been like that at all. Thanks. Well, I have a meeting with Luca, so I'll see you around. See you, Stone. Turning, I ran up the stairs. When I arrived at the door to Luca's office, it was closed. Voices drifted through the wood, and a memory of me as a young girl listening through the door to my father's den came rushing back. My lips curled up, and I ran my thumb over the large moonstone in the ring Tobias had taken from Labashjan. My mother had been upset that night, but I still cherished the memory. Thankfully, though, I no longer had to listen through doors. I belonged here. Luca invited me, so I knocked. Come in, Luca yelled. As expected, the coven master, Hans, Gunner, and Tobias lounged in leather armchairs when I entered. A wall-to-wall -wall bookshelf stood behind the scene. A coffee table centered between the chairs, littered with glasses filled with various beverages. But Shay wasn't there. Had her class run late? We can start now if you're ready, Stone. Luca offered. He looked a million times better than yesterday, when we'd been released from the infirmary. The color in his face had returned, and his cheeks even seemed fuller. Sure. I set my book bag on the floor by the door. They weren't worried about Shay, so she was probably just running late. Benedict is here, too, somewhere. At that, my familiar appeared by my side, glancing up at me. I don't see the appeal of classes, save for the first. That was intriguing. I suspect that queen you learned about was a cat person. Agreed, I said, and decided against pointing out that Benedict routinely claimed that he wasn't a regular cat. This wasn't the time or place. That one is best, even if Bentley is in it. The Sloan kid? Tobias barked from his chair by the bookshelf, a wine glass filled with red liquid, likely blood, in his hand. He leaned forward, annoyance sharpening the strong lines of his face. The replay of the day he tossed Bentley through the air flashed in my mind. Is he bothering you again? No. Not compared to before, anyway. His mere existence annoyed me. But there was nothing I could do about that. We're in the same class, though. And partnered on a project, Benedict added. What? 
Tobias asked, his tone a low rumble. The prof alphabetically assigned us as partners, I replied, semi-surprised by how much Sloan annoyed him, too. Do you wish it to be unassigned? The vampire offered. I did. I also appreciated Tobias having my back. After his non-vote of confidence before the journey to hell, this felt like him reaching out a hand. However, I also like to handle my own shit, so I shook my head. I could get through this, and in doing so, I'd show Bentley once and for all that I wasn't a woman to mess with. I've got this. Then, let's begin with matters at hand. Luca gestured toward the other chairs. Join us. I sank into the seat next to Hans. The wizard looked like he hadn't slept well. Was it because he was toiling away researching the princes of hell, or was he drinking too much again? Hans has already informed everyone here about what happened in Romania, his heritage, and his sister. The coven master explained, for my benefit. A relieved breath left me, glad I didn't have to witness Hans burying his soul again. It was painful to watch. I wish to discuss our plans for what happens next concerning the pearl and the opal, Luca continued. So, will I be going to the vault? I asked. That I owned a vault at Lebastian still shocked me. I wanted to see what was inside of it, if there was anything for my parents. Also, I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to see how much money I possessed. Although my old boss had been keeping a low profile, I wasn't stupid enough to believe that he'd forgotten about me. Just let me vanish and start a new life. Just leave me alone. Seeing how vampire dens had said the ringmaster could fuck off, I assumed my old partner was no longer working for our boss. So perhaps the ringmaster simply hadn't found me yet. But one day, he would. And when that time came, he'd demand what I owed him. Paying off my old boss and getting out from under his thumb— Never fearing those ice-blue eyes in a black mask again would be a dream come true. I hoped I wasn't too late. Not yet, Luca replied. There's no need for anyone from the coven to return to the bank. Actually, it would be dangerous. After Tobias and Shea broke into his office, La Tête is sure to be gunning for us. My shoulders slumped, but I perked up again quickly. Then England? I was dying to learn the identity of Miriam Black. I plan to send a team ahead of you, Luca replied. Feeling like I was being blocked at every turn, I frowned. You'll go there, the coven master assured me. Whoever Miriam Black is, she's sure to have information on the opal. Perhaps she even possesses knowledge on how it reacted to other stones, or what the powers of the other stones are. But... We can't risk you getting hurt again, not with the pearl and the opal missing, and the threat of someone using them growing by the day. Basically, we need to vet the woman, Hans concluded simply. What if she's in league with the demons? I looked at my ring. Why would the woman's name be on my vault if my mother didn't trust her? I doubt that. My parents put her name down for a reason. I can't know what that is, but they wouldn't do anything to endanger me. Even having a few memories of my family, I knew that much to be true. But things change, Meredith, Hans retorted. Miriam might have been a good woman then, but a lot has happened since your parents died. I yearned to argue, but couldn't. Not without sounding like a child, anyway. Besides, he had a point. The last time he saw his own sister, she was a child. Now... Nicoletta was in league with a demon prince. In general, the area is poorly documented. Gunner added, his draw softening my disappointment. It's all woods for miles, and the road doesn't seem to be too big. We need to send shifters. I'll go if no one else wants to, to make sure it's safe. You and Silas will go. Luca replied, a wolf and a fae should be a good team. Sweet. Gunner conceded with a nod. "'Are you amenable to that, Meredith?' Luca asked. That he wanted my opinion warmed my insides, and the last vestiges of annoyance at not being allowed to leave right now left me. "'Sure. I could use the time for coursework anyway. But if I'm not going anywhere, why am I being included in this meeting?' "'Because of what Hans learned,' Luca explained. 
He spent almost every hour in the supernatural section of the library, studying demonology. He has much to share. Hans? So Hans had been researching. Were others? My gaze shifted to Tobias, a self-described researcher, and found him staring at me with such intensity that heat flushed my face. I glanced away. Most of the texts are obscure. The wizard picked up the imaginary talking stick. But I've pieced some stuff together, and I want us all to be in the loop. We'll tell the rest of the coven soon, too, but we were on the ground, putting our lives on the line. And deserve to know first. What about Shay, though? I asked. She was with Tobias. If she's running late, we should wait for her. Hans frowned. Shay is not willing to talk in my presence. She's having a hard time dealing with Hans being a half-demon. Gunner added, She's part angel, and they've been in an eternal war since the beginning of time, or something like that. Might take a while for her to get over. My eyes shifted to the wizard, my trainer, and someone I considered good at heart. But you've known her for years, right? Shame washed over Hans in waves, and he stared at his lap. Yeah. But that doesn't mean much. I'm not going to force someone to talk to me. I recognize that tone. My old raiding partner, Denz, had used it a few times when I tried to learn more of his past. No more pushing. Case closed. She'll come around, I assured him. So what did you learn about the Princes of Hell? Hans exhaled, apparently glad to move on from the topic. Demonology has never been a strong suit of mine. I avoided it because it felt too close to home. Of course, I knew there were seven princes, and the basics surrounding them, but I never went deeper. A few papers littered the shelf on the bookcase behind his chair. Grabbing one of them, he set it on the coffee table between us. I leaned forward, reading the names listed. Orion, Wrath, Lucifer, Pride, Bale, Gluttony, Asmodev, Lust, Belhor, Sloth. Levi, Envy, Mon, Greed. They have ancient names, but two accounts claim these names are what they have gone by most recently, when they were in this realm in the last century, during World War II. What's next to their names? I asked. Each demon prince represents a sin. Hans explained. As I studied, I learned Lucifer as known as the King of Princes, and represents the sin of pride. One brother seemed to hate that the most. Guess who it is? Orion, I breathed, and he's wrath. But wouldn't envy make more sense? Gunner asked. They're demons, Luca replied, and they only represent the sin and feed upon it. They can experience all sins. Likely they do. Rumor has it that they manipulate their given sin, too, Tobias said, though I can find no proof of that. I read that, too, Hans admitted, and yeah, Gunner, Orion is absolutely envious of his brother. But there's not much info on the princes, other than Lucifer. There are noted cases of Orion and Lucifer warring. Putting it mildly, they have a tempestuous relationship— and both want to be seen as the strongest. Lucifer always wins out on that. Hence, he gets all the fame. That would suck, I mused, considering they've been around for... forever. Agreed. Hans nodded. And obviously, Orion has a ton of pride too, as Luca said. All the princes likely do. But most applicable to us, Orion is the Prince of Wrath, and he is hunting stones. I can't imagine that a god of wrath having stones of immense power is a good thing. Nicoletta said that the Darkborn and the Prince will purge the earth. I breathed. That feels like war. And the stones will help. That's what we're thinking. Hans agreed. He'll destroy our world, and then bring his old world here. And in doing so, he'll show his brother who should be the king of princes.